можно очень быстро менять сложившуюся индустрию. Креативная индустрия. Именно оттуда возникают стартапы, единороги. Оттуда появляется гениальная работа. Вот именно Нобу фестивал для меня кажется, он такой особенный, потому что вы сюда приводите и привели такую площадку. Стань частью мира знаний и инноваций. Мы ждем тебя на пятом Нобелевском фестивале. Суровую станинскую погоду все-таки с нами. Okay, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is day three, yeah, of the fifth Nobel Fest. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Let's give yourself a big warm welcome. My name is Angela Karipova, and uh, I welcome you here, this amazing place. This is day three, and uh, we had people from Pakistan, Russia, France, Germany, United States, Yemen, all the way from around the world, and of course from Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, and other countries. By the way, if you're a mom, dad, student, whatever, professional, at, of course, you will have recording fully available on our website noblefest.com but 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 youtube is back because you know they had a you know global glitch or something like that so now youtube broadcast is back but you need vpn unfortunately you need vpn but if you have facebook and i know you have facebook log in your facebook account and you can watch this broadcast via facebook okay or at least tell your friends that you know you can watch and enjoy this broadcast on YouTube or Facebook. Anyways, time to move on. So, ladies and gentlemen, so as you guys know, this world is changing tremendously. The rate of change is unprecedented, and the development of human capital is one of the top priorities for any government out there in the world. And, of course, we are non-political here. So to say, but the mission of Nobel Fest is to make global education and science available to every home and to every piece of the world. I mean, you can give us a big, big warm welcome. Yeah, I mean, I think this is an important mission, so I expect some applause at this time. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, we all ready? You all ready? We're ready? So this day is going to be amazing. Do you know that from October 31st to November 4th, you're in for a bit of a treat because we have a week of Nobel lectures where Nobel Prize winners as well as uh, winners of the Breakthrough uh, Award will uh, deliver their lectures. Free access, by the way, to everyone. Pretty unprecedented, so be there. And uh, one more reminder, yesterday we did not have a global lottery and giveaway. I promise you we got to do it today. So ladies and gentlemen, do not be disappointed. Honest to God, we're gonna have this giveaway today I mean through random random computation some sort of an AI will select that of course and you guys whoever deserves and whoever wins will have the prize yes give us a big shout out for that and uh, of course everybody wants a prize everybody wants to have something uh, good so anyways I hope you're ready uh, ready to consume knowledge and experience and amazing things by the way I mean it's just a bit of a silence I mean hey guys on the balcony on the right are you are you with us excellent you see everybody wants attention everybody craves attention what about on the left hey the beat maker we had this guy yesterday so he's not here today okay anyways you are here today but uh, let's show us what people in the audience stand for yes exactly yes let's make some noise absolutely making some noise is important so if you guys with us so let's start without further ado and this first session is called why teachers are saving the world 
happy and glad to invite on our first speaker, Keisha Thorpe, winner of 2021 Global Teacher Prize, Life Changer of the Year, Edu Presenter. Keisha Thorpe, we are waiting for you here. Давайте встретим нашего спикера. Вот она уже бежит по коридору. Совсем скоро мы увидим ее на экране. Вот она наша гостья. Мы с ней уже познакомились вчера, и она сегодня продолжит свою дискуссию. Кейша is already here. Yes, we see her walking down this corridor, and uh, she will join us on the stage momentarily. Guys, we need the round of applause for Keisha Thorpe. Uh, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, it has been such a great pleasure being in Kazakhstan and coming to share at Nobel Fest. So, I am, again, Kishia Thorpe, and I am the Global Teacher Prize winner for 2021. And the Global Teacher Prize winner, uh, what that means is that the Varki Foundation had really thought about the contribution of teachers to the teaching profession. And with that, they came up with a prize to help to elevate the teaching profession. And that prize is a million dollar given to a teacher yearly who has contributed to elevating the teaching profession and has exemplified great leadership in the field of education. Thank you. So I teach at a high school in Bladensburg, Maryland, in the USA, in Prince George's County. It's a very large county. The school that I teach at, the International High School Langley Park, is mostly consisted of immigrants and refugees. So all of my students are also English language learners. Today, I've been asked to talk about how teachers are saving the world. I'm hoping that we are. <laughs> And I'm hoping that I'll address this topic enough to inspire enough of you to want to become teachers and to want to also support teachers in their efforts in saving the world. So almost all of the students in my classroom are immigrants and refugees, and their families have fled conflict and poverty when they come to the United States. The young people in my classroom are among the most disadvantaged uh, and most vulnerable population of our students. They're from families and communities who have been forced from their homes by poverty and climate change and other kinds of conflicts. In this way, my classroom presents a crossroad, an intersection, if you will, of geography, gender, and religion. In a very real way, it represents the debates happening here today in this room. And so, I believe my students have a great deal about teaching all of us how to live together sustainably and how to also elevate the teaching profession and also how important teachers are. My students face many challenges. Most of them speak English as a second language. They come from poor families, and most of them have little or no hope of going to college. I believe that the only way to help students like these is to really transform education through good teachers. One of the most effective things that we do in my school is to make teaching more culturally responsive for our students. We teach our students to be proud of who they are, to honor their cultural values, their backgrounds, and upbringing. And even though they come from many different countries across the globe, we do not try to take away their identity. To do that, we teach them to tell their stories and sometimes really to write down their stories in words. And some of them are often doing this for the first time. 
We also encourage our students to share their cultures, to bring in their artifacts from their countries and their backgrounds, and to also share those things with us that represent them in our classroom. We find ways of talking about complex issues of social justice, about the forces of racism, repression, and poverty that shape so many of our young people's lives. By doing this, we're helping our students to understand the value of their own identities. And we are helping them also to become very curious about the world around them. Ultimately, this approach helps students to become more responsible for their lives, their world, and our shared future. There's so much that teachers can do to make a difference, to help students embrace their culture and to think globally about our future. There is nothing on earth that is more powerful than a good teacher in the right classroom, but we also need government support. The world needs to invest in its schools, and governments need to elevate the teaching profession in the public's eye. That means giving teachers around the world livable wages, more resources in the classroom, and not just technology or better equipment, but they could also use training in new pedagogies, including culturally responsive practices, and giving them also the opportunity to grow as educators and leaders. A teacher's work is often, open to, is often to open young people's eyes to the world around them and teaching them how to navigate. That is the responsibility and the privilege of being a teacher. My first memory of education is being on a log in an unfinished building. But my most cherished moments, and those are those of my favorite teachers and mentors who have really plugged into me and make me the person I am today. So today, I'm going to leave you with this message, that if we are going to try to save the world through education, we have to make sure that we believe in all of our students, believe in their stories, believe in their value, and believe in their future. And as teachers, we get the privilege to do so. Teachers make all other professions possible, and that is our greatest contribution to society, and that is how teachers are changing the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Thorpe. This is very important, and we are happy that you made all this long way to come here to Kazakhstan. So please have a seat, and we're going to have some... All right, so, and while you are here, um, we are moving to second, uh, from secondary to higher education. Let me introduce and give the floor to our next speaker, Dr. Tresha Thorpe, founder, CEO, and president of U.S. Elite International Track and Field. Dr. Thorpe received the 2021 Distinguished Faculty of the Year Award from Colorado Technical University. Please applause, and we are waiting for Dr. Tresha Thorpe. And let's give a big, big, big hand to Dr. Tresha Thorpe. amazing half of my sister here, the global teacher. And, um, and I'm also a college professor. And I think that for progress to happen in any civil society, 
that we need education. The society needs education and education needs teachers. And that's why it's so important that we support our teachers and that we continue to advocate for them. Education has faced many challenges over the years, right? And teachers, they're the ones who have persevered through it all, through the myriads of issues in all the different countries, through war, through natural disasters, through reforms, through changes in government, through changes in policies, the list goes on. Teachers persevere through it all. Yet, there is one thing that continues to remain constant. Teachers, the world needs education, and education needs teachers. As we know, teachers, teaching is one of the most oldest profession, and throughout history, many teachers have contributed immensely to the progress of the world. We think about amazing teachers like Aristotle, Plato. We think about Socrates. They have changed the world with their innovative thinking, their innovative minds and their forward thinking. And today, of course, nothing much has changed. There are millions of teachers across the globe who are educating students and are changing students' lives. Teaching is a profession that is considered, I will say, um, to be one of the professions that we depend immensely on. And it helps students, the teachers help students to open their mind to new ideas, to new knowledge, to teach them to dream. And sometimes when students are dreaming and they don't actualize their own dream for themselves, teachers are the ones who continue to carry that on for them until they are ready to actualize their own dreams. Teachers are inspiring um, and they're molding young minds to make them good citizens, capable enough to serve in their society. They, I think teachers are no less warriors than our doctors or our soldiers in saving lives, right? <laughs> teachers are just saving lives in a different way. Teachers are doing a great job for the progress of their countries and helping to build civilized nations. And their absence, of course, will be felt in any economy. Teaching is one of the most humblest and most noblest profession. And if you're teachers, I'm sure you're aware of that. Teachers are the ones who have to show up when no one else shows up for the students. They have to show great courage, they have to show compassion, and they even have to show passion for the work that they do inside and outside of the classroom. They are the ones changing students' lives. And even when they don't feel like showing up, they still show up for those students. And that's why teachers are important in the transforming of education and in the transforming of students' lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Please have a seat. It was amazing. It was inspiring speech. Dr. Thorpe, thank you. So we really appreciate it. Uh, don't leave the stage. Nobody leave the uh, hall. And we have some discussion for you. Uh, I have some questions. And I'm going to ask them now. So please tell us, how do you think, how teachers and educators can prepare students to become global citizens? Uh, I'll go first. Well, as I mentioned earlier, in my classroom, most of my students are immigrants and refugees. So when they come into my classroom, they are already global citizens. They're coming into a classroom that is multicultural, that they also have to interact with many different attitudes, many different beliefs, many different religions, cultures, values, so many different things that are in our classroom. And as I know, Kazakhstan as well is also a multicultural uh, country and you are facilitating all of these different cultures and backgrounds, attitudes, beliefs, worldviews. And so in my classroom, 
we really try to make sure that students are not only culturally competent, but also globally competent. We want them to understand that the issues, we want them to understand the social issues around them that impacts them in their immediate environment, but also uh, different issues across the world that impacts other people in other places that are similar and that are challenges that we are also experiencing in our communities. I teach my students to have, to develop a common language, to develop shared values, attitudes, to make sure that they respect each other, to make sure that whatever we're doing, we don't think that our worldviews are the only ones that exist, that we develop, that we understand each other's perspective, that we respect each other, that we develop a higher level of tolerance for each other's differences, understand our different uniqueness, and understand that every one of us have something to bring to the table. And that's why I, one of the things I love about, about America being such a melting pot. It's, I can walk down the street and I can have Asian food, and I can have um, Hispanic food, I, and European, European food, Italian food. And that's one of the things about globalization, that when we bring so many different cultures into one place, I don't necessarily have to travel to different places in the world, but all of those things ha um, are accessible to me in my, in my environment. And that's what globalization is all about. And so because we have so many different people coming together, we have this whole sense of interconnectedness, this whole sense of in interdependence. And so we have to teach students how to navigate that kind of new world that they may not necessarily be adept to or used to. So we teach them to appreciate each other and to be respectful and most of all, just be really tolerant. Thank you. Maybe Dr. Thorpe, maybe you have something to add. Yeah, so um, I will add to that that you know, when we talk about global citizenship, it's about attitudes, ethics, beliefs, um, values, and even at another level, it's all about, you know, helping students to become culturally aware and just curious about the world around them, just curious about other people. And also a level of, we need to think about a level of competence that we are developing in our students to take on roles in their community to be global citizens and to move you know sustainable development goals forward to become a, to become an inclusive as well as a more secure society and when we talk about you know preparing students and how can they become global citizens that's how we prepare them and Global citizenship education actually is part of UNESCO's 2030 education agenda. And it calls on all countries to ensure that all learners prov are provided with knowledge and skills to promote sustainable development, including the appreciation for cultural and global citizenship. And as she mentioned earlier about just having students that are from all different backgrounds, we talk about the cultural and the diverse aspect of a global citizen. Just going across borders, learning more about our neighbors, I think that makes us a global citizen. And I believe that teachers and education, uh, educators, through their work, they are definitely trying their best to prepare students. Um, they're teaching students to live more in an integrated, interconnected to, um, society, helping them to understand the complexities of cultural and social issues across the world, and also teaching them how to get involved in policy and practice and what they can do for the betterment of their society. So one more thing I'll add that, um, internationalization. When we talk about internationalization, since the pandemic, we saw that there are you know, primary schools, secondary schools, and even higher education. Now, everyone is promoting internationalization through, um, as many of you were doing through the pandemic, um, going to school online, um, doing hybrid classrooms, and now we also see more study abroad because 
the world has become so much more open because of the pandemic in bringing other nations into your own classroom. I know there are some schools that even had Zoom classroom and promoted those and entertained other um, cultures and students from across the globe to come into their classrooms. So those are definitely opportunities for social and, uh, and cultural and also academic exchange across borders that will help our students to become global citizens. So continue to do what you need to do as teachers to um, entertain other uh, students into your classroom across borders. And when we think about internationalization and global citizens, think borderless, think borderless classrooms even for yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. With all of these great and big aims, what are the challenges you face too? Like, like teachers, like, uh, and how to cope with them? Like, what are the main challenges and difficulties? So as we, uh, as she talked about internationalizing education and also the fact that students are going across different borders and we see many of our classroom become so multicultural and so diversified, one of the challenges that teachers face is that diversification of the classroom. A lot of teachers uh, sometimes do not feel confident or as competent as they need to be to teach all of those different nationalities, different personalities, different cultures. And, it, and as a teacher at an international high school, I'll say that it is definitely a challenge to make sure that you're meeting the needs of all of those students. They come from different backgrounds and again, some of those students come from vulnerable populations where they're fleeing war and, they're, and conflicts and, and poverty, and they're coming in with different challenges, not just academic challenges, because they had, have interrupted education, but they're also coming in with social emotional challenges. And sometimes as teachers, we have to be psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors. So we face a lot of those challenges. Um, in making sure that we are meeting the needs of our students to make sure that all of them are achieving. That's just one of the challenge. Another one of the challenge that teachers face is inequities and inequality, where we have to be constantly advocating, especially teachers in rural areas, constantly advocating for students to have equal opportunity like student and resources like students in suburban and urban um, communities where schools are more equipped with the tools and the resources to help students to achieve at a higher level. So equity, is definitely one of those challenges as well. Um, another challenge that we face in education, especially since the pandemic, is the digital divide. And again, when we talk about the disparity between uh, rural communities and urban and suburban communities, we see that uh, disparity even more exacerbated. A lot of countries and school districts are doing a lot to catch up but still they are behind in so many ways because again we did not anticipate that everyone would have to go remote and so most people either had internet issues or they just did not have electronic devices to log on and we and that created a lot of absenteeism a lot of disruption in education students did not attend school and also it really created learning loss that right now a lot of teachers are trying to remediate. So, so those are some of the challenges. Infrastructure, poor infrastructure or infrastructure that needs to be modernized and ca um, get caught up to what 21st century classrooms should look like and should be. Teacher training, a lot of teachers don't feel that they ha are adequately um, trained to go into those classrooms to navigate uh, and to teach and to facilitate learning with all of the challenges that modern day students are bringing into the classroom. So, yeah, and, and I mean, the list goes on and we could stay in here today and talk about all the challenges that teachers go through. But I think when we're thinking about challenges, I want to think teachers understand that they are students' greatest resource. So with all of the challenges that teachers experience in the classroom and with school systems and with, un and, and with inequities, just remember that t students come to the classroom for you. They don't come for the buildings. They don't come for their friends. They don't come for... 
you know, they come for you because you are the greatest resource. You have all the information, the wisdom. We inspire them. We are their role models. We motivate them in the classroom. We engage them. We teach them how to dream. We, te we, we teach them. And, and like my sister said earlier, sometimes when they haven't actualized their dreams, we carry it for them until they're able to access it for themselves. And so you play a great and important role in the classroom. And so yes, we, there's a lot more that governments can do to make sure that learning is accessible for more accessible for students and a lot more that they could do also to incentivize teachers, to motivate teachers, to make sure that teachers feel like they're respected, to make sure that teachers feel like they're valued. Invest in teachers instead of investing in buildings. Um, you know, one of the things I've learned when, um, as I've traveled to different countries is that some syst education systems have many different universities and those universities that the government, governments are investing in are under-enrolled. And they're under-enrolled because achievement at the secondary level is so low. And so instead of investing in those universities that has chairs and lights and you're paying all of that money for those empty chairs and lights, we have to make sure that we take that money and invest in teachers and in students where it actually matters. Yeah, we have to figure out what the root causes are, address the root causes at the initial and, fun and, and foundational level before we can think about universities because we cannot build universities unless we have students who are motivated, who are achieving, and who are aspiring to actually have a higher education. So invest in teachers and invest in students. Thank you. So very actual uh, thing you said, and you partly answered on, the, on my next question, but uh, Dr. Thor, please, uh, what is the role of teachers or educators in the modern age, in your opinion? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I believe that the role of a teacher in say a modern in the modern age in today's society is very complex and very nuanced right because education is ever evolving and a lot of us as educators as teachers we're still trying to figure it out we're still trying to find our way we're still trying to figure out how are we going to navigate um, modern, um, modern age comes with technology and of course a lot of the other challenges and many of our um, for many of us we are trying to figure out how we're going to meet the needs of our students and how we're going to navigate um, and move into the modern age and of course those comes with their challenging um, challenges as well but I will say you know it is important in education to definitely consider when you're thinking about um, teaching in the modern age and your role as a teacher or educator in the modern age, just think about the sustainable development goals and how you are working to build an inclusive and, um, uh, inclusive and quality education for all the students in your classroom. You know, teachers are considered to be the agents of change and so all your students are looking to you to put these um, goals into action and for the, for the sustainability of your students as well, I'm sure that you want to be invested in helping them to become lifelong learners. I think, you know, you need, uh, teachers need to help to educate, of course, educate the students towards um, taking personal accountability, right? So um, the, while the teacher is taking accountability for showing up for these students, you need to teach them to take accountability for their own education as well. Um, they're the ones who are going to be the greatest contribution to society, and what we want to develop is lifelong learners. They're the ones who are going to make decisions about um, our society, about the future, about going forward. Um, you know, we need to teach them about social justice issues, um, how they, how they, all these issues transcend borders, and how they need to navigate these issues. We need to also help them to understand how important 
the, their contribution to society is going to be for economic viability and for generations that come after them. And as we continually talk about, we talk about cultural competence and cultural relevance as well as cultural diversity. We have to teach our students all of this for them to transform into the modern age of, um, of becoming a global citizen and also to ensure that they are being global thinkers and crossing borders and becoming open-minded to other cultures and other aspects of um, education. So teachers, um, the teacher's role is also to practice a sustainable um, teaching. And by this, I mean, of course, giving students the skills that they need to become lifelong learners. Um, as they say, uh, if you teach someone um, to fish, they will, they will go out and fish for themselves. Um, they will never have to depend on anyone else. Uh, so as teachers, you're basically um, teaching your students how to fish and not necessarily giving them the fish, right? Because if you give them the fish, they're always going to come back and expect you to continue to pour into them. But you have to open their minds. Your role is to teach them how to fish, teach them how to become independent thinkers, teach them how to navigate the world. Um, and while we're also teaching them these skills, try not to forget also those soft skills that students need right? The critical thinking. They need to learn to collaborate, not just with their community, but across borders. They need to learn, um, of course, how to be empathetic, how to be tolerant, how to be respectful of everyone, their background, everyone's identity, as well as everyone's culture. We also are aware, of course, about globalization. And when we talk about globalization, of course, technology is um, included in that as well. And with that, we, are, we have opened students' minds to new way of thinking. We have opened them to the, the, the world. Um, so to speak, and there's a plethora of information that is out there for students and a lot of times um, I think teachers think that they have to compete with the internet because um, students have all this information to their access and you know, when we think about um, students and, and teachers role into the modern world and the information that's out there and the information that students have access to, it means that you now have to take the onus on yourself as teachers to re-strategize. Think about how you're bringing um, creativity into learning, um, into the classroom. And teachers are no longer considered, of course, as I mentioned, the front of all knowledge because of so much information out there. So what are you now doing to prepare your students for the next step? How are you um, teaching them to become independent thinkers, global thinkers? Just think about that. How are you now preparing them for the next step so that they now can fish for themselves as opposed to continue to sit around and wait. So think about that as you go back into your classroom and what are those strategies that you can develop to make your students independent and global thinkers. Thank you for the answer. Uh, this mission is really huge and hard and yes. it's just <laughs> Crazy, <laughs> seriously, I am absolutely impressed of you and of your work. So how do we support this teacher in their role of saving the world? Microphone, <laughs> please. Could you try again, please? Yeah. Yeah. So how do we support teachers in their role of saving the world? You know, a lot of times teachers sacrifice so much and sometimes they don't feel like they get anything back in return. So I want to say one of the first things that they could do to support teachers in their efforts in saving the world is give teachers a livable wage. Teachers need livable wage. Like, this is something that's across the board and we could all learn from countries that really place value and invest in teachers. We could learn from those systems of government who really take time to give teachers a seat at the table, 
we could learn from other systems, how teachers become leaders in our society, and how teachers are, how, how much value their society placed on teachers. You know, like she mentioned earlier, teachers are considered to be, teaching is considered to be one of the noblest professions, one of the oldest professions, and also the mother of all professions. And it is so, it is so appalling that the one profession that makes all other professions possible is the one that is least respected. What would society do without teachers? You know, engineers that we pour into, they make millions and thousands of dollars, and teachers only make a smidget. So I'm not even going to talk about all of the other ways that teachers can be supported. I just want to be stuck on this one. Teachers need livable wages, and governments have to do more to support teachers. And I think all teachers across the board would agree. Teachers need livable wages. That's it. That's it. Thank Once you. we, I mean, that is, is enough to motivate us to have a show up for students and, and to motivate us and inspire us to do our jobs every day. We, ha we have to survive as well. Students look to us, and if we have nothing, we cannot pour into them. So we need to make, they need to take care of us if they expect us to take care of students, period. Thank you, thank you. I think everyone is agree with you. Thank you very much uh, for this session, and thank you for flying all this long way from US, from United States to Kazakhstan. So I hope you enjoy our, uh, your stay with yes. us, and we will be happy to see you again. Sure. Thank you. So we are moving to the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we are back with the round of applause. Guys, you know what to do, right? Clap your hands. And uh, today we're going to talk about something very important. So raise your hand if you were born somewhere from 97 to 2012. Raise your hand if you were born within that uh, bracket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're the Z generation, huh? I know, Z, but whatever. Z generation. So let's talk about something very, very important. And we all really worried about this growing up generation, up and coming generation. And maybe you are part of the up and coming generation. Uh, but speaking from station, I'm 35. Uh, you guys are just out there. So you still have a lot to learn from the master, so to say. Learn grasshopper, learn. So anyways, uh, what to do with you, how to teach you, how to prepare you for proper life and how will this generation save and change the world yeah so and to discuss all that so allow me to invite to the stage the host of this open discussion and let's talk about <clears throat> the role of the z generation in this world of new technology let's give a big welcome to norlan kiyasov a founder and uh, ceo of adcrunch The founder and the CEO of Ed Crunch, Nurlan Kiyasov. So, welcome, welcome, welcome. So, what are we going to talk about today? Well, first of all, I'm here to uh, observe 
some of the Nobel Prize winners and to listen to some amazing lectures. And uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, Isaac Froman, Isaac Froman, and uh, things are changing, you know, what to do with education, how to teach, what to teach, etc., etc. So, and because I represent Ed Crunch, you know, we're all about education. So, and we have the dean of one of the largest universities of Kazakhstan here. So, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, do you need more time, or can we just, you know, sure, 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 let's have all the speakers here, you know, give us a round of applause, please, ladies and gentlemen, and let's have all the rest of the speakers on the stage. Now, speaker, Dr. Raik Wong Chung, Nobel Peace Prize Laureate of 2007. <laughs> Далее у нас есть еще один. And uh, there's more, there's more. And uh, this guest will join us momentarily on the stage. We're going to have an amazing debate uh, here. Isaac Fruman from uh, Bramming University. And let's have a big, big, big shout out to Isaac Froman. Let this, let's give this man a big, big hand. And now, let's, ladies and gentlemen, after, of course, another round of applause, let me welcome uh, this person to the stage that has been with us since the very beginning, the general partner, education partner, the Dean of South Kazakh University of Mukhtar Kaos of Daria is going to be with us momentarily. So let's give her a big, big hand. Daria, здравствуйте! Заждали из вас. Добро пожаловать! Ну, uh, uh, Nurlan, so you first. Well, the topic of our today's presentation and roundtable is uh, speaking of the Generation Z. Uh, how to teach, what to teach, because the technology is changing so fast. So how do we teach the Generation Z? Uh, so it's an important question, yeah, especially for, for students, for universities, for trainers, for teachers, for professors, because the technology is changing so quickly and social network are integral to our life. And uh, what are we going to do about it? And you know this whole generation gap, generation approach, where they have this alpha, Z, Y, X, millennials, baby boomers, whatever. I mean, there's the generational theory, so to say, yeah. Uh, and I, I, it seems like marketing guys love this stuff, yeah, because they actually segment their, I mean, the whole society. Because when they marketing their products and services, I mean, they analyze because sort of different generations have different sort of shopping habits and. Uh, uh, when they, you know, do elections and stuff like that. So they also, you know, sort of focusing on different segments and different generations because they vote differently. So I believe that's something that uh, we all need to think about and we need to think about the content because we need to create uh, uh, this learning experience. There's the word in English, which is difficult to translate into English, which is the uh, learning expectation and I believe that you know and uh, this is what uh, I've been wondering because you know we have you know schools and the universities they're still very conservative 
I don't know whether it's good or bad what if the school or university is uh, very conservative but then student can swipe the screen and uh, order pizza online and uh, taxi online and stuff like that so they all used to gadgets yet when they go to university yet when they go to you know uh, school it's all very very old school very conservative we're still waiting for the semester we're still waiting for the final exam etc uh, despite the fact that we can do things in real time we can do personalized education so how we're still in a classroom we're still waiting for the results we we'll still wait for our turn you know to go to this blackboard but you know uh, it's so the life outside classroom and inside classroom is completely different this digital gap this expectation gap and education has become one of the most conservative industries out there the question is what do we do about it how do we change the content how do we change the approach how do we change the whole thing how do we reimagine it i mean it's not just for kazakhstan it's everywhere all the politicians and all the officials that are somehow touching education are thinking about it so my first question is to isaac so Isaac, uh, simple question, but it's a. I don't have like one answer for it. So past twenty, ten years, whatever, we've been talking about the soft skills, right? So soft skills versus the hard skills. The soft skills are so important, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, the whole lot. But at the same time, and uh, hard skills are also very important. I mean. Uh, like specific hard skills i mean i mean still knowledge yes of course we gain and lose knowledge comes and goes becomes obsolete and whatnot so it's all important so my first question to isaac uh sh what should we focus more i mean because you've done so many presentations on this on the competences and skills and the types of skills so should we focus more for the z generation on soft skills or hard skills what would you put on top or should there be a balance between soft skills and hard skills what is important for the z generation that's the first question and the second question as i said in the beginning do we need to reform school should school remain the beacon of conservatism sort of like a protective shell like a church in a sense or do we need to change it i mean what is the role should the school remain a conservative one so were you sitting you know in the classroom everybody is the same same rules same subjects same books same or should it become more personalized so isaac what would you say on these two questions thank you very much uh thank you norlan for this question and let me start uh, by saying big big thank you uh, for the invitation because i always dreamed to be in this building this pyramid <laughs> because i've seen it many times i was just driving by but i've never been inside it's my first time inside it's so I'm finally here uh your question is actually super important i have to say and it's a very very practical question uh because today uh there's so many schools and universities uh wondering about it everybody's wondering about it because it's, exist it's existential so and i was lucky indeed several years ago to be the head of a big big project that included scientists from seven countries and the idea of that project was to figure out two uh, things to find answers to two questions so here are the questions so the question is what kind of knowledge specifically and what kind of skills specifically life skills i mean uh, disciplines yeah disciplinary knowledge what kind of knowledge and skills are absolutely essential to have like a must-have skills yeah like for example literacy yeah i'm um, being 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 knowledgeable it's not about literacy it's not about being able to read i mean what about financial literacy ecological literacy uh, digital literacy there are all sorts of literacies yeah so uh and again we're trying to answer this first question what kind of knowledge is absolutely essential and the sad answer to this that we came out with is that both from the viewpoint of demand and from the viewpoint of supply of schools and uh, universities the list gets longer and longer and longer we cannot say that this is one definitive skill set yeah it's growing it's changing all the time it's expanding you need to know more you need to learn more yes which is bad news for you guys but at the same time it's good news i have to say that 
probably the most surprising fact that we discovered, it was a byproduct, we didn't think about it, is that the average expectancy of uh, school or, you know, university education uh, 50 years ago was 6.5 years. That's the average university tenor. Now for developed countries, more than 14. So basically you are learning two times longer. You're spending two times more as a student. So the answer to knowing more is not that terrible because you man lives and learns, so to say. Be modern day people spend a lot more time learning, what, whether formally in the university or outside that. There's so many jingle words in English, or, uh, the so-called key competences, transversal competences, competences, soft skills, whatever you want to call it, all sorts of, of these buzzwords. And uh, the answer is not uh, that nice. Yes, people want more. Yes, and the demands are going up. Oops, my microphone died. Heh. Why did it die? Oh, maybe we can exchange. Thank you. So there's a giant list, giant lists of competences, like critical thinking, teamwork, uh, creative outside the box thinking, uh, resilience, da 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 da, etc. The whole lot. I believe that the importance of these skills are going up. I mean, it's not that I think so, because it's just facts. Look at life, facts. Because you still have to relearn and retrain over and over and over again. And uh, it was there was a research of I think U.S. Labor Department done and they analyzed traditional jobs not the new ones like data scientists or rocket science or whatever yeah or like spaceship or tour operator but the incumbent ones like a driver like a like a truck driver stuff like that even if you're a truck driver you still need to learn more the so-called you know uh, critical thinking where you need to look at the navigation map and select the route so even if you're a truck driver, 20 years ago, a truck driver couldn't give a damn about the navigation map because they didn't have any. Now there are sorts of gadgets in a the truck. The average truck has multiple gadgets in the United States, right? And uh, also the share of non-routine outside-the-box decisions where there's no prescription, where there's no script, thinking outside the script. You, you, you're wondering, okay, uh, well, let's take some basic job that doesn't require a lot of skills like for example uh for example a receptionist in the hotel yeah but look at what they're doing a receptionist at the hotel every client coming in every visitor it's a new decision sometimes you need to think outside the box so unfortunately not on the answer is that there's no specific recipe for the balance but i can definitively tell you that you need to know more rather than know less. You will have to study more, learn more, and have a more diverse, diversified skill set, soft skill set. But when it comes down to school, well, sure, of course, you have to be different if you're a school. You need to provide this kind of literacy, yeah, these literacies to students if you're a school or university. Um, well, 10 years ago, I mean, uh, financial literacy wasn't part of the curriculum now look at how many schools are there that teach financial literacy see or digital literacy 10 years ago it was a non-subject now for universities it's a matter of life and death I mean uh, you're like a university graduate I mean has to be able to do some Python program I don't know how to do Python programming which is bad I feel like I'm old because I don't know how to do coding on Python Modern day students know how to do coding on Python. It's like basic skill. See, see what I'm saying? But there's one answer that we haven't yet found it, is how to develop those soft skills. Maybe colleagues can tell me. Uh, because there are attempts to do courses on soft, like for example, the course on critical thinking that they teach at the university, or a course on teamwork, or agile thinking, or design thinking. But somehow I think it has to be embedded within the curriculum, and there are all sorts of experiments. This, there's no one definitive answer. And uh, it's great that you asked this question, because four days ago, 
uh, in my small university in Germany because I'm from Germany currently, you know, uh, and uh, that's exactly what we discussed four days ago in my German university. So how do we change the curriculum so that in three years our BA uh, would at the same time meet the curriculum that is continuously expanding and at the same time help our students think critically? Well, thank you for this answer. Thank you. Uh, very thoughtful indeed. Uh, I recently read that uh, Z generation once graduated, uh, uh, many don't even go to the university and uh, they change their jobs at least 15 times. I think that's something to think of. So people don't stick to one job. They're changing up to 15 times after graduation of, from the university. I mean, that just goes to show how you know diverse life is. So I would like to give the floor to a dean I think you have 30,000 students, right? You're one of the largest universities in Kazakhstan. And by the way, I recently learned that if, for example, in the in in the world, there are about 200 million students. So that means that for the lifetime of the university, uh, in 10 years, they say in 10 years, the number of students in this world will double. Uh, so closely half a billion students think about it, like a degree students, not like the listeners or whatever, uh, but like a degree programs and uh, students to get diplomas. So uh, that means that universities in 10 years will have to channel two times more. So that means that we need to open like one more uh, Moscow State University type of facility like every year or something like that. I mean. So, so as that's a tremendous pressure, that means that the teaching will be done differently, diplomas, graduation will be done differently. So, I mean, there won't be a traditional campus type environment. It's going to be different. So we need to think about it because it's a huge challenge for the educational system globally and on the country level. So, Daria, as a dean of the university, where do you see the future? So, I mean, how do you, I mean, of course, you need to retain attention of the student, right? Because, I mean, he has yet another skill to master, yet another, uh, you know, subject to master uh, so that they don't opt for the online instead of coming to you because they say you can study in meta universe. Yet yeah, it's a new trend, like a meta university that is completely online. But what do you think? Will online universities dominate? Uh, and will they replace and make traditional incumbent universities obsolete or not? So what is the role of the universities 10 years forward in 10 years? Where do you see it? And uh, will they be essential for the success uh, of this up and coming generation? So that's my question to you. Thank you. Well, hello. Hello, everyone. And uh, I would like to maybe focus on the, uh, fo let's talk about the background. Because what is a university, generally speaking? What is the university? Uh, a university, the word university actually entered the language uh, quite recently because in Egypt, I mean, they had the Al Azhar University. It's an old one. And if you translate it from Arabic, it's like a, it's like a higher education institution that provides universal, yeah, Univers universal education. Because when we talk about international universities or in Cambridge, we talk about Cambridge, we talk about Oxford universities. But let's talk about our universities, yeah, that we know in Kazakhstan. Yeah, forget about Oxford and Cambridge. Let's talk about Kazakh universities. You know that the first, ver the first ever Kazakh university. If you look back at the history of our country. Uh, so we only had 2% uh, of people in Kazakhstan with higher education. It's not true. We had universities before. So they used to tell us that, uh, you know, uh, we were sort of obsolete uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, they used to say that in 20th century, we didn't have much of the university education in Kazakhstan. It's not true. But speaking of the 21st century, what is the difference between 21st versus 20th century? As Norlan just said, look, the idea is that uh, this giant Z generation, we call them Z generation, the digital natives, so to say, yeah? 
it's a digital native generation so and that's what we should focus on because that's our key audience and guys it's complicated but it's fun but it's a very exciting journey why because right now as we speak life is basically split in two uh, the first life is that you know we live in this physical world there's a different life metal life which is a virtual life so every person lives in two worlds the real world and the digital world and especially during the pandemic we saw that it is true so we need to be ready we need to be ready for this new age education uh, universities are getting of course more academic freedom but there's one ultimate goal for the university is to prepare the citizen that is the citizen of the 21st century that speaks at least several foreign languages someone who's armed and weaponized with all sorts of digital technologies a critical thinker etc etc so we need this kind of graduates so we need to prepare people for the 21st century is going to be very complex now uh, of course uh, it's now minor feet and of course the bottleneck is the educator and we need to develop those competencies for example recently we passed the new law on education in Kazakhstan and uh, for example uh, regional universities because our university is best based in Shimkent we have 30,000 uh, you know students we have MA we have BA we have PhD students etc so the idea is that it has to be more applied and more research based and we do have our laboratories we have R&D facilities and stuff like that so we would like to be more practical university rather than theoretical university more applied uh, science than fundamental so speaking of the development of universities and their impact and contribution for right there in the audience we have young people lots of young people if they don't care if they're bothered with the subject so how can you make them come to us we need to be open about it if they're bothered if they're bored then there's nothing you can do about it i mean look uh it's very black and white situation so make them interested you know make it that they come to you excite them entice them because i mean they can get education outside the university there are ways to get education directly via online so the role of the university is therefore has changed uh, that way so we're not exclusive uh, source of knowledge yes universities can do applied studies research and development but at the same time we should also of course be on top of the world when it comes to knowing what's happening around the world you can't just sit in your you know own nice world of the university campus so you need to be an influencer as a university but that needs strategy goals objectives openness and a much more involved and proactive position of the university you can't just be university so universities need to reimagine themselves they, they need to be much more embedded in the society and uh, life in general so what else can i say so like i said uh here in kazakhstan uh, well I think we're doing a pretty good job I mean we have lots of young people you know we're making great progress in terms of education and university education generally and if you look at the numbers by the way official government numbers then you definitely see that uh, the situation is definitely improving so I'd rather I would say about 70 percent of all universities can do online studies so there will be new jobs uh, new curriculum and uh, there's no such thing as becoming for example something like get a diploma in whatever and then spend your whole life with it now it's a lifelong learning so you should be nimble and be able to pivot uh, when the situation requires that so it's a lifelong learning so you can't just stick to one job 
So, and of course, I mean, uh, I'm an economist, for example, that's my strength. I love numbers. Or for example, you love PR or marketing, but you should be able to pivot because that's evolutionary sustainable strategy. Yeah, so for example, if I'm an economist, then I need to be able to actually uh, be horizontal, not just go vertical, but horizontal. Maybe I need to, you know, switch gears and uh, do something that can contribute, you know, my economic background but not necessarily stick rigidly to doing one thing. For example, Mahatma Gandhi, a famous Indian scholar, uh, said something that if you want to change the future, uh, I'm doing this verbatim, start with yourself right now. The best way to change the future is to change yourself today. I think something like that. Maybe I'm butchering it, uh, his quote. But I think that's the question that young people need to answer. Like, try to figure out, you know, who are you? Where do you see yourself in the future? What kind of competences do you need to master to uh, feel comfortable to be needed in the 21st century so that you find a place and become a needed person? So I think that's, that's, that's the answer. So are you saying that uh, your university is uh, facing a major, major change? Yes, absolutely, of course. Uh, not just our university, any university is now facing a major change in transformation. Why? Let me tell you why. Uh, because, uh, well, for example, we're doing a lot of IT, a lot of electric engineering and things like that. Uh, but, um, uh, I mean, I'm a historian, by the way, uh, by job, by nature, uh, by background. and. Uh, I publish all of my lectures online. You can find all of that online. And uh, those students that are excited and interested about it, they can always come. They can always come to me physically or stay online. Yeah? I mean, regardless of whether it's day and night, it's the so-called education on demand. It's like video on demand. Now it's education on demand. So you don't have to necessarily you know, go physically to universities. But like I said, there's plenty of information to choose from. And uh, I make sure that there's enough courses yeah, uh, to, to, to get what you need. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much for being with us. And of course, I'd like to learn from South Korean example, because South Korea is a leader in high tech development. Uh, great high tech companies came out of South Korea. And in this regard, I would like to uh, learn from you. What is the role of school, uh, educational system, universities, and what, what kind of content should they provide to students to be the driver, to be at the forefront of this high tech continuous development, the country of South Korea and beyond? And how do we teach this new up and coming generation? And what, do, what kind of skills do we teach them to retain the leadership in this high tech race? Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> I think, uh, as you might know, my background is in technology, and I was very nervous when I was uh, put in this panel, and uh, what kind of advice I can give. As you know, uh, I am a climate change uh, expert, and I've been promoting new paradigm for green growth. So technology is something that uh, I'm far from, uh, from myself. And, but uh, I want the, the advice, I, I, I cannot mention exact. I don't have enough time to cover your question about South Korean case, but rather I'd like to focus on what kind of advice I can give for those generation jet for technology, uh, rapidly changing technology uh, decade. Number one, try to be the master of technology, not a slave of technology. You have to maintain your identity. If you are crazy about Bitcoin and speculating and losing all your money, then you are the slave of the technology. Is it what I mean by that, right? What I mean by slave. Try to be the master of technology. Don't be swept away by the come and go technologies, which is come and go. You have to always try to maintain your own identity and your own, per your own perspective, how to maintain your humanity. And for that, my second advice, <clears throat> always try to imagine what kind of world you want to live in. Many people is uh, asking the question, how can I choose my dream, 
many students are saying, it's very difficult to choose my dream because I don't know even what I want and what I want it to be. It, choosing that kind of a choice is not easy at all, yet, actually. Then my advice for young generation who are wondering, why should I be or why should I choose to uh, as my future career? Then my advice is, think about what kind of world do you want to live? Peaceful world, sustainable world, or materially affluent world, or comfortable world, whatever you want, or air where the air is fresh, or where there is no traffic congestion. There are many kinds of worlds you might desire. And then think about what kind of role you can play in realizing the dream you are thinking about. My another uh, supplementary advice is that the dream can be better, though better if it is the more crazier. So don't think about routine and conventional thinking, but try to come up with the crazy ideas. I think uh, the the Teslas. Uh, I think he must be the one who came up with the crazy ideas of going to Mars, things like this. But you can think about with this kind of crazy ideas, then you can come up with what kind of role you can play. So this is my second advice. And my third advice is <clears throat> in learning and practicing new technologies, don't forget about the impact of those technologies for our planet and our society. For the planet, <clears throat> which is my specialty, don't forget that the impact of new technologies on our planet. For example, the mining of Bitcoin is generating huge amount of CO2. Should you mind about it or not? If you, you, just, if you just make money out of Bitcoin, then you are happy and you can forget about the CO2 emission? That is something that I am uh, telling you that you should just change your mindset that this planet is your planet, actually your house. So you should have a mindset, I should take care of my own house. So you have to think about this world or your country. Or for example, a specific example, RRC. Why RRC tragedy happened? Because nobody thinks RRC is mine. If you think RRC is mine, everybody will care about it, right? But we forgot. So you have to keep in your mind that you are the owner and this whole world, your country, your river, your lake is yours, not somebody else's. And you have to practice how to take care of it. And look at the technology from the perspective of whether this technology, the direction of technology is useful or not useful. So try to keep this kind of angle then you can be the master of technology, not the slave of technology. I'm, I'm sorry that I gave you too difficult uh, uh, demands for you, but uh, this is my out of the box thinking and the crazy advice for you. Thank you. Yes, exactly. Thank you very much. And uh, well, just to recap on how to learn and what to learn, I mean, for, for me, I see three different directions, to be honest with you, when it comes to our, you know, kids, our students and uh, teachers, as we've just learned. Uh, because you don't want to be a slave, you want to be the master. And for that, of course, you need to master and to know the so-called data literacy. Uh, it's not when artificial intelligence manages you, controls you, but when you are the master. So at least have basic literacy such as English language, for example, so to understand how data science work and what it's all about, how to be a responsible user, understanding all the services and platforms, the fact that all collect data about you and about your habits and about your life. That's the first one. Second skill, second thing is the soft skills and just so-called human literacy, just being one with the world, just uh, part of humanity, being able to do critical thinking and uh, being able to work with other people because computers don't know how to do that so and uh, our humanity is what makes us unique 
versus the AI versus a machine. So, I mean, focus on your soft skills. And, of course, as Isaac just said in the beginning, uh, hard skills, they're not going anywhere. So you need to be a professional. So focus on hard skills too, and this is for everyone here. I mean, for example, engineering, right? Data science and stuff like that. All this stuff is important to be successful in the future. So I thank all of you guys for joining our panel. Thank you, everyone on the panel. Thank you, and I'll see you again. And thank you to Nurlan for being the host. Uh, uh, we definitely uh, will see you all again. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. We're really, really grateful to our speakers for their impact and for their input and contribution to development of education and science. I think it was a really nice debate, and I do hope that you have drawn your conclusions. And in the meanwhile, we're moving on to our next session. After a very short break, we'll be back with the Princeton Vasey presentation. Друзья, куда вы собрались? Куда вы есть? Подождите. Подождите. Еще никто не нагрел. Микроволнок на всех не хватает. Чуть-чуть давайте посидим. Wait, 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 guys, don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. Food's not ready. Guys, where are you going? No, 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 no. Stay here. You're definitely Generation Z, right? No, no. There's no leaving. No, nobody leaves. Stay here. Stay here because we're going to continue. We're going to have a very, very interesting discussion. And uh, uh, please, welcome back. Yeah, this is day three. It's a very intense day. So let's give a big shout out to everyone who was about to leave for a fake coffee break. No, there's no coffee break. Not now, at least. OK, anyways, Princeton in Asia program. So next Dylan, who is the general director of Princeton in Asia program. And let's welcome co-presenter Matt Hernandez, who is the program director of Princeton in Asia. The floor is yours. Let's give a big hand to our... And uh, we can't do it without you. We can't do it without you. A round of applause. So they definitely need your noise. So let's make some noise, guys. And let's welcome. So just think about this. People have spoken on so many stages around the world. They've seen, they've seen so many different audiences. They have. They, they, so let's just let's let's give them a really really warm welcome. Big 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 hand. Welcome welcome sir welcome. Can anyone hear me? All right, there we are. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's so wonderful uh, to be here, and it's a, it's a great honor. And my colleague, Matt, is going to be coming out here with me, and I think he's coming right now, question mark. Matt, are you coming out? I think the speaker didn't have enough so I think the reason he's still backstage because he just needs more applause. He's giving big, big hand. So the two of them now, and then there were two. So it's going to be an amazing presentation. Welcome to this stage. All right, that's better. Uh, Matt and I are so honored to be here today and want to thank all of you for having us. 
we are very grateful to the organizing committee of Nobel Fest for the honor of joining and participating in this wonderful exchange of ideas and experiences. And we're also really grateful to all of the volunteers who have been working so hard uh, to provide us with uh, the ability to access, understand, and enjoy this experience here at Nobel Fest and also the beautiful city of Astana. Um, it's been an honor to, to be here with the, yeah, beautiful city of Astana, that's right. What a gorgeous place. Um, we've learned so much from the speakers and are very honored to share the stage with them and are really grateful to all of you in the audience for the great questions you've asked throughout the last few days. And so it's, it's a really fun honor to be here representing our organization, Princeton in Asia. So we've gleaned a lot from the talks that have taken place over the last 72 hours. And one of the things that's been really exciting is the fact that so many people have brought up ideas or themes that really resonate with our work and our mission at Princeton in Asia and sort of our work and mission and values as people on this, on this planet. So first I want to talk about something that Maksad Korbanov, the visionary behind Nobel Fest said. And he created Nobel Fest as an answer to the question of what happens when people don't have the chance to excel because they haven't had the opportunity to gain access to global knowledge. And then we heard from His Excellency Minister Sayasat Nurbek, who told us that we cannot solve new problems with old ways of thinking. We need new solutions to political, social, and ecological crises. And he argued that the greatest asset in our future is the capacity building of our young people. And then finally, Professor Dr. Iqbal reminded us that science has no boundaries and that we need to work together for the common good and harness the power of cross-cultural collaboration. And we want to talk today about a method and structure for harnessing cross-cultural collaboration. Truly, the mission of the Nobel Fest to solve the most challenging problems, both in Central Asia and the world more broadly, is more pressing now than ever. War and the displacement of populations, rising inflation and inequality, the existential threat of climate change, all of these are just a few of the problems that our world is facing only two decades into the 21st century. Sometimes when I'm tempted to lose hope, I'm reminded of a passage from one of my favorite books, which is also an excellent movie in my opinion. It's The Fellowship of the Ring. The passage is as follows. I wish it need not have happened in my time, said Frodo. So do I, said Gandalf, and so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. And I can tell you with confidence today that the best thing that I've done with my time has been to travel and to engage with people who are different than me and to learn from the cultures and communities that I've encountered on my travels. So I did our program, Princeton in Asia, back in 2019, just after graduating from my university. And I uh, taught English in Jaipur, India, at an after-school foundation. In addition to English, I also taught uh, creative thinking and real-life problem-solving skills to my students. One of my local co-teachers, Reshmaji, she introduced me to a concept called Jugad, uh, that's a Hindi word. And Jugad, um, some people think of it as, let's say, frugal engineering. Really what it is, is mending, repairing things that would otherwise be tossed away, discarded, or replaced. And coming from the United States, um, which, as you may know, is a rampant consumerist culture, uh, commodities are readily available, um, and in American culture, we tend to buy things just as often as we dispose of them. This idea of Jugad was incredibly refreshing to me, and I found it to be revolutionary in its simplicity, right? Replace, repair, and extend the life of things that would otherwise end up in a landfill. Now, to concretize this, it could be as simple as mending a pair of socks. I don't know about you, but I'm very guilty of throwing away pairs of socks if they have a simple hole in them. Um, Whereas someone like Reshmaji, who was an incredible tailor, she would go to the markets in Jaipur and buy fabric and make these beautiful sarees, um, all from her creativity and her imagination and from those skills. So she taught me a lot about what Jugad is and how I can apply a more sustainable uh, way of consuming goods while rem remaining in this society. So that is just one uh, element of knowledge that I learned from my host community, and there's a lot other things that I learned. 
So it's my belief that the immense problems that we face in the world today all have a simple solution, and that is sharing. Sharing the knowledge, the unique forms of knowledge that each of our cultures and communities possesses, regardless of the boundaries that seek to divide us. The problems of our time don't end at, say, the boundaries of academic disciplines or of cultural frames of knowledge, of reference, or even at national borders, right? And neither should our approach to solving these problems end at these boundaries. I'm convinced that exposure to difference and to diversity in all of their forms is essential to developing innovative solutions to the problems of our time. Only then can we harness the power of the unique knowledge of our communities. We're here today to tell you a little bit more about Princeton and Asia and how we go about understanding and learning from the cultures and communities that we work with across Asia. Our organization's work in intercultural education and exchange provides a durable framework and structure for providing people from the United States and Asia with exposure to difference and diversity and the opportunity to gain experience working together across difference to solve problems. So our overarching mission is to promote mutual appreciation and cross-cultural understanding between the United States and Asia but our bigger picture vision is contributing to building a world where individuals share a mutual appreciation and respect for the diversity of cultures and perspectives. Princeton in Asia was founded way back in 1898 by enterprising young students from Princeton University. We are an independent nonprofit that is affiliated with Princeton University and we're located on its campus in the state of New Jersey in the United States. Over the last 125 years of our history, Princeton and Asia has sent fellows to over 30 countries and regions across Asia to support the work of more than 400 host organizations. Our alumni network of more than 3,400 alumni come from more than 150 universities across the US and beyond. Currently, we're very happy to say that we have 23 fellows working in eight different countries and regions across Asia, and we are incredibly honored that two of those fellows are teaching at KEMEP University in Almaty. Do we have any students from KEMEP University in the crowd or graduates from KEMEP? Make some noise for your university. We're going to be there next week, and we're incredibly excited to visit your beautiful campus. So there are six key values that serve as pillars and lenses for our work of cultural exchange. And I'd argue that these values would serve anyone well uh, who's seeking to promote intercultural learning or who wants to work with a global mindset or with a global team. So I should stress that these are not American values or United States values. In fact, these are values that transcend boundaries and values that we've learned from our long history of engaging with Asian cultures and communities. So the first is transformation, and that's about having an openness and a desire to change. The second is about immersion, which is like diving in and swimming around in the water of a new culture. I'm gonna focus more on the next four values because I think they're really important to what we're talking about today. And the one I wanna focus first on is humility. Humility can be defined as freedom from arrogance. It's really about being comfortable not knowing the answer to something, being comfortable asking more questions than you answer, being comfortable saying, I don't know, and recognizing that your way of doing things is not necessarily the best way. And this is a really valuable mindset to take into, into your work. The next is contributing to our community. So we focus our fellows on making positive contributions to their organization or their community and playing a part in a larger effort as opposed to going in to fix something or solve a problem because they're learning how to contribute to solving a global issue at the local level. And we believe that that experience early on in life will position them to be better able to solve bigger, thornier problems with global teams and at a greater scale in the future. The next is relationship building. And this is about building trust and rapport with the people you're meeting and the people you're working with. It means going beyond the surface. And instead of just collaborating on a work product, getting to understand who the person is you're collaborating with, where do they come from, what's their family like, what do they like to eat, what's important to them. These things are really, really important. We need to share trust and share our stories. And then finally, mutuality and interdependence. And this is all about exchange being a two-way street, 
learning from a new community and culture while sharing some of your own community and culture. And it's about understanding one's place in the world. So those of you who have spent time in the United States or know a little bit about the United States might know that it's a very individualist culture. So it's, it's very, you know, it's t touted and celebrated to be independent and to do things yourselves. And, you know, that has its place and there, there are strengths to, to that sort of approach. But a lot of times people approach things with a capital I attitude. And we try to encourage people to approach things with a lowercase i or an interdependent attitude, understanding your reliance on others and your responsibility to others and how you fit into the larger picture of this global world. At PIA, we like to invest in building the capacities of young people to learn across cultural and other differences. We bring people together from across the US and Asia to promote mutual appreciation and cross-cultural understanding. We offer one or two year immersive work fellowships in the host organizations and communities who are tackling the most pressing issues across Asia. We select recent college graduates from across the US who have different academic and personal backgrounds, experiences, and interests. And not only are our fellows' backgrounds and identities diverse, but so is the work that they do while they're on a PIA fellowship. Our fellowships span eight different issue areas or industries, which are arts and culture, economic development, education, environmental sustainability, peace, justice, and access to information, public health, sports, and STEM. And regardless of the work that our fellows are doing, all of our fellows are committed to immersing themselves in the life of their host organizations and communities. After their fellowship, they're also committed to sharing their newfound perspectives and experiences, these valuable forms of knowledge, once they return to their host countries. We like to say that PIA offers a change in perspective, a job that matters, and a community for life. PIA fellowships offer the opportunity for personal growth, meaningful work, and strong connections to host communities in Asia. By doing PIA, our fellows increase their empathy, their open-mindedness, their humility, flexibility, and their resilience as well. Our alumni overwhelmingly report that their fellowship helped to build their soft skills, those interpersonal skills, including cross-cultural communication and their flexibility. Of course, as we just heard in the previous lecture, given globalization in the 21st century, these soft skills are extremely valuable qualities for working in a cross-cultural team, for example, regardless of the environment or industry that you may find yourself in. Additionally, the work that our fellows do matters to their host organizations and their communities, precisely because it is high-impact work that is driven by the need of the host community. Our fellows are stewarding relationships that have been in place for decades in some cases, and the cumulative impact of PI fellowships over the 125 years of our history is enormous. Year after year, our host organizations continue requesting fellows because of the value that they contribute to the host organization. Our fellows are committed to excellence and doing high impact work to develop the capacities of students, staff, and other faculty at host organizations and universities that we work at. One of the really special things about PIA is that it offers a community for life. And so our fellows are focused on building relationships and bridges in Asia that last long beyond the end of their fellowship year. So many of our fellows are still in contact with friends they made in their host community or former colleagues. Most of our alumni return to their host countries after their experience. And I think it's important to note that when you're doing exchanges like this, everyone's making a big investment. The host organization is investing in onboarding, getting a visa for someone, uh, hosting them in their organization. A fellow's making an investment of one to two years of their lives uh, to, to serve this mission. But these investments yield deep and rich returns in the form of lifelong connections to people and cultures that are strengthened and deepened over time. And I want to give two examples of this, both related to Kazakhstan. Um, so this is my first time in Astana, but I am really lucky that this is my fourth time traveling to Kazakhstan in the past 12 years. And my first connection to Kazakhstan came when I was a PIA fellow in Laos. My job was managing the National Rugby Federation in, in Laos. Does anyone here play rugby? Okay, do you know that Kazakhstan has excellent rugby? 
Yes, you know that, especially your women's team. They're very good. Okay, so the Kazakh junior men's national team came to Laos for a tournament, and I had the chance to meet many of these players, see them play rugby on the pitch, hear them sing your beautiful national anthem, and that was my first real exposure to Kazakhstan. Then two years later, I got to go visit the Kazakh National Rugby Association uh, in Almaty, and then through PIA, I've had the chance to travel here th three more times. And you know, I'm never going to forget this experience of being here in Astana with all of you, just as I'm never going to forget my first experience eating Beshbarmak with the Kazakh uh, National Rugby Union. So these are the sorts of life experiences that make life worthwhile and worth living, that bring us joy and happiness. And I think we've talked about a lot of gloom and doom in this conference, but it's really important to hold on to the, the joy that comes from meeting each other, getting to know each other, and learning from each other. And then finally, the second example I'd give is one of our very first fellows who served in Kazakhstan back in the mid-90s uh, came over because she knew Russian and she wanted to have the experience of, uh, you know, strengthening her Russian and getting to know Kazakhstan. 25 years later, she's now living and working in Kazakhstan. This is her second time uh, working in Almaty, and she's been a real leader in helping us to build relationships across Central Asia. So these are lifelong connections that are forged, and you never know what's going to happen when you sign up to try something new, to meet someone new, to go somewhere new. So we've talked a lot today about how our one organization approaches this work of global learning, intercultural exchange. Um, and we're actively seeking ways to broaden this work in Central Asia. We're really grateful to have been able to send 66 fellows to Kazakhstan over the past uh, 25 years. Um, and we've also had the chance to send five fellows to Kyrgyzstan over the past six years. And we're actively looking for new opportunities to broaden and, and deepen these partnerships. But this is just one organization, one model of doing things. There are many pathways and opportunities and types of experiences that each of you can, can harness and participate in. And we want to encourage you to do that. Chase after these opportunities that give you the chance to go somewhere new, to meet someone new, to learn how to work together across difference and to connect with people who are different than you are. It's never too early to do this, and also it's never too late to do this. All right, so I have a message to the students in the room. That message is to continue supporting organizations like the Nobel Fest that achieve cross-cultural exchange and share knowledge that we each have in unique ways. Continue to seek out opportunities to engage with people who are different than you, because that is going to yield those lifelong lessons that are going to stick with you. Whether you're in your home community or in someone else's home, make the effort, invest to engage across difference. In the days that Mags and I have been here in Astana, we've been very pleased and, and quite honored to learn about uh, the different efforts that the government of Kazakhstan has made uh, in, in becoming a visionary and truly a leader in developing opportunities for folks to go abroad, whether they're students or faculty of different universities, for example. There's various internships, study abroad opportunities, and different exchanges. And I urge you to continue seeking out these opportunities and say yes to going abroad. Keep seeking out opportunities to engage across difference. And I think, uh, as the Nobel Fest teaches us, right, the power of technology is immense. You can leverage technology as a vehicle for connecting across difference, regardless of time or physical location. It might be easy to feel siloed or sometimes you're just stuck behind a screen alone, but really try to flip that thinking on its head. Use technology, use the power of technology to engage with folks across difference. Use your own agency in seeking out these opportunities, and you be, might be surprised by the lessons that you'll learn. Yeah. So this is the last day of the, this part of the conference, and this is the end of our talk. My final words to you are, you've met someone new at this, at this experience, I hope. Don't let the business card that you exchange be just a business card. Let that be uh, the start of a relationship that you're developing and going to be harnessing and deepening in the future. Maybe you friended someone on Instagram or followed someone new on Instagram. Don't just let that be a passive following of someone on Instagram. Message them. Get to know them. Find out who they are. This is Technology is giving us great opportunities to strengthen and deepen these relationships that we make at events such as these. And then you've definitely learned something new here, right? We've heard amazing, amazing lectures from scientists and visionaries and incredible educators and teachers. So whether you've learned about how teachers are saving the world and how you can better support teachers, or you've learned something new about cryptocurrency, build on what you've learned. Um, use technology to keep 
pushing and driving and nurture that spark and that inspiration that came from this, this uh, wonderful, wonderful Nobel Fest. I know that we'll be doing that. Rachmet. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Uh, thank Dylan. You. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Uh, wait, please, just one second. Maybe our audience have some oh, questions. Okay. If you have some time. Sure. Yes, maybe there are questions. Uh, to Mr. Hernandez and Mr. Dylan. Go ahead. Yes. Grab a mic, raise your hand, and ask a question. Guys, don't be shy. Don't be shy because remember, we had a giveaway for the most active participants. So if you're active, so please introduce yourself and ask a question. So my name is Alisher. I'm a, you know, I have a question for you, sir. Please tell us where, what, what did you finish, uh, what university, and what's your occupation and department that you are specializing on? Sure. Um, so I graduated from Princeton University in New Jersey, and I studied German there. And now my role is executive director of Princeton in Asia. So this is our independent nonprofit organization that facilitates these exchanges. And Matt? Yeah. Um, I graduated from the University of California in Santa Barbara. I majored in history. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm currently a program director with PIA. I manage our fellowships in South Asia, which is the region where I did my fellowship in India, um, as well as Central Asia. So I'm incredibly honored to be working uh, and engaging with the fascinating culture, uh, learning more about Kazakhstan and getting to be here with all of you. So thank you for this fantastic opportunity. You're going to be caught, you know, outside this hall. And <laughs> they will not let you go. Еще один вопрос по теме, надеюсь, будет... Yeah. And maybe one more question. Can I do it in Russian? Because I don't speak English very much. So my name is Ahmayan. So I'm a student of a medical university here in Kazakhstan. And uh, I was planning to go and uh, study abroad. But it's difficult uh, for a medical university. A lot of requirements. So my question is, is it possible for us to um, maybe be the first generation of students that can help you create a Princeton in Asia. And because I believe that uh, in March in March of 2023, yeah, next year, we would like to have a museum uh, on uh, human organs, human body organs, because you know you have it in other countries, but we don't have it in Kazakhstan. So I was wondering if you know, if we could help you somehow. So let me translate. Please uh, clarify what is the difference, what is the connection between the, the Museum of Human Organs and the Princeton in Asia? Because I don't see the connection. Well, there is a connection. Uh, is it just part of education? That's the difference. Oh, okay. She's a medical student, ah. and uh, she tried to go for study abroad, mm -hmm. but it's very difficult because this area, medicine, is mm -hmm. very, it's really hard to uh, go to study abroad, even just to any university, mm -hmm. you, you understand mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. So uh, they want to be the first students to help you to work with this program. And so she, uh, they also want to open some kind of museum of uh, human organs. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Yeah. I'm so sorry because I, I am a doctor also and I'm a psychotherapist. Okay, yeah. So sorry about that. And <laughs> yeah. uh, that uh, girl, she was wanted to ask you mm -hmm. about um, to open some of, uh, of the program here from the Princeton University. And uh, they, uh, the group of the students, they will, uh, will want it to be, um, how to say, like uh, um, volunteers mm. uh, to contact with you and to ask um, your um, how to say, uh, the Princeton University, if they can open here something, and they, was, uh, they wanted to start with uh, the, uh, the Museum of the Human Organs. Mm, yeah, mm. because she, uh, maybe she know, I don't know about that, but maybe she know, knew about that uh, you have something like that, a program in the other countries or in other mm. uh, cities. Mm. So, mm. Okay. Uh, it's, it's about that. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you. thank you so much for that question. And thank you for, for translating. I appreciate that very much. 
No, no, no. I, I really appreciate it. I think this is a, a great question, and I, I appreciate you asking it. So I, I should clarify that I cannot speak for Princeton University. We are an independent organization of that university, so I'm not a representative of them. Um, but I'd be happy to talk with you offline about what it would look like to try to support the project that you're that you're talking about. And I think th I'd, I'd love to learn more about um, your goals for this this museum. This sounds really interesting, and I'd, I'd be look forward to talking to you afterwards to, to learn more about it. Yeah. The power of connection, yeah, right? Yeah, so you right. have a chance to, to catch our professors, uh, our guests outside and to talk about this. And I hope you will find some yes. uh, connections and opportunities. Yes, thank so, you. Hello. All right, one more question. Uh, Hello, my name is Ayum. So I want to know uh, what motivates you to become a part of Princeton organization and what are the exact pros that uh, can motivate other students to also become a part of Princeton organization. And also, can you tell us uh, how can we uh, ah, become yes, a part of Princeton organization? Matt, do you want to start? Yes. Well, I. In my case, I, was, I felt very grateful for the experience that I had on the program. I learned so much about India. I was able to explore my personal interests, both academic um, and, and personal. And yeah, I was so incredibly grateful for that opportunity. And I wanted, uh, if in even a small way, to contribute to other people having that same experience or a similar experience to pursue their own interests. So that's what motivates me, uh, motivated me to join the organization and what motivates me day in, day out to do this work. Um, it's been quite difficult uh, during the pandemic. Uh, it's felt quite, a, maybe a bit theoretical at times. Wow, when is it going to be possible to send people abroad again? But we're very fortunate that, as we said, we have 23 fellows currently uh, in Asia now. Um, and just seeing their growth and their learning on their individual fellowship journeys is what continues to motivate me to do this work. Um, as far as what some of the pros are, uh, in my, I can only speak from my own experience and, and what I've learned from the fellows that I work with. Um, but generally, everyone learns a lot about their host country, their host community. They're able to go beyond their comfort zone to become more independent, um, to learn things about themselves that they would not have learned otherwise, right? I think when you challenge yourself, when you push your own limits and your own boundaries, you can definitely surprise yourself. That was the case for me. I know that is the case for a lot of people on the program. And I urge all of you to, if not, uh, you know, there's many different programs like Princeton in Asia, um, but you can go abroad. It's, it, even by like walking somewhere, walking a different route. Uh, say you, you always take the same route to your school or your university. Try getting lost, right? Leave a little bit early. Go explore a new part of the world that you may not have otherwise uh, exposed yourself to. And I really am a huge believer that there is learning in every moment if you just seek it. So go out and get lost somewhere. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a time for the last question. Можно, можно, можно вопрос, пожалуйста. Завершающий, можно? Пожалуйста, встаньте, кто говорит с микрофоном, очень много видно вас. And uh, just recently, uh, he said that the goals and objectives of Princeton in Asia and the Nobel Fest are the same. So, and uh, uh, would you not agree that? Uh, would you agree that uh, maybe? Uh, I think that the Princeton in Asia and the Nobel Fest team need to collaborate more uh, in, for future Nobel Fest. And uh, uh, since since the goals are very very similar, so maybe you can join join forces, right, and do this Nobel Fest together. Uh, wants to see you every Nobel Fest <laughs> here. So that's uh, that's what they want, and there is no question actually. It's just you know they are happy to see you here, and they want to have you know this chance to be as close as 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 it possible to Princeton University, to the program Princeton in Asia, and people like you. So thank you, and uh, wow. we have a question from uh, one Bonner. question from uh, how to say at представителя поколения Z. Uh, I am uh, firstly listening about the uh, program Princeton in Asia, and I and then you say that you have two filials in the Kimap University. Am I right? Yes. Uh, and I uh, want to ask, what actually can this program uh, give to us? Uh, what eligibility criteria for our uh, Kazakh? Mm -hmm. uh, 
who want to study abroad, who want this culture exchange, can you please say uh, yeah. uh, some more information about it? Yeah, I think this is a this is a great question. So right now our program sends Americans to uh, Asian host communities, and through working at these particular host organizations, those fellows then create new opportunities and networks for the students and the faculty and the administrators that they work with and focus on capacity building. So right now that's the way that we have that mutual exchange, but I think it's a really exciting possibility to explore for the future in terms of how we can support people to, to come over to the to the US. But one of the one of the things that Matt mentioned is that our network includes fellows from a hundred plus universities across the US and there are so many great places to go and, and opportunities to learn about. And so we hope by sending a diverse group of fellows out to these various institutions that we can share more opportunities for how you can come over to the US. So that's that's um, a, a little bit about that, but it's a, it's a really great question, which I appreciate. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We hope to see you again. Oh, you know. Thank you, that's the honor's so nice. all ours. Thank you. One, more, one more question, please. Oh, wow. One, one more. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so, here. Look at some, ah, you see me, yes. Okay, uh, the final question is the, what the advice each of you can give to the young people? So, thank you. <laughs> okay, well, as a fellow young person, um, I think I would say that it's never too late to try something new. And I came to PIA after thinking that I was going to be a German professor. And then I realized that I was not going to be a German professor, so I'd spent my whole college career studying one thing. I started trying it, and then I realized, I don't know myself at all. Um, and I think you change a lot in your 20s, and just be open to that, be open to new experiences, and changing directions and pivoting. We heard in, this, in a couple of, I think it was the last panel, that Gen Z will, will change jobs 15 times. You know, Life is long and there are many different chapters and I think being open to and excited about the different chapters, not putting too much pressure on yourself for each step you're taking ahead of yourself, but being open to sort of zigging and zagging through your path. That's the, that's the advice I'd have. Yeah, so as a fellow member of Gen Z, Mags, I hope that's not an indication of my employment with you, <laughs> but uh, yeah, as a fellow member of Gen Z, I would say go out there and break all expectations, even your own. Uh, you will surprise yourself go out there, go outside of the box, outside of preconceived notions. Um, that is what the world needs now. It needs innovative thinkers, it needs radical thinkers. Uh, do not be passive, do not become complacent, and always strive to break the expectations. Yeah. Thank you Thank for you. the great advice. Thank, Thank you. May I ask a question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Rachmet. May I ask a question, please? Слушайте, вы там с книжкой за вопросы пришли. No, actually, we, we actually, we don't have time anymore, Thank unfortunately, you. but I'm sure you can catch them, yeah, you we'll know, be out outside there. this stage. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Спасибо. Аплодисменты Давайте нашим поаплодируем. гостям. Спасибо и вам за активное участие. Thank you, guys. Thank you for everyone. So, uh, did I just mention that we're going to have a giveaway to the most active ones? So everybody has a question, so that's how it works. It's called incentive, right? Everybody wants to win an, an Apple notebook, but there won't be any Apple notebooks, but anyways. So good advice, by the way, and this is for any generation out there. We need to be open, we need to go beyond our expectations, and we need to experiment as much as possible. So by the way, and give the floor to our next speaker, Martin Wazowski, who's the chief futurist and head of the Future Hub at SAP with the topic leading from the future. Mr. Wazowski, we are waiting for you. Давайте, друзья, встретим мистера Wazowski. Мы с ним уже тоже знакомы. Посмотрите, вот он. Yes, Mr. Wazowski is here. Yes, uh, you know, a man who knows his business, charismatic, uh, and a very, very unorthodox person. So, give a big shout out to Mr. Wazowski. How are you doing? We're getting, we're getting to the end of it, at least for now, at least for now, a little bit. Um, let's talk about the future. We have only half an hour to talk about the whole of the future. Can you imagine? Why is the future so important to us? I think my, my friend uh, from Sweden, where I lived for a very long time, he said, 
you and I and everybody, your teachers, your professors, your neighbors, your dog, your cat, everybody will spend the rest of our lives in the future. So how do you want it to be? That's the question, right? That's the question. Why are you relevant 10 years from now, for example? That's the question that drives me and, and our future hub at SAP where I work. And you know, with this, this kind of question, a lot of imagination comes to mind. And as we said yesterday, with the power of your imagination comes the power of shaping, science, engineering, design and all these fantastic artistic expressions of humankind. And more questions arise. And you know, I wake up every morning with these very deep, profound questions. What's the future? What is the future? <laughs> exactly. And if, <laughs> yes, and if someone tells you if someone tells you that they know the future, they are insane. They are insane. But I tell you one thing that the future is. Future is like this. It's an action sport. It feels really, really wrong <laughs> when you're winning the gold medal. Because you're playing on the edge. You're playing on the limits of your knowledge of what you have learned so far. So you cannot predict that, but you can prepare for the future. Beware people that predict the future. Either they are some religious sect or they are some political leader. They want you to have their future. You can create your own. So, let's talk about me for half an hour now. No, uh, I am useless here. I'm absolutely useless. I can be the smartest person in the room and I know that I'm not unless there is an audience, there is a society, there is a community. It's like a reflection of each other. It's like putting me in the mirror and we see ourselves. We are reflection and this is how we need to progress with the future. And between me and we, I believe there is technology. Something, something very important, something we work on because technology is human evolution. From the fire to the wheel, it extended our brains. It made us the nomadic people we were. And the Central Asia is the center of the nomadic culture. We will talk about it in a second. And we can imagine these futures through technology. And, and sometimes these futures are maybe not so positive. Look at this prototype of London underwater because of climate change. That's interesting. But we should know that the future is a resource and it's a renewable resource, an ever-changing natural resource. It's in your head, in your imagination, in your engineering, in your shaping. It never ends. So you can always create an optimistic, positive future, even in the worst scenarios. Because, you know, the sustainable people, planet and the purpose is the imagination we have. And that optimist is very important because nothing, nothing good ever happened from pessimism. <laughs> we didn't go to the moon, as I said yesterday, just because we were, nah, maybe we won't make it. We went to the moon <laughs> because we were optimistic we could happen, that could happen. Although we knew it was at the moment impossible. So take everything that is impossible and imagine this possible and go there. And technology can help us. Look at these sensors, for example, uh, glucose sensor, temperature sensor, even skin cancer sensors. We can, uh, this is actually a prototype from some years ago. Look at these two people. This gentleman is driving a Formula One car. This lady is writing a book, maybe. Both of them are paralyzed. They control machines with their minds. That's technology, not telepathy <laughs> or any kind of pseudoscience. Look at this. This is a grain of rice that you can cook. That is a computational device. Grain of sugar. You can put it in a drink and drink it. It maybe tells the data out of your body. Blood pressure, temperature, whatever you want. But the, with adv advances in neuroscience, maybe we can put data in our brains, in our bodies, in our neural system. Maybe we can put some of these sugar molecules in a drink and drink it in the morning and learn some Kazakhstani poetry and maybe some Beskaru and combine this during your day of adventures at work. 
And obviously the final code, uh, CRISPR-Cas9, etc. Now we can actually use technology to recode our lives for real. And it's not only here on Earth. This gentleman is dreaming of building uh, hotels in space. Speaking of creative ideas, right? Offering inflatable rooms and 16 sunsets per day. This is possible. This is imaginable. It's happening. And art in space is happening. Humans are fantastic. We create art wherever we go. And since we go into space, we create art. This is a friend of mine from Israel. He was asked by NASA to create human art that they shoot out in space from the space station. And he was thinking, laughter connects all humans across the globe and some animals as well. So he started to make an app where people laugh to the phone and the best laugh was voted on and then 3D printed in the shape of, a, of, the, of, of, of different shapes, uh, basic shapes like a circle, like a donut. And then they 3D printed the best one and shoot it out in space. <laughs> I don't know if it was the best laughter because it was one of them. <laughs> Yes, that's what we do. But it's tricky business. We are humans. Look, you remember six years ago something? Boston Dynamics, yeah? And people were kicking these robots. American Animal Protection Agency got emails from people very, very devastated. People are ki kicking dogs. They had to answer, these are not real dogs. See, we are very emotional. We have even emotions for robots. Although we know they are robots, are we rational, irrational? Maybe we should ask Mr. Pinker, because he wrote a book about it. That is excellent, by the way. And now, speaking of space and robots, Caterpillar is signing a contract with Japanese government to build excavation machines controlled from Earth on the moon, because we will have constructions on the moon. Can you imagine? And the internet community immediately went bananas. They started to combine the logotypes of Caterpillar with Star Wars, which I'm a huge fan of. And my question is, who owns this? Star Wars, George Lucas, Caterpillar, me? I don't know. Because this is not an NFT. Nobody knows where it happens. It's centralized, not decentralized. And speaking of the metaverse and the Web3 and NFTs, it can be pretty daunting. Who am I? That's a very philosophical question, no? But not if you Google it. Where am I going? Google Maps? No, maybe also in philosophical question. See, technology, me, you, me, we, and technology and humanity is an evolution that we need to take and we need to take these steps. And this data I was talking about, this gentleman is walking into a restaurant in Tokyo. Before that, he gave up his bodily fluids. I know it sounds disgusting, but that's what you do. They build your health profile, your well-being profile. You walk in, they look into your face, and then they take that data, put it in a machine. The machine takes that data and prints a real physical object in form of a sushi piece, food, right there. And you can eat it and feel better. Because we are data, walking, talking, how we smell, how we move. We can recognize a person from 100 meters with a camera. Who she is, even. Exactly that person. And now we can take that data and put it back in real world and put it back in our, ourselves. This is across the worlds as we know it. And soon, maybe, we can eat a pill and become totally someone else. Especially in the digital world, which is the Web3, which is emerging. So my questions is getting trickier and trickier. And what's the future? Humanity-centered design, what is that? What is human in 2040, 45, and more? What I'm saying in this beginning here of this presentation is that never in the human history have we taken a technology and that works and just discarded it? If a technology is there, we somehow make a use of it. What do you want to use it for? What's your imagination? What do you want to shape with it? What's your future? And never in the human history have the now, the present, been so temporary. Because the future is faster and faster the more we walk into it. And science fiction is really becoming science fact. As we see, you remember, you remember Snow Crash, a famous uh, science fiction novel that mentions the metaverse, and then some company changed their name to the same name. 
I wonder what they will do with it. I wonder if they will exist 10 years from now, if they are as centralized as they are. That was my intro, the me, we, and the technology. But there's most to it. It's technology becomes a relationship, not only between us and technology and robots, but also between ourselves and how we live and how we used to live and how we walk into these uncertain futures. Zygmunt Bauman studied humans and he said something that struck my, my mind, liquid modernity. Huh. Social forms do not solidify at all. Cannot serve as a long-term plan. Don't have long-term plans. Unending series of short-term projects and episodes require a flexible and adaptable pursuit of opportunities, like a river. Or maybe like a nomadic life. Because you know much more about nomadic life than I ever will. At least Central Asia does. And I think this is a beautiful prospect. Cultural and social life first. Economic aspect second. This is not how capitalism works today. Cultural curiosity about otherness, the other people. This is amazing. This is a bias we struggle with. But here, in the nomadic center of the world, Otherness and learning new skills and technologies comes naturally, apparently. In constant flow, you remember the river I just said? Of new people and sensations, there's a high tolerance for differences. Religion, language, dress code, status and more. Nomadism is also a way of thinking about the world around circles and circles of lives. And it's a philosophy. It's a spirituality. I found this beautiful. I'm not so sure if many people think about it, but if you have an open mind to be, have a nomadic life geographically, there's one thing. I don't think many people have that anymore. But we need an open mind to how we relate to each other, to otherness, to, to our biases, in our minds, in our digital spheres, in our metaverses and in space. We need to have a nomadic, beautiful, artistic and soulful way of living. And this is important because if you ask people, this is a big study, they say this is the values we have. Relationship, belonging, community, personal response, compassion, creativity. This is what we care for. And technology, another technological example. For example, Pentagon is working on a laser that you can shoot on a person and through even thick clothes we can hear the heartbeat with the laser. But that's not the whole thing. They can recognize the heartbeat of a certain person from 200 yards. They know that this is Martin Vesovsky standing over there by listening to my heart like a fingerprint. And that's amazing engineering, I must say. I'm super impressed. But do they really know what my heart feels? <laughs> I don't think so. That's the relationship to technology we need. And I think it goes also for corporations. We know that we need profit. But I claim that profit is an effect, as we always knew, by the way. It's an effect of having good business models that work on a market for people that stick with you. They become, they having a relationship with you. This is where you make profit. So we should move to purpose and network our ideas to empower a global experimentation. A nomadic mindset gives us that. Because if you plan rigorously and just control everything, you will never be in the future. You will always be stuck in your plan. And that plan is old as soon as you take the next step. So we need to be flexible. And I've been a teacher too. I, we have some prominent teachers here in the room. So I'm really humbled to just say that. Uh, but I was always wondering, what to tell these people? I don't know, I admire you so much. I dropped out of school myself. I never finished, I never t took a degree because school didn't agree with me. I had another way to be mentored, to be taught, to learn. Much more free and much more nomadic. And I think the best answer, the immediate answer at least, and correct me if I'm wrong later, is that we have no idea what to tell these people. Look at these ladies. Who are you, with the beard? I mean, seriously? So this is the answer, and this is also the answer that starts the best science. Mm, I have no idea. Let's find out. This is how curiosity starts. But 
I want also to show you that curiosity stretches over long systemic times. Many companies, many institutions live very much in the tactical sphere. And they don't understand that the, having a strategic outlook, how to get to the future, is much more important than what you're doing today. Because then what you're doing today changes shape. But just knowing how to do it is not the thing. Knowing why you're doing, having a vision, leading from the future to your tactics is the most important thing. And sometimes it's a systemic level evolution. So I'm asking you, where are you relevant? To whom? Why are you relevant? How many years in the future you can imagine? Are you only doing the tactics or are you actually leading from that future? This is what we do in our team in the Future Hub for SAP. We lead from the future because Many think that innovation is generated when there is a specific goal in mind. And yes, innovation can be generated if you have a specific goal in mind. Sometimes you ask the right question in your research and you innovate something. But that can be just incremental. And having a specific goal in mind sometimes limits you. Innovation must be led by purpose and principles. This is where you imagine and speculate what could be rather than just learning what might be of your numbers and extrapolations. So please forecast as much as you can. Please extrapolate. Do the data and analytics of the historical and current data. But please, what did you imagine the future to be and lead from that future? Last chapter in this presentation, the me and the we, when we reflect each other. We are useless without each other. We are only here because we are here together. Me, we, and technology becomes humanity. This is us. This is the connection. And we believe, at least I believe, in my imagination, in our imagination, that people collaborating with learning systems is the future of expertise and learning and creativity and work. And I work for a company, SAP, that makes business software, work software for people. This is a friend from Berlin where I live currently, Roman Lipsky. He paints to an AI machine, to a machine learning uh, machine, I should say. That machine learns how he paints and paints back. The me and we becomes the human and the technology in a symbiosis. And then he paints back to the machine inspired by what he has seen. It's his job. It's his work. And he used technology to augment himself, to be augmented and create something new. And I think this is the future. And this is the optimistic way of looking on humanizing technology. And I think there is a big movement and big trend ongoing. And historians might uh, dismiss this, and please do if you, if you will. But I divide modern sort of a work history in only three chapters. Process ownership. You remember the steam machine, or whatever machine you have, the steam machine. I have a steam machine, I have a factory, I employ you. Here's the process, do it and I pay you. Okay? So we did that for a while. But it was very centralized. I took all the money, basically. And all the knowledge as well. You just did what I told you and the machine told you. But then we got a little bit more money. Salaries came in and so on. Education, social safety. And we started to be experts. Here's what you can do if you are me. <laughs> I'm the expert. I'm from consultant firm and I can show you and then leave you and I take your money as well and then maybe you progress and we do progress and we do new science, new technology and new engineering and today we have tools that help us to create, to be the experts ourselves like Roman himself there with the uh, help of technology and all of a sudden we are in the era of emergent creativity. Me, we and creativity. Can't wait what you will do with it. This is what the internet offers. And this is why I think the promise with the new technologies of Web3 and new maybe socio-economical and even political systems can emerge from this emergent creativity. That's the key. Because you are the creator of the future. You are the author. You're the authority of the future. You are the creator, not the consumer of someone else's future. Now, I want to shape technology specially for you. Now, let me show you two engineered devices. <laughs>
You've seen them before. On next slide. And how the user uses them. Okay? And let's see if this is according to plan. Look at this girl. Yeah. Is this by design? I think she uses this tool in a wrong way. Or is the tool wrong for her? Look at this gentleman. You know KPIs? We need to make our KPIs and our numbers. Look at the tail of the dog. That's your KPI. 10%, 20%? No, it's 100% satisfaction. This is good engineering. But see, it wasn't intended like that. Because people think in personas, roles, and functions. But this is not what we are. We are individuals, we are persons, that's what we are. And all these devices, we love them because they give us this personal data. Now that data can be taken by other people, but at least they help me. I have no sense of direction, I'm using maps of different kind to find my way home. And this I find a give and take relationship. However, in business software, we usually talk to companies, which is an abstract. We forget that in each company there is a she, and she takes decisions. We need to augment that person, the me, so we can become a better we through technology. And I think our vision can be expressed simply like this. Humans and machines in an empathic symbiosis. And that will be across the world, not only in our planetary system where we're all already traveling, but in the virtual, the augmented, and the real world. And technology must follow us and be super personal to us. And our vision can be explained very simply. Put the human in the center. The decision maker, she needs to be augmented to her best self, or optimal self, I should say, in each situation. This is your self-development, growth mindset as a service, if you would like to talk uh, technology ling lingo. Individuals to their optimal selves at work and enabling a hyper-personal, only for me flow. 10 billion people on this planet all of them having 10 billion different pieces of software. That's the dream. And if we can make her to take superhuman decisions, because she's so augmented with information, data, specifically for her, she understands the world so differently by that, we can probably augment your strategy, your leadership team, your boardroom. And if we can do that augmentation for people that lead, that take decisions about our future, for a better future, Maybe we should look at the systems we live in, autonomous operations. How does your company operate? Ah, we automate everything. That's perfect. But wait a second. Automation means that you predicted the future. And what did you say in the beginning? Don't predict the future. <laughs> be prepared for the future. Be autonomous. Be fluent. Be nomadic in your brain. Autonomy is much more important than autonomousness. Uh, sorry, the other way around, obviously. And if you can be autonomous in your business, in your processes, you can be autonomous in your networks. Whoever you meet, the new people, the otherness. Imagine the Suez Canal incident just, uh, just the other year. Stop supply chains across the world. Wars do that as well. Climate change and, and accidents like that do that too. It's not an accident, by the way, but you know what I mean. These anomalies, I think these anomalies will be the norm. And we need to ha have systems that autonomously adapt and flow fluently, liquidly through that into our futures and take us and augment us in each situation that is different at each time. This is why augmented me is such an important thing. And the future could look like this. You will see Taylor. She's an imaginary leader from the future. Taylor. It's a funny name, it's an English name, but it also means that the software she's using is tailored to her. Very funny. And she's talking to her system like this. User. Gaia, I want to build an exceptionally high performing team for our new project. Who do we have as our potentials? Based on the success criteria of assembling past teams, I found outstanding candidates from our network. I can run a project simulation and see how this team would perform together. Do they need to be on our direct payroll only? Not necessarily. Thanks, Gaia. 
Gaia can match overall team needs with individual's work experience, skills and social traits to ensure the right candidates to emerge. This is due to the real-time and contextual analysis capabilities. It's a pretty advanced and quite handy and cool intelligence from the future. Just a friendly reminder, Taylor. I can also find optimal contracts with them. Absolutely, thank you. Please also include options for fiat and digital currency payments. Meanwhile, I'll work on the ocean cleanup project, which is time sensitive. On it. That's Taylor and her system. She's communicated, communicating with that system to augment herself. The, the boring, the mundane, the really impossible for a human brain understanding, to understand tasks are made in seconds. So she can focus on being creative, optimistic, looking forward, her ocean cleanup project. She can assemble the best team, both emotionally and intelligently, rather than looking for people and fighting for the best talent. Why is there a war on talent, as they say, rather than reaching to the me and the we symbiosis with the machines like this and assemble the teams for a purpose, for a solution, rather than only for a competition? This is what we want to achieve. These are smart apps. These are systems because they are human in the center because they are super smart. And the smartest app in the world, what is that? I think it's the one that makes you smarter. That's it. So you can be, you know, like normal people. Unique, special, 10 billion of you, very, very soon. Because if we see the opposite, if we work in this strange mechanical system as we do today, it's all about the scalable efficiency. You heard it in your business school, right? Standardized activities, planning, prediction. It's repeatable results, predictable outcomes. For me, that sounds perfectly like a computer system, <laughs> not as a human. Now, human creativity is something very, very different. As I said yesterday, it's not this adjusting your margins in the Word document or finding a number in an Excel spreadsheet. It's writing that love letter, writing that paper that you wanted to write, making that experiment, calling your ecosystem. Contribute to an open source community. And I think we need to maybe re even redefine what work is. Maybe work is to surface, foster and optimize our individual gifts to create a higher value in feelings, wisdom, self-actualization for ourselves, the me and the we, the communities around us. As Richard Branson said, there is a reason why we are called human beings and not human doings. Do your stuff, but remember to why, what's your purpose? Why are you here? And I think this is even affecting politics in a way. Concentration and centra centralization have worked excellently so far, but now it creates inequality. Distribution and inclusion, anyone can get to these opportunities in the future. That's what we imagine. Evolution, creation, a purpose is much more important than optimization, planning and scale. That is important, but you need to build on it. Diversity and hyper-personalization rather than uniformity and standardization. We need to play on both sides. Learning, growth and fulfillment rather than protectionism and mistrust and secrecy as we see in many technological and governmental institutions today. And from that, I believe we move from becoming consumers of someone else's centralized, controlled and planned future to creators, authors and authorities of that future through environmental and technological harmony. You, me and technology in harmony. Now to ending up, content is okay, that's the data, that's what we do. But we are not contentual, we humans, we are contextual. We change our mindset just because of the weather. <laughs> Computers don't, unless you pour water on them. Content is important, data becomes information, but as soon as it becomes knowledge and something fluffy like wisdom, we understand it better because we are humans. And if you try that in products or services, you have your features and we love them. You serve them in products and you build relationships. We all have relationships to stuff we buy and wear, to brands, technologies and services. We love them, we hate them. 
It's relationships. So I, I urge you, create relationships and the rest will follow. And when you do this well and you connect the people in great relationships to technology, the me, we technology in a relationship, you will create some kind of a collective intelligence. And I think open source and Web3 and all these beautiful things are welcoming to these ideas. And I think this is where we should uh, uh, be nurturing. Features come out of the relationships and the futures we imagine. And these relationships are of great value. Sometimes they give us money. Some friend calls you and says, hey, I've got a job for you. You get a good raise. Or I have a new market you can open here. This is great. Classic fiat value. But we also need to think about other values, the tokens. And tokens can be anything. They can represent goodwill, teaching a language, being a teacher, being a mentor, being a guide being compassionate or just like someone joked here I know it looks like a brand but it's not as you see monthly activity created Wikipedia entry edited Wikipedia uploaded and tagged to 22 public photos maybe for an AI research downloaded song legally from iTunes etc recorded a podcast creativity maybe that's your value sheet maybe that's your bank account of the future Speaking of banks, I met a CEO of a bank. I, I meet a lot of leaders out there with our company. And she said, Martin, this is chaos. You're presenting chaos to me. We are a bank. We are in the business of stability. And I was thinking, hmm, so what's the opposite to stability? Is stability the best you can do? Stability is resistant to change. <laughs> That's not nomadic. That's not innovative, that's status quo, that's death. The opposite to stability is not instability. The opposite to stabi stability can be just you fading away in one spot very, very slowly. That's the bankruptcy. The opposite to stability is what we see here. Look at this beauty. It's beauty, it's evolution, it's emergent systems. We are an emergent system. However, we are the authors of that system. And we are the authority of that future of that system. So I ask you, why are you relevant 10 years from now? And to whom? And how? And so on. All these deep questions that I ask you to carry with you. Who wrote this music? It is a trick question. Of course, an AI. I heard it somewhere there. <laughs> the system is called Ava, and this beautiful piece is called Genesis. And I love that because Genesis means beginning. Every moment we spend with each other, build a relationship, is a beginning of something new. What do you think it is? What's your imagination? What's the future? I ask you. Because being such a young nation, and many other nations here in this room, you have the future in your hands. The youth leads the future to designing a world we all want to live in, maybe. And I leave you with a poem, because I find it beautiful. I have no idea who wrote it, but here it goes. You're a ghost, driving a meat-coated skeleton, made from stardust, riding a rock, hurdling through space. So fear nothing. Thank you very much. Welcome to the future. Wow. Wow. Thank you for this wonderful speech and this presentation. This is... The, it was amazing, seriously. This is the longest applause I, I, I have heard on no, this festival. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'm absolutely sure we have a lot of questions. Let's start, let's be very quick. Uh, there's one interesting question I want to know. So in the future, we're going to delegate our responsibility for the consumption to AI, essentially. 
And I was wondering, so what is the chance that a certain percentage of population will basically start worshipping this technology and there'll be like a new religion that is worshipping artificial intelligence as a god? try to translate so he's asking um, he thinks that because of technology we're gonna have some communities which will put the technology in the rank of a new god or new religion uh -huh. so is it possible how do you think or no everything is possible I mean everything is possible we went to the moon man <laughs> we're going to Mars I think this is possible is it desirable do uh, we want and how this? how dangerous is it uh, oh. Of course, uh, how dangerous could it be? I mean, we already come together in groups of interests. This is a group of interests. It's not a religion. It's not a dogma. It's not a cage. It's not a prison. It's a free society. If we put technology as a cage to ourselves, we're doing something wrong. But I have no idea why we would do that. <laughs> Only, you, you've seen James Bond movies? There's always an evil guy. Sorry. An evil guy, one million, you know, why, why would you be that evil guy? <laughs> I'm not, I don't mean you, sir, I don't mean like that. I mean, what would one, anybody of us be? We want something else. If we make anything to our own prison, we are failing. So I urge you, again, be optimistic about the future, because that's the only way to create an optimistic future. Thank you. More questions? Uh, can, yeah. can I ask, can I ask? We cannot I'm see here. because of the light. I it's see, very I see hard the gentleman see. over there. I'm uh, here. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your lecture. So, uh, you mentioned that uh, the technologies will bring equality and equity one of, on one of your slides. So, my question is uh, can you please elaborate why do you think it, br it will bring equity and equality? Because, like, for example, yeah, uh, when the Industrial Revolution happened, it brought a, a huge gap between countries, between within one country, between populations. So, yeah, just a bit of elaboration on that point. Thank you. Um, I didn't say it will bring uh, equality and equality. I said it can bring equity and equality. I cannot predict the future, uh, unfortunately. But I can make and uh, uh, make up, imagine a future. And I think with the technologies we're seeing today, uh, again, uh, like blockchain, for example, it's very immature yet in that sense. It doesn't scale beautifully yet, but we see the potential of what's happening. And we can easily imagine a scale and a trust and a truth on, a, on, on, on different chains out there. And I'm thinking also of the NFTs as an emergent technology today. It, it's a record of work. It's a proof of work that we can share between each other. It means that what I do and who I am can be shown in its true uh, essence to others, which mean that what I am, you cannot be, and I can never be you. You, you know uh, this old saying, uh, don't try to be anybody else because they are already taken. <laughs> you can only be yourselves. But today, we try to compose ourselves in uniforms. You are an accountant. You are a doctor. You should be like this, and here's software for you. I think that is changing which means that we can be individuals and contribute individually and differently from each other. And when we start to appreciate our differences and include them, so diversity and inclusion, we start to treat each other differently because you can contribute in a way I cannot even imagine. So I must, I, am, I can't wait to see what you will do with it. So I must appreciate you, respect you and welcome you. And that creates e equity and, in, uh, uh, and uh, equality. So this is what, what I believe we should do. And I think technology can help us to get there. And as a last thing, uh, the steam machine created a lot of in inequalities. They were nothing compared to the inequalities we had before that. When a king could say, I kill you all because I just can. And so the world has progressively gone better. There's a great book called Factfulness by Hans Rosling, a Swedish scientist, uh, that talks about the statistics of, of well-being of humans. We live longer, we are healthier. We die of violence much less than any time in human history. It goes up and down, but it always goes up. Even if it feels down right now, and for me it does right now, <laughs> feel so-so, it is still up here compared to 100, 200, 5,000 years ago. We're going forward, and technology, and this, your questions, 
help us to understand how can we continue to go in a positive way. Although they still are problems, and they will always be problems, and there will be new problems you and I haven't even imagined, but there will be new opportunities you and I haven't imagined. And if we follow that trend and believe in the human ingenuity and optimism and curiosity and inclusion, I think we are on our good way. That's, that's how I think. Thank you. We have one more question, uh, the last one. Uh, okay. <laughs> can you hear? Yes. Uh, so my question is that uh, right now I'm uh, studying civil engineering, yes, uh, but will I uh, love it in the future? I don't know. Uh, it's this possibility that I will not like. So uh, people say that uh, it is easy to change your profession and the way of your life, but I'm quite anxious person. So what you can, uh, what kind of advice can you give? Wonderful question, <laughs> and oh, it's a tough question. <laughs> uh, so, for anxious people uh, who want to change their uh, way of life or profession, what you can advise? Hmm. Thank Come you for your question. Um, I, I cannot advise you specifically, I don't know you, I'm so sorry, uh, uh, yet. However, being anxious, I think, is very normal, uh, especially in uncertain times like now. Uh, however, uh, we know, uh, what is it, 70% of us uh, don't end up in the profession we, uh, you know, uh, started to educate ourselves into. I started to educate myself to construction engineer. And I'm, I'm not constructing any, uh, any, any, any buildings, I promise you, that would be a disaster. <laughs> uh, I played music for many years. I did photography, then I started to do design. I learned technology because I love design and music. Basically, music is a gadget sport. So is design, you buy a computer. I had no idea. And that felt very anxious to me. I was uh, really uh, pressed by the idea that I must become something and I must choose now when I'm you know, a teenager in my 20s. But the more I moved forward, every step I took, new opportunities emerged. That's what I meant with the growth mindset that, that I compared to the nomadic mindset. I don't know if that rang a bell with you, but for me, it was a beautiful saying uh, on this nomadic mindset. Every step you take shows you new platforms, new opportunities. And I think taking the steps, being boldly moving forward, a little bit at a time, even if you're anxious. When I was anxious, that helped me. And a new world emerge and do do connect to people ask this question to most people a uh, wonderful question to ask a very brave question to ask i think in in your age especially because you have a whole future you spend your rest of your life in that future you're creating it by just asking that question fear nothing Sorry. Thank you. The, you share this story, and you know it, it's decreasing our anxious as well. <laughs> Thank you. Спасибо. Можно последний вопрос? Извиняюсь. Можно последний вопрос? Мы закончили. Мы закончили. Простите, да. Давайте поблагодарим за потрясающую, восхитительную презентацию. Thank you very much for this amazing presentation. So it was a super, super inspiring uh, presentation. So I mean, and he's so charismatic. Oh my God! You know, he's like a. Like he had so much energy, so much charisma, and funny thing, other than, you know, being smart, he's so stylish. Have you seen his his dress? I mean, he's dressed up, man. He's like a rock star. It's a pretty amazing, as a matter of fact. I mean, he was like a host. I could easily switch places with him. I mean, wow, wow. But no, I'm not, I'm not giving away this mic easily. By the way, there will be some competition here. So, anyways, guys, uh, we need to move on, and of course, after. A round of applause yes a round of applause if you like it if you enjoy the day we're not there yet but uh, we need to move on so now uh, I will be there a surprise for you
three education institutions of Kazakhstan with a deep history is our Azov University. That is, here students and undergraduates acquire practical working skills. In other words, this is a mini copy of a large production and diary plant. Within the framework of the program of scholarship academic mobility and double degree education, the university cooperates with more than 170 foreign universities. 150 students a year study for the academic mobility at leading universities in the world. The digitalization process has affected all spheres of society, including education. At Awesaf University, innovations are intensively introduced into the education system and 3D, VR, STEM technologies are widely used. The IT Center provides consulting to teachers of schools in Shimkian on robotics, provides material resources to students in the laboratory of robotics and mechatronics at the laboratory of mathematical and 3D modeling and provides material resources of the IT Center to students and teachers of the Awesaf University. In Student Design Bureau, students and teachers prepare scientific projects for participation in regional, national and international competitions. Students of clubs and Student Design Bureau develop robotic systems for participation in competitions and competitions in robotics. The material and technical base of the university consists of 10 educational buildings of a modern standard, 6 student dormitories and 2 sports complexes. For the comprehensive development of students, more than 30 public, political and cultural organizations function. Awesaf University, that has united history and modernity today, prepares more than 27,000 students and invites to take your best. Sabah arasında fantamin özülüş şasa. Eksperiment şasa da özülüş boyu köngül götür. Şatlıq formulası Fanta Plus Eldenu. Dostların men oynağın sətlerin tarihta ağılat. Özülüş matematikası oğay. Elden bal, fantamin rahattan. Kane dimalatın kez geldi, fantamin elden bal. Sabah arasında fantamin elden bal. Köngül götür, kaytala. Olar jaylı film sürlemiz yok pa? Kitaptardağın emesi komikslerdegi kaharmandar katarından tabla mı? O'nun super kostümün bir varmanday mı? O'nun deyin sözleri kanatlı sözge aynala mı? Оларға бұның еш қайсысы маңызды емес. Мұнау сізге. Оларға әлемді сәлді болса жақсарту маңызды. Міне осындай адамдарға жұсан керек. Жұсан, қосымша сен үшін, мүмкіндіктер сен үшін. Сделай перерыв между занятиями с Фанта. Проведи эксперимент и развлекайся весь перерыв. Вот формула веселья. Фанта плюс перекусы. Ваши игры с друзьями войдут в историю. Математика перерыва проста. Получай удовольствие от Фанта и перекусов. Давай, уже пора передохнуть. Перекуси с Фанта. Перекуси с Фанта между занятиями. Повеселись, повтори. Им не важно, снимут про них фильм или нет. Станут ли они героями книг или хотя бы комиксов? Мечтает ли кто-то про его суперкостюм? И с какой вероятностью его давай, давай, давай. станет крылатой фразой? Им не важно. Это вам. Им важно делать мир немного лучше. Вот для кого нужен Жусан. Жусан. Приложение для тебя. Возможности для тебя. Second Sifolin Kazakhstan Technical University, the general partner of this event, is hosting this year's festival. For 65 years of its activity, Katu has trained more than 70,000 specialists, successfully working in all major sectors of the agrotechnical sphere. Among the ranks of our graduates are deputies of the Parliament of the Republic of Kazakhstan, heads of leading enterprises, nationally known public figures, and athletes. Today, our university is one of the leaders of the national higher education on the national rating of the demand for higher education institutions of Kazakhstan from the IAAR on the quality of educational programs. And also, Kata is the base university for digitalization of agricultural production in Kazakhstan. Our partners include more than 160 world-renowned leading research universities and research centers. Among them are the University of California at Davis, which is the second highest institution in the world of the agricultural industry, 
Agroparitech University in Europe, and many others. Today, Katu has started a dual diploma education in three specialties jointly with the University of Milan in Italy, which gives our graduates the opportunity to receive diplomas from two countries. Our university offers the opportunity to study at bachelor's, master's, and doctorate. Currently, the number of students exceeds 12,000, of whom 70% are studying under the state grants. There is a full opportunity to study in the military department. All necessary conditions are created for them to be qualified specialists. The university aims for a seamless experience in any format of education. For students, there is a printing office and a library equipped with an electronic system that has more than 1.5 million book collections. One of the large multidisciplinary education institutions of Kazakhstan with a deep history is Awazov University. That is, here students and undergraduates acquire practical working skills. In other words, this is a mini copy of a large production and diary plant. Within the framework of the program of scholarship academic mobility and double degree education, the university cooperates with more than 170 foreign universities. 150 students a year study for the academic mobility at leading universities in the world. The digitalization process has affected all spheres of society, including education. At Awesef University, innovations are intensively introduced into the education system and 3D, VR, STEM technologies are widely used. The IT Center provides consulting to teachers of schools in Shimkian on robotics, provides material resources to students in the laboratory of robotics and mechatronics at the laboratory of mathematical and 3D modeling and provides material resources of the IT Center to students and teachers of the Awazov University. In Student Design Bureau, students and teachers prepare scientific projects for participation in regional, national and international competitions. Students of clubs and Student Design Bureau develop robotic systems for participation in competitions and competitions in robotics. The material and technical base of the university consists of 10 educational buildings of a modern standard, 6 student dormitories and 2 sports complexes. For the comprehensive development of students, more than 30 public, political and cultural organizations function. Awesef University, that has united history and modernity today, prepares more than 27,000 students and invites to take your best. Sabah arasında fantamin özülüş şasa. Eksperimen şasa da özülüş boyu kongül götür. Şatlıq formulası Fanta Plus Eldenu. Dostların men oynağın sattların tarihta ağılat. Özülüş matematikası oğay. Eldenu al fantamin rahattan. Kane dimalatın kez geldi. Fantamin Eldenu al. Sabah arasında fantamin Eldenu al. Kongül götür. Qaytala. Olar jaylı film sürlemiz yok pa? Тептердаги немиси комикстердеги кахармандар катарынан таблама. Онын супер костюмын бриу армандайма. Онын деген сөздер канатты сөзге айналама. Оларға бұның еш қайсы маңызды емес. Мұнау сізге. Оларға әлемді сәлді болса жақсарту маңызды. Міне осындай адамдарға жусан керек. Жусан қосымша сен үшін, мүмкіндіктер сен үшін. Сделай перерыв между занятиями с Фанта. Проведи эксперимент и развлекайся весь перерыв. Вот формула веселья. Фанта плюс перекусы. Ваши игры с друзьями войдут в историю. Математика перерыва проста. Получай удовольствие от Фанта и перекусов. Давай, уже пора передохнуть. Перекуси с Фанта. Перекуси с Фанта между занятиями. Повеселись, повтори. Им не важно, снимут про них фильм или нет. Станут ли они героями книг или хотя бы комиксов? Мечтает ли кто-то про его суперкостюм? И с какой вероятностью его давай, давай, давай. станет крылатой фразой? Им не важно. Это вам. Им важно делать мир немного лучше. Вот для кого нужен Жусан. Жусан. Приложение для тебя. Возможности для тебя. 
Sakensi Folinka Zakar Technical University, the general partner of this event, is hosting this year's festival. For 65 years of its activity, Katu has trained more than 70,000 specialists, successfully working in all major sectors of the agrotechnical sphere. Among the ranks of our graduates are deputies of the Parliament of the Republic of Kazakhstan, heads of leading enterprises, nationally known public figures and athletes. Today, our university is one of the leaders of the national higher education on the national rating of the demand for higher education institutions of Kazakhstan from the IAAR on the quality of educational programs. And also, Kata is the base university for digitalization of agricultural production in Kazakhstan. Our partners include more than 160 world-renowned leading research universities and research centers. Among them are the University of California at Davis, which is the second highest institution in the world of the agricultural industry, Agroparitech University in Europe, and many others. Today, Katu has started a dual diploma education in three specialties jointly with the University of Milan in Italy, which gives our graduates the opportunity to receive diplomas from two countries. Our university offers the opportunity to study at bachelor's, master's, and doctorates. Currently, the number of students exceeds 12,000, of whom 70% are studying under the state grants. There is a full opportunity to study in the military department. All necessary conditions are created for them to be qualified specialists. The university aims for a seamless experience in any format of education. For students, there is a printing office and a library equipped with an electronic system that has more than 1.5 million book collections. One of the large multidisciplinary education institutions of Kazakhstan with a deep history is Awazov University. That is, here students and undergraduates acquire practical working skills. In other words, this is a mini copy of a large production and diary plant. Within the framework of the program of scholarship academic mobility and double degree education, the university cooperates with more than 170 foreign universities. 150 students a year study for the academic mobility at leading universities in the world. The digitalization process has affected all spheres of society, including education. At Awesef University, innovations are intensively introduced into the education system and 3D, VR, STEM technologies are widely used. The IT Center provides consulting to teachers of schools in Shimkian on robotics, provides material resources to students in the laboratory of robotics and mechatronics at the laboratory of Bessematical and 3D modeling and provides material resources of the IT Center to students and teachers of the Awesef University. In Student Design Bureau, students and teachers prepare scientific projects for participation in regional, national and international competitions. Students of clubs and Student Design Bureau develop robotic systems for participation in competitions and competitions in robotics. The material and technical base of the university consists of 10 educational buildings of a modern standard, 6 student dormitories and 2 sports complexes. For the comprehensive development of students, more than 30 public, political and cultural organizations function. A of university that has united history and modernity today prepares more than 27,000 students and invites to take your best. Сабақ арасында фантамен өзіліс жаса, эксперимент жаса да өзіліс бойы көңіл көтер. Шаттық формуласы Фанта Плюс Әлдену. Достарыңмен ойнаған сәттерің тарихта ғалат. Өзіліс математикасы оңай. Әлдені бал фантамен рахаттан. Қане демалатын кезгелді фантамен әлдені бал. Сабақ арасында фантамен әлдені бал. Көңіл көтер. Қайтала. Олар жәлі фильм түсірлемі жоқ ба? Тептердағы немесе комикстердегі қахармандар қатарынан табылама. Оның супер кәстюмін бірі армандайма. Оның деген сөздері қанатты сөзге айналама. Оларға бұның еш қайсы маңызды емес. Оларға әлемді сәлді болса жақсарту маңызды. Міне осында адамдарға жұсан керек. Жұсан қосымша сен үшін, мүмкіндіктер сен үшін. 
Сделай перерыв между занятиями с Фанта. Проведи эксперимент и развлекайся весь перерыв. Вот формула веселья. Фанта плюс перекусы. Ваши игры с друзьями войдут в историю. Математика перерыва проста. Получай удовольствие от Фанта и перекусов. Давай, уже пора передохнуть. Перекуси с Фанта. Перекуси с Фанта между занятиями. Повеселись, повтори. Им не важно, снимут про них фильм или нет. Станут ли они героями книг или хотя бы комиксов? Мечтает ли кто-то про его суперкостюм? И с какой вероятностью его давай, давай, давай. станет крылатой фразой? Им не важно. Это вам. Им важно делать мир немного лучше. Вот для кого нужен Жусан. Жусан. Приложение для тебя. Возможности для тебя. Sakian Sifolin Kazakavi Technical University, the general partner of this event, is hosting this year's festival. For 65 years of its activity, Kaktu has trained more than 70,000 specialists, successfully working in all major sectors of the agrotechnical sphere. Among the ranks of our graduates are deputies of the Parliament of the Republic of Kazakhstan, heads of leading enterprises, nationally known public figures and athletes. Today our university is one of the leaders of the national higher education on the national rating of the demand for higher education institutions of Kazakhstan from the IAAR on the quality of educational programs. And also Kato is the base university for digitalization of agricultural production in Kazakhstan. Our partners include more than 160 world-renowned leading research universities and research centers. Among them are the University of California at Davis, which is the second highest institution in the world of the agricultural industry, Agroparitech University in Europe, and many others. Today, Kato has started a dual diploma education in three specialties, jointly with the University of Milan in Italy, which gives our graduates the opportunity to receive diplomas from two countries. Our university offers the opportunity to study at bachelor's, master's, and doctorates. Currently, the number of students exceeds 12,000 of whom 70% are studying under the state grants. There is a full opportunity to study in the military department. All necessary conditions are created for them to be qualified specialists. The university aims for a seamless experience in any format of education. For students, there is a printing office and a library equipped with an electronic system that has more than 1.5 million book collections. One of the large multidisciplinary education institutions of Kazakhstan with a deep history is Aweza University. That is, here students and undergraduates acquire practical working skills. In other words, this is a mini copy of a large production and diary plant. Within the framework of the program of scholarship academic mobility and double degree education, the university cooperates with more than 170 foreign universities. 150 students a year study for the academic mobility at leading universities in the world. The digitalization process has affected all spheres of society, including education. At Awesef University, innovations are intensively introduced into the education system and 3D, VR, STEM technologies are widely used. The IT Center provides consulting to teachers of schools in Shimkan on robotics, provides material resources to students in the laboratory of robotics and mechatronics at the laboratory of mathematical and 3D modeling and provides material resources of the IT Center to students and teachers of the Awesef University. In Student Design Bureau, students and teachers prepare scientific projects for participation in regional, national and international competitions. Students of clubs and Student Design Bureau develop robotic systems for participation in competitions and competitions in robotics. The material and technical base of the university consists of 10 educational buildings of a modern standard, six student dormitories and two sports complexes. For the comprehensive development of students, more than 30 public, political and cultural organizations function. Awesef University, that has united history and modernity today, prepares more than 27,000 students and invites to take your best. In all major sectors of the agrotechnical sphere, 
Among the ranks of our graduates are deputies of the Parliament of the Republic of Kazakhstan, heads of leading enterprises, nationally known public figures, and athletes. Today, our university is one of the leaders of the national higher education on the national rating of the demand for higher education institutions of Kazakhstan, from the IAAR on the quality of educational programs. And also, Kato is the base university for digitalization of agricultural production in Kazakhstan. Our partners include more than 160 world-renowned leading research universities and research centers. Among them are the University of California at Davis, which is the second highest institution in the world of the agricultural industry, Agroparitech University in Europe, and many others. Today, Kato has started a dual diploma education in three specialties, jointly with the University of Milan in Italy, which gives our graduates the opportunity to receive diplomas from two countries. Our university offers the opportunity to study at bachelor's, master's, and doctorates. Currently, the number of students exceeds 12,000, of whom 70% are studying under the state grants. There is a full opportunity to study in the military department. All necessary conditions are created for them to be qualified specialists. The university aims for a seamless experience in any format of education. For students, there is a printing office and a library equipped with an electronic system that has more than 1.5 million book collections. One of the large multidisciplinary education institutions of Kazakhstan with a deep history is Awazov University. That is, here students and undergraduates acquire practical working skills. In other words, this is a mini copy of a large production and diary plant. Within the framework of the program of scholarship academic mobility and double degree education, the university cooperates with more than 170 foreign universities. 150 students a year study for the academic mobility at leading universities in the world. The digitalization process has affected all spheres of society, including education. At Awesef University, innovations are intensively introduced into the education system and 3D, VR, STEM technologies are widely used. The IT Center provides consulting to teachers of schools in Shimkian on robotics, provides material resources to students in the laboratory of robotics and mechatronics at the laboratory of mathematical and 3D modeling and provides material resources of the IT Center to students and teachers of the Awesef University. In Student Design Bureau, students and teachers prepare scientific projects for participation in regional, national and international competitions. Students of clubs and Student Design Bureau develop robotic systems for participation in competitions and competitions in robotics. The material and technical base of the university consists of 10 educational buildings of a modern standard, 6 student dormitories and 2 sports complexes. For the comprehensive development of students, more than 30 public, political and cultural organizations function. A of University that has united history and modernity today prepares more than 27,000 students and invites to take your best. Сабақ арасында фантамен өзіліс жаса, эксперимент жаса да өзіліс бойы көңіл көтер. Шаттық формуласы Фанта Плюс Әлдену. Достарыңмен ойнаған сәттерің тарихта қалат. Өзіліс математикасы оңай. Әлдені бал фантамен рахаттан. Қане демалатын кез келді фантамен әлдені бал. Сабақ арасында фантамен әлдені бал. Көңіл көтер. Қайтала. Олар жәлі фильм түсірлемі жоқ ба? Тептердаға немесе комикстердегі қахармандар қатарынан табылама. Оның супер кәстюмін бірі армандайма. Оның деген сөздері қанатты сөзге айналама. Оларға бұның еш қайсы маңызды емес. Оларға әлемді сәлді болса жақсарту маңызды. Міне осындай адамдарға жұсан керек. Жұсан қосымша сен үшін, мүмкіндіктер сен үшін. Сделай перерыв между занятиями с Фанта. Проведи эксперимент и развлекайся весь перерыв. Вот формула веселья. Фанта плюс перекусы. Ваши игры с друзьями войдут в историю. Математика перерыва проста. Получай удовольствие от Фанта и перекусов. Давай, уже пора передохнуть. Перекуси с Фанта.
Перекуси с фанта между занятиями. Повеселись, повтори. Им не важно, снимут про них фильм или нет. Станут ли они героями книг или хотя бы комиксов? Мечтает ли кто-то про его суперкостюм? И с какой вероятностью его давай, давай, давай. станет крылатой фразой? Им не важно. Это вам. Им важно делать мир немного лучше. Вот для кого нужен Жусан. Жусан. Приложение для тебя. Возможности для тебя. Sakensi Falling Kazakhstan Technical University, the general partner of this event, is hosting this year's festival. For 65 years of its activity, Katu has trained more than 70,000 specialists, successfully working in all major sectors of the agrotechnical sphere. Among the ranks of our graduates are deputies of the Parliament of the Republic of Kazakhstan, heads of leading enterprises, nationally known public figures, and athletes. Today, our university is one of the leaders of the national higher education on the national rating of the demand for higher education institutions of Kazakhstan, from the IAAR on the quality of educational programs. And also, Kato is the base university for digitalization of agricultural production in Kazakhstan. Our partners include more than 160 world-renowned leading research universities and research centers. Among them are the University of California at Davis, which is the second highest institution in the world of the agricultural industry, Agroparitec University in Europe, and many others. Today, Katu has started a dual diploma education in three specialties, jointly with the University of Milan in Italy, which gives our graduates the opportunity to receive diplomas from two countries. Our university offers the opportunity to study at bachelor's, master's, and doctorates. Currently, the number of students exceeds 12,000 of whom 70% are studying under the state grants. There is a full opportunity to study in the military department. All necessary conditions are created for them to be qualified specialists. The university aims for a seamless experience in any format of education. For students, there is a printing office and a library equipped with an electronic system that has more than 1.5 million book collections. One of the large multidisciplinary education institutions of Kazakhstan with a deep history is Awazov University. That is, here students and undergraduates acquire practical working skills. In other words, this is a mini copy of a large production and diary plant. Within the framework of the program of scholarship academic mobility and double degree education, the university cooperates with more than 170 foreign universities. 150 students a year study for the academic mobility at leading universities in the world. The digitalization process has affected all spheres of society, including education. At Awesaf University, innovations are intensively introduced into the education system and 3D, VR, STEM technologies are widely used. The IT Center provides consulting to teachers of schools in Shimkian on robotics, provides material resources to students in the laboratory of robotics and mechatronics at the laboratory of mathematical and 3D modeling and provides material resources of the IT center to students and teachers of the Awesaf University. In Student Design Bureau, students and teachers prepare scientific projects for participation in regional, national and international competitions. Students of clubs and Student Design Bureau develop robotic systems for participation in competitions and competitions in robotics. The material and technical base of the university consists of 10 educational buildings of a modern standard, 6 student dormitories and 2 sports complexes. For the comprehensive development of students, more than 30 public, political and cultural organizations function. A of University that has united history and modernity today prepares more than 27,000 students and invites to take your best. Сабақ арасында фантамен өзіліс жаса. Эксперимент жаса да өзіліс бойы көңіл көтер. Шаттық формуласы Фанта плюс әлдену. Достарың мен ойнаған сәттерің тарихта ғалат. Өзіліс математикасы оңай. Әлдені бал фантамен рахаттан. Қане демалатын кез келді фантамен әлдені бал. Сабақ арасында фантамен әлдені бал. Көңіл көтер. Қайтала. Олар жайлы фильм түсірлеміз жоқ па? 
Китаптардағы немесе комикстердегі қахармандар қатарынан табылама. Оның супер костюмын бір армандайма. Оның деген сөздері қанатты сөзге айналама. Оларға бұның еш қайсысы маңызды емес. Мұнау сізге. Оларға әлемді сәлді болса жақсарту маңызды. Міне осында адамдарға жұсан керек. Жұсан қосымша сен үшін, мүмкіндіктер сен үшін. Сделай перерыв между занятиями с Фанта. Проведи эксперимент и развлекайся весь перерыв. Вот формула веселья. Фанта плюс перекусы. Ваши игры с друзьями войдут в историю. Математика перерыва проста. Получай удовольствие от Фанта и перекусов. Давай, уже пора передохнуть. Перекуси с Фанта. Перекуси с Фанта между занятиями. Повеселись, повтори. Им не важно, снимут про них фильм или нет. Станут ли они героями книг или хотя бы комиксов? Мечтает ли кто-то про его суперкостюм? И с какой вероятностью его давай, давай, давай. станет крылатой фразой? Им не важно. Это вам. Им важно делать мир немного лучше. Вот для кого нужен Жусан. Жусан. Приложение для тебя. Возможности для тебя. Sakensi Folin Kazakaru Technical University, the general partner of this event, is hosting this year's festival. For 65 years of its activity, Katu has trained more than 70,000 specialists, successfully working in all major sectors of the agrotechnical sphere. Among the ranks of our graduates are deputies of the Parliament of the Republic of Kazakhstan, heads of leading enterprises, nationally known public figures and athletes. Today our university is one of the leaders of the national higher education on the national rating of the demand for higher education institutions of Kazakhstan from the IAAR on the quality of educational programs. And also Kato is the base university for digitalization of agricultural production in Kazakhstan. Our partners include more than 160 world-renowned leading research universities and research centers. Among them are the University of California at Davis, which is the second highest institution in the world of the agricultural industry, Agroparitech University in Europe, and many others. Today, Katu has started a dual diploma education in three specialties jointly with the University of Milan in Italy, which gives our graduates the opportunity to receive diplomas from two countries. Our university offers the opportunity to study at bachelor's, master's, and doctorates. Currently, the number of students exceeds 12,000 of whom 70% are studying under the state grants. There is a full opportunity to study in the military department. All necessary conditions are created for them to be qualified specialists. The university aims for a seamless experience in any format of education. For students, there is a printing office and a library equipped with an electronic system that has more than 1.5 million book collections. One of the large multidisciplinary education institutions of Kazakhstan with a deep history is Awazov University. That is, here students and undergraduates acquire practical working skills. In other words, this is a mini copy of a large production and diary plant. Within the framework of the program of scholarship academic mobility and double degree education, the university cooperates with more than 170 foreign universities. 150 students a year study for the academic mobility at leading universities in the world. The digitalization process has affected all spheres of society, including education. At Awesaf University, innovations are intensively introduced into the education system and 3D, VR, STEM technologies are widely used. The IT center provides consulting to teachers of schools in Shimkian on robotics, provides material resources to students in the laboratory of robotics and mechatronics at the laboratory of Bessematical and 3D modeling and provides material resources of the IT center to students and teachers of the Awesaf University. In Student Design Bureau, students and teachers prepare scientific projects for participation in regional, national and international competitions. Students of clubs and Student Design Bureau develop robotic systems for participation in competitions and competitions in robotics. The material and technical base of the university consists of 10 educational buildings of a modern standard, 6 student dormitories and 2 sports complexes. 
For the comprehensive development of students, more than 30 public, political and cultural organizations function. A of University that has united history and modernity today prepares more than 27,000 students and invites to take your best. Сабақ арасында фантамен өзіліс жаса. Эксперимент жасады, өзіліс бойы көңіл көтер. Шаттық формуласы, фанта плюс әлдену. Достарың мен ойнаған сәттерің тарихта ғылат. Өзіліс математикасы оңай. Әлдені бал, фантамен рахаттан. Қане, демалатын кез келді, фантамен әлдені бал. Сабақ арасында фантамен әлдені бал. Көңіл көтер, қайтала. Олар жәлі фильм түсірлемі жоқ ба? Таптардағы немесе комикстердегі қахармандар қатарынан табылама. Оның супер кәстемін бірі армандайма. Оның деген сөздері қанатты сөзге айналама. Оларға бұның еш қайсы маңызды емес. Оларға әлемді сәлді болса жақсарту маңызды. Міне осында адамдарға жұсан керек. Жұсан қосымша сен үшін, мүмкіндіктер сен үшін. Делай перерыв между занятиями с Фанта. Проведи эксперимент и развлекайся весь перерыв. Вот формула веселья. Фанта плюс перекусы. Ваши игры с друзьями войдут в историю. Математика перерыва проста. Получай удовольствие от Фанта и перекусов. Давай, уже пора передохнуть. Перекуси с Фанта. Перекуси с Фанта между занятиями. Повеселись, повтори. Им не важно, снимут про них фильм или нет. Станут ли они героями книг или хотя бы комиксов? Мечтает ли кто-то про его суперкостюм? И с какой вероятностью его давай, давай, давай. станет крылатой фразой? Им не важно. Это вам. Им важно делать мир немного лучше. Вот для кого нужен Жусан. Жусан. Приложение для тебя. Возможности для тебя. Second Sifolin Kazakari Technical University, the general partner of this event, is hosting this year's festival. For 65 years of its activity, Kaktu has trained more than 70,000 specialists, successfully working in all major sectors of the agrotechnical sphere. Among the ranks of our graduates are deputies of the Parliament of the Republic of Kazakhstan, heads of leading enterprises, nationally known public figures and athletes. Today, our university is one of the leaders of the national higher education on the national rating of the demand for higher education institutions of Kazakhstan, from the IAAR on the quality of educational programs. And also, Kato is the base university for digitalization of agricultural production in Kazakhstan. Our partners include more than 160 world-renowned leading research universities and research centers. Among them are the University of California at Davis, which is the second highest institution in the world of the agricultural industry, Agroparitech University in Europe, and many others. Today, Katu has started a dual diploma education in three specialties, jointly with the University of Milan in Italy, which gives our graduates the opportunity to receive diplomas from two countries. Our university offers the opportunity to study at bachelor's, master's, and doctorates. Currently, the number of students exceeds 12,000 of whom 70% are studying under the state grants. There is a full opportunity to study in the military department. All necessary conditions are created for them to be qualified specialists. The university aims for a seamless experience in any format of education. For students, there is a printing office and a library equipped with an electronic system that has more than 1.5 million book collections. One of the large multidisciplinary education institutions of Kazakhstan with a deep history is Awazov University. That is, here students and undergraduates acquire practical working skills. In other words, this is a mini copy of a large production and diary plant. Within the framework of the program of scholarship academic mobility and double degree education, the university cooperates with more than 170 foreign universities. 150 students a year study for the academic mobility at leading universities in the world. The digitalization process has affected all spheres of society, including education. At Awesaf University, innovations are intensively introduced into the education.
Hello, uh, we are starting a new session, session now through a new lens, it is called. Uh, and the main question of this uh, session is how the change in the way that we look uh, at facts and, um, and information uh, reveals a new understanding of reality. In other words, um, we are living in, um, in, the, in the age of information processing, and uh, uh, what is the implication of that? on the way that we uh, understand uh, the way we live, um, uh, the world we live in, we, the way we understand ourselves. Uh, the first part of the session will be uh, my reflections, uh, phenomenological reflections uh, and reflections in cognitive psychology. Uh, I'm interested in um, implications of the new changes uh, on, on our psychology actually. The second part, uh, in the second part, uh, Bernardo uh, Castro will join us. Uh, he's a scientist and a philosopher, and he will uh, share his view uh, with us. Uh, and perhaps we will have some time for uh, discussion, questions, answers. Um, so let's get started. Um, what's new in our age? What is unique in our age? Uh, is it so unique, really? Um, the thing is that within this question, there is a newborn, at least historically talking, a newborn um, on a table uh, to, to focus on, and that's artificial intelligence. Um, it is for the first time uh, that um, um, a cognitive content, uh, a content uh, that comes from reasoning is generated by something other than human being. Uh, in other words, a thought is generated uh, by uh, something that is not human being itself, not human brain. Uh, this has never uh, happened before. Um, we know that um, back uh, 200 uh, or more years ago, uh, we um, mechanized um, production processes. It's called the Industrial Revolution. Um, and um, the, the, the process is started to be uh, far more effective because it's not handmade anymore, rather uh, done with machines in a more efficient way. I mean, step by step, it started to be more, more and more efficient. Um, but the thought was human thought. Human, humans uh, humans uh, did the thought. Uh, humans uh, designed the machines, um, set tasks for the machines, uh, what exactly they're going to create. Um, but the machines did not create thought itself or the content of the thought. The, the reasoning was not done by machines. Uh, but now it's different. Uh, we created computers that are able to generate in some way, mathematical way, um, something that we call it uh, or we refer to it as a, as, as a, as a thought, as a content of, of our reasoning. Um, so the question here is, uh, what are the implications of this, uh, uh, of this new development uh, in the way that we see the world, in the way that we see ourselves, uh, and the way that we conduct within that, that world? More than that, what are the opportunities that we can uh, prog uh, prognosticate and um, actively cultivate with that tool now? Because it's a really unique tool. Um, I will start. <clears throat> um, uh, I will start first. First of all, with um, uh, with an explanation that actually this process has started before. Uh, this process is called um, uh, information processing, and um, the, the way that we see human consciousness working uh, is that uh, human mind. Um, sees uh, information, processes information, and creates a new information. Uh, the best model for that, for creating that information is a mathematical model or the validity, the best validity for that, math for, for that process is mathematical process itself. So there are schemes that we cre create, modeling that we create, uh, and, then, uh, and then we ourselves process uh, that information in, in a mathematical way. 
So uh, the process has begun much uh, earlier, actually. It is that now the computers can take uh, and conduct the, the operations uh, partly by algorithms, partly by automatization uh, by themselves. This is a more advanced uh, artificial intelligence now. Um, and, um, uh, and, and the question is, uh, does it really reflect the way that human, uh, human mind uh, operates? Or is this the only way that human mind operates, actually? Um, computer, uh, computers instantiate uh, a thought, or what we call, or what we consider this as a thought. Uh, then, uh, then it tries to mimic our um, reasoning, perhaps tries to understand or um, reflect our behavior, tries to uh, predict our behavior. Um, and in that way, we create what, is, uh, what I consider as, as anthropomorphizing artificial intelligence. So our artificial intelligence becomes human-like in a sense. Um, that's an interesting development that enhances, augmentizes our reality. So the way that our reality works now is in conjunction with, uh, with artificial intelligence itself. Um, that means basically that we have something new, not a human being, something new that works with us uh, and with our reasoning, so the, the domain that belongs only to us. Only that the, that reasoning now is uh, uh, purely mathematical, so so to speak. Uh, it reflects only the mathematical part of uh, of uh, human cognition, of human understanding. Uh, artificial intelligence is assimilated into our habitat, into our uh, way of living. It is assimilated by communication. We communicate through phones. We communicate. Uh, uh, we, we we start to have uh, assisting assisting driving, which is basically an artificial intelligence. Um, and and uh, step by step, uh, one of the things that we uh, happens here is that we delegate some of the reasoning that uh, normally we conduct, we delegate it to artificial intelligence. So now artificial intelligence conducts that reasoning uh, and gives us the output that, uh, or decision-making that we accept it um, explicitly or implicitly, uh, but we do accept it, uh, that, 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 that thing. Uh, so in a sense, artificial intelligence starts to predominate our uh, reasoning and decision-making in uh, many different fields. Now, from one hand, it's a very good thing because uh, many calculations um, that a uh, human being conducts are quite mechanical, mathematically talking. Uh, and sometimes it is good that artificial intelligence, computer, uh, can do it faster and more accurately. Um, so uh, there is a uh, there is a, a positive point to it, but from the other hand, there are things that a human being does or does uh, or, or makes uh, decisions uh, not necessarily in a mathematical way. Uh, decisions that are made uh, through whims, desires, uh, through most importantly through creative uh, through creative um, act, uh, we create something uh, in a way that is not necessarily an information processing. Actually, we create something. Sometimes, especially, we don't have information to process, and then we fill the gap in a creative way. So, basically, uh, the, the the main thing that we are dealing with right now is delegation of reasoning and decision making uh, to artificial intelligence. It's a convenient thing, but uh, from the other hand, uh, it raises a few questions. But generally, there is a hype and misconception about, um, about artificial intelligence. Um, from one hand, we are very enthusiastic about artificial intelligence, uh, and uh, the enthusiasm is very similar to, um, to the way that sometimes uh, uh, if, uh, if I buy a new car, which is a very nice car to drive, very um, exciting or enjoyable car, car to drive sometimes uh, uh, we may drive or i may drive that car a little longer than it is necessary just to enjoy uh, the driving itself it's like a new uh, sometimes it's like a new toy that uh, we uh, we indulge uh, playing with or trying to exhaust its possibilities um artificial intelligence in that way i mean the enthusiasm for artificial intelligence in a sense is very similar to that too it's, it's interesting what artificial intelligence um, can
can uh, can um, the way that artificial intelligence can enhance is our um, our uh, habitat, our way of living. From the other hand, we have uh, some intimidating um, perspective uh, about artificial intelligence because if artificial intelligence decides, makes decisions about uh, human conduct, uh, um, then uh, we may start asking questions about responsibility, accountability, uh, about our um, participation in those decisions, how, how well we can participate in those decisions once they are calculated and presented to us. Uh, what is what will be our input therefore um, so the high mis, uh, misconception about artificial intelligence is is uh, understandable uh, both from enthusiastic point of view and from the point of view of intimidation what this uh, what this new artificial intelligence creates will it create for instance there is a, a very uh, there is a very common question will it create robots that overtake uh, human beings uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it's stretching the idea a little too far, but still the, 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 uh, the, question, the question is uh, uh, posing itself um, that artificial intelligence in a way takes control, whether explicitly or, in, uh, um, explicitly or in, uh, implicitly, or uh, it takes control in a way that um, maybe uh, we don't necessarily uh, understand um over our decisions we gave that option of taking them because we accept those uh decisions uh, we we take them as uh, as acceptable um now the thing is that in my opinion this is uh, in at least in a cognitive sense uh in a psychologic sense um i think that this is not the um most important question very important questions, but not the most important question. The most important question, in my opinion, is the way that we assimilate with artificial intelligence. Not as artificial intelligence assimilated with us, with our habitat, which it does, because we already we already have um, um, almost everything we are doing, from economics to uh, to uh, entertainment, we are doing through artificial intelligence in a way. But the question is how we are assimilated into the domains of reasoning of artificial intelligence. Uh, if we value, um, in an ethical sense at least, uh, if we value the way of reasoning and the way of decision making that is made by artificial intelligence, then uh, we start to uh, limit ourselves into the narrow domains of artificial intelligence. So for instance, if we, uh, uh, if we preserve uh, uh, if we if we understand only mathematically uh, um, what is uh, uh, what is decided by the program that uh, by the program that uh, uh, conducts uh, the decision making, uh, then uh, then where is our creativity? Where is uh, where are our, our humanistic qualities? Uh, the creative fertility uh, and how we can integrate it into into that domain. Uh, the domain is definitely uh, artificial intelligence may want to mimic or uh, the programmers may want to mimic something of uh, creative reasoning that human beings uh, conduct. Mm, but the, uh, the basics uh, of human creativity uh, uh, are not there uh, because artificial intelligence processes information, uh, information rather than create something new in the gap uh, that is created in, in the explanatory gap that is created. If something cannot be explained, then human being creates an hypothesis. Um, but artificial intelligence does not create the hypothesis, it just processes information. Uh, so um, the, the, the other thing about, uh, about this process, assimilation with artificial intelligence, our assimilation with artificial intelligence, is that uh, through that process, we start to mute or evaporate the creative spirit that we have. Because if everything is, is if uh, everything is decided for us uh, already by the inputs we may give or by the way that artificial intelligence uh, intelligent programs learn our uh, behavior, then um, then uh, what is uh, what we are doing then? Are we only indulging in the decision makings that are already made? Um, so these questions 
so these questions are um, uh, questions that are related to assimilation uh, with artificial intelligence, mainly of our assimilation uh, with the reasoning uh, that is predominant with artificial intelligence. Uh, the next thing is uh, uh, the question about reality. Uh, how the uh, way we see data changes our perception of reality or, or our understanding of reality. Um, the first thing is to ask, what is reality? Um, now, philosophically, it's a very uh, uh, diverse question, and uh, obviously I cannot get into this question uh, in, in full scope, but let's, by common sense, this, um, uh, define uh, reality in the following way. Uh, reality is, it's, uh, in a way, it is our confrontation uh, with something outside our mind uh, from one hand, but from the other hand, uh, our signification of what we see. So when we see something, it fascinates us. Um, it fascinates us. We start to signify it. Uh, we start to uh, give it uh, symbols. That's the meaning of signification in a sense. Uh, we start to uh, create uh, arts um, around it, narratives and norms around it. Um, again, we signify it in a way that means that it becomes significant to us. So uh, we see the reality, although independent of our brain, of our mind, nevertheless, it is significated by us. It is significated by us by, uh, by being within the midst of that reality. So by standing in the midst of, the, of that reality. Now we're standing in the midst of the reality, not just by information processing, but by the whole body and by the whole mind. Um, we have senses, uh, we have uh, whims, desires, uh, emotions, uh, and the oneness of the whole experience of reality is um, quite complex. Um, so reality is not just information in that sense. Reality is uh, the whole experience that we have uh, mainly in two diverse ways. Uh, we tend to say that it is independent of our mind. Uh, the main thing is to distinguish our uh, imagination, uh, uh, free imagination, fantasy from what is real and what is not. Not everything we imagine is actually real uh, from one hand. From the other hand, whatever we see and it is important to us, it fascinates us or we need to deal with it. Uh, there is a problem that we need to solve, existential problem uh, or um, productive problem. Uh, then we start to signify it. It becomes significant to us. We appropriate it to ourselves. Um, so in that sense, um, reality has two uh, um, uh, two diverse uh, um, uh, realms uh, in, a, in our mind. Uh, but now with artificial intelligence, uh, we create um, a new contact line, contact line with reality. The contact line is that reality now is represented by what artificial intelligence um, signifies for us and the way that artificial intelligence makes decisions for us. In a way, actually, uh, we may feel even, because sometimes it does uh, pretty well by uh, describing what we feel or what we may want. Um, just for example, when you're looking for a ticket, uh, sorry, when you're looking for a, for a country, um, very soon uh, a ticket uh, will show up in your feet uh, or a deal for a ticket will show up in your feet. That's a process of artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence in Google, for instance, or Facebook, just an example, um, recognizes that we may want to go to some country because we are looking information about that country uh, and it suggests us uh, consume some products about this country like tickets for instance or uh, any other products re relevant to that country. Uh, and at that moment we feel like artificial intelligence becomes a little bit anthropomorphized in the sense that it becomes like human because it uh, correlates uh, to us uh, in a, a human way, almost, almost as a human being. Um, so the contact line that we created now, the, co like, uh, the contact line that with reality that we have now is synthet synthesized with artificial intelligence. Uh, so this is another process, very important process that we are undergoing. Uh, 
the 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 idea here is that uh, is that synthesizing the uh, the reality alienates us from two main things. Uh, first of all, uh, it alienates us from nature itself. Uh, we are not in the midst of nature. We are not deciding things within the midst of the nature itself. Um, we are deciding, or something decides for us. Uh, in a representative way of what we may want or, or may not want, or uh, the way we may want to conduct uh, um, in reality, um, in a synthesized way. So this is one thing. The other thing is that our cognition also changes um, in a way that the aspects of our cognition that uh, that are activated uh, by being um, uh, by being in this diversity of reality. That is independently thinking that uh, something really is independent from the other, from one hand, from, from the other hand, thinking that we signify uh, what is uh, what is important to us uh, in reality. That process uh, starts to be muted, evaporated. So that may have implications on our um, on our cognition as well. Um, in what way our cognition um, will change? Uh, because uh, uh, one of the main aspects of our function is, uh, uh, is uh, muted. Um, I will take an example of, uh, it's not all bad news in a way, I will take an example of outdoor activity. Uh, we live, uh, and it is very analogous to what, we, what, what, is going, what is going on with artificial intelligence these days, I suppose. Uh, we don't know for sure what it means, uh, what are the future implications, especially in, in, in a distant future, uh, but uh, we already know that uh, a, re a reaction, a control reaction is created when we uh, stop, uh, stop um, uh, conducting ourselves in a, a natural way. For example, we, are, we, are, uh, we have set of life, uh, uh, most of us uh, these days, we are protected in buildings, um, we are protecting from nature, um, um, if it's cold outside, we can turn on heat. If it's uh, if it's uh, hot outside, we can uh, turn air conditioning, and feel comfortable about it. So we are creating uh, a sort of in framing around us, a sort of bubble that we feel comfortable about. Um, we sit a lot. Uh, we don't move enough. Uh, we don't move the way that our biology biological design uh, supposed uh, supposed to be um, perhaps we don't know for sure what is our biological design or how it's supposed to be or what is best for it uh, moving too much is also not the best thing it uh, exhausts uh, the body from one hand from the other hand uh, not moving uh, uh, not moving um, at all or moving uh, just a little bit uh, the way that we move uh, when sitting working and learning is also not a good thing because we not regenerate uh, ourselves our, our energy is not regenerated um, one of the ways that we overcome as a reaction is um, outdoor activity um, in recent years in in, in 50 years uh, or so especially we have more and more uh, enthusiasm about our outdoor activities. It can be sports, it can be uh, hiking, it can be a little bit more serious uh, competitive sports that some starts to uh, indulge in. Uh, but we definitely want to react to that situation of sitting too much and not moving enough the way that our biology uh, supposed to be uh, most likely. Um, this reaction, I suppose, will happen or perhaps even happens already now in a sense of, uh, in the context of artificial intelligence. Um, I think more and more we start to think about our creativity uh, or how proactively we can cultivate our creative uh, reasoning because mathematical reasoning itself uh, is already um, done pretty well by mathematics. I, I will not say that mathematics is created by artificial intelligence, definitely no, we created mathematics. It's a language that a uh, human being come, comes up with uh, and hopes that it does reflect something in the universe. Uh, but, uh, but it is, uh, uh, the, but, but the application of, uh, of mathematics is well done uh, by artificial intelligence, um, especially the technical part of it. 
Um, but can we cultivate, and the question is, can we cultivate, is it, is it an opportunity to cultivate our creative reasoning now uh, when, we, when our reality is enhanced uh, by um, very, very well calculated uh, decision makings uh, through artificial intelligence? Um, I'll give an example. Um, we can calculate uh, numbers uh, with, with a calculator. Um, very nice thing, especially if it's in advanced mathematics. If we're learning advanced mathematics, for instance, um, I'm not sure um, students or, uh, or even uh, um, uh, uh, fractionists of mathematics will want to calculate everything manually. We have a calculator to calculate numbers, especially more complicated uh, calculations. Um, we are more responsible for analysis, for, uh, for uh, reasoning behind mathematics, for insightfulness into mathematics. Uh, however, uh, ignoring numerical reasoning as a skill is something that does not help, uh, help us understand mathematics, um, even when we don't really necessarily want to calculate ourselves. Um, so more advanced mathematics can be understood only after we understand numbers, even if we don't calculate them each and every time ourselves. At some point, uh, in more, when we are more advanced, we may want to do it uh, with a calculator. Uh, how are we gonna activate uh, those creative, um, those, those aspects of creative reasoning in human being? Um, I think this is uh, one of the most uh, interesting questions, and I see it uh, neither as a, um, uh, no, neither as an uh, enthusiasm or an uh, intimidation that we presented ar ar around the hype and um, misconception of artificial intelligence. Actually, I see it as an opportunity that uh, perhaps uh, in, uh, in, in our generation, maybe in next generation, we may be able to post questions that are interesting, uh, that, are, uh, that, that interest us a lot. What is human consciousness? Uh, what is uh, human cognition? We still have a lot of questions about it. Uh, we have questions in physics that artificial intelligence may um, enhance our understanding. Um, but it, it, it can only happen if we understand that besides the domains that conform artificial intelligence, we have, another, we have other domains, creativity, human creativity. And the uniqueness of human creativity is not information processing, rather, uh, the ability to create um, something new within the gap of what fascinates us and complete comprehension of that thing. We create, uh, we create something new, some, perhaps a language, a new language that we uh, describe it with. Mathematics is the best example, probably. Um, perhaps a new paradigm uh, that describes better uh, some of the processes um, and it is very, uh, uh, very likely that artificial intelligence will give us an opportunity to concentrate on that creativity rather than being completely assimilated into the narrow domains of mathematization, uh, of decision making and so forth. Uh, but it's a proactive uh, step. We need to decide that we're doing it. We need to decide that we, uh, we want uh, to cultivate creativity, we want to educate for creativity. Um, that we want to exercise creativity, we want to um, dare and try uh, things that are creative and not necessarily calculatable um, uh, in, in the way that artificial intelligence does it. Um, so with that said, uh, I would like uh, to invite uh, Mr. Uh, Bernardo Castro to our conversation. Mr. Bernardo Castro, hello. Hello. Uh, can you share with us, please, your view about, uh, about the uh, new lens that we are looking through uh, in, uh, towards the reality? What is the Good. new way that we can see reality with the development um, of, uh, uh, of our new tools, uh, so to say? I think it's much more about our way of seeing than the particular tools uh, we use. Um, let me share my, my screen with you so you can yes, see please. my presentation. Uh, I need to be authorized to share my screen. Can somebody make me a co-host? 
please, uh, can Mr. Uh, can Mr. Bernard become a host so he can share the screen? It's Kazakhstan. Should be. Mr. Bernard, you are now. Yes, I can share my screen now. Yes. All right. I hope you can now see it. So I will talk about mostly a, a new way of seeing reality uh, with a different set of hidden, unexamined assumptions about what reality is supposed to be or not supposed to be, and how this new way of seeing helps us solve many of the apparent contradictions we face today in both science uh, and philosophy. And I want to allude first to previous points in history where a different way of seeing, a different way of regarding the empirical data of existence has led to tremendous breakthroughs. And uh, that started out in the early 19th century, in this specific case I'm mentioning, with, oh, sorry for that, with James Maxwell that you see here, uh, who came up with the idea of electromagnetic fields to account for electromagnetic phenomena. How could two distant electrically charged bodies interact with one another instantaneously without contact? How could ember attract shaft without actually being in contact with shaft in order to pull the shaft to itself? Um, there were hypotheses postulated before, like invisible substances that uh, medieval scientists called effluvium, uh, which would account for electrostatic attraction in terms of things, but that thing would be completely invisible, not measurable. You could run your fingers through it without feeling or sensing it. So effluvium didn't work. And Maxwell's insight was that we have to abandon the idea of things, of objects, uh, uh, concrete entities in order to account for the facts. And his way of doing it was to postulate electromagnetic fields, which is what you see here uh, in this animation, uh, a magnetic field horizontally and an electric field vertically. And with these fields, we could actually account for the behavior of nature when it came to electromagnetic phenomena. And what is a field? Well, a field is not a thing. It's not something you can touch, that you can carry from one place to another, whose weight you can measure. No, a field in principle is a theoretical abstraction in terms of which we can predict the behavior of nature. And that theoretical abstraction is incredibly powerful for prediction, but incredibly poor when it comes to understanding what nature is, because we can't say what a field is. All we know is the effects of the field. The field itself is not a thing. It's an empty placeholder, philosophically speaking. But it was so successful that physicists in the early 20th century, mid 20th century, people like Richard Feynman, my favorite physicist of all time that you see here, extended the idea of fields beyond electromagnetic phenomena and tried to account for the entirety of nature based on fields. And that's how we account in uh, uh, quantum field theory for the so-called subatomic particles. They are bubblings or local excitations of underlying quantum fields. Um, therefore, matter, subatomic particles, atoms, molecules, they are not things under quantum field theory. They are just excitations of underlying fields, just like a ripple is an excitation of the water on a swimming pool. There is no ripple. There is only the water in the swimming pool. What we call a ripple is not a thing, it's a behavior of the water in the swimming pool. You cannot lift the ripple out of the swimming pool. It isn't a thing. All there is, is the water. The field is a behavior of the water. Now, in exactly the same way, under quantum field theory, particles are not things in themselves. They are ripples of the quantum fields. All there is is the quantum fields. There are no particles. When we use the word particle, we use them metaphorically. And this accounts 
uh, for the behavior of nature in a way that has made quantum field theory the most successful theory ever in the history of science in terms of accuracy and predictive power. Now, if there are no particles, if there is no matter, if there are no things, there are only fields, what are these fields? Well, that's a question that science doesn't answer. Science is about predicting correctly the behavior of nature, not making statements about what nature is. Uh, beingness is an issue of metaphysics. It's an, is it, uh, it's an issue of philosophy. But this scientific revolution, uh, this movement towards fields, have allowed now philosophers, if they are paying attention, uh, to find ways to circumvent some hidden and wrong assumptions that have led our philosophy to a wall. And that's what I want to start talking about now. Um, the question we have to ask is, when we do physics, when we study nature, is the things we, are the things we study in physics the things that exist really out there with independent standalone existence, independent from our observation? Or are we study merely how the world presents itself to us? In other words, is physics the study of the world as it is in itself? Or is physics the study of the appearances of the world, the way the world presents itself to our observation? Now, to understand the relevance of this question, we have to take a step back and undo some uh, uh, reflexive assumptions we like to make. Um, we like to imagine that perception, what we see, what we hear, what we smell, and so forth, uh, gives us a transparent glass window into the world, so we can see the world exactly as it actually is, without distortion. Well, maybe only a little bit of distortion. And that is very questionable. As a matter of fact, we know now that this is a almost certainly false assumption. Now, to say this is not to deny that there is an objective world out there beyond our individual minds. I'm, I'm not denying that. Obviously, there is a world that doesn't depend on what we are thinking, on what we wish, doesn't depend on our affirmations. <laughs> every day in the morning. It is what it, what it is, regardless of whether we like it or not. The question is, is that independent world exactly what appears on the screen of perception? Or is perception just a kind of representation of the world? But the world as it is in itself may be something completely else. What we call physicality, physical stuff, is what appears on the screen of perception. The world as it is in itself doesn't necessarily need to be physical. It could be as mental as our own inner lives. And, and the mistake we make is by acknowledging that the world is obviously outside our individual minds, we then go a step further and say, well, it's outside mind as a category of existence. It's outside mind as a type. It is not mental. Well, that's a completely unjustified assumption. Your thoughts are mental. Yet, from my point of view, they are objective. They are outside my mind. My thoughts are objective from your point of view. My thoughts would still be here even if you were not around, even if you were not watching this presentation right now, my thoughts would still exist. They are outside your mind. They are objective from your point of view. You cannot change my thoughts by imagining them to be different. Uh, but they are mental. From their own point of view, my thoughts are still mental. The thoughts of all other people are mental, but they are outside your individual mind. Why can't nature at large be mental and just outside our individual minds and present themselves to our observation as what we call the physical world? In that sense, the physical world is just a representation. Now, let's study this fundamental question first. Can the world be exactly as we perceive it? If you are flying in an airplane and you look outside the window and you see a storm, a cloud, and lightning, and other clouds around, and the sun setting here on the horizon, is the world exactly like that? And I submit to you that we know that it is not, and there are different lines of arguments to prove this. I'm showing you some technical stuff here. 
uh, you can ignore it. This is just for reference. I will explain to you what the, the heart of the argument is. One line of argument is that for perception to be a transparent window into the world, our inner cognitive states would have to mirror the states of the world. So whatever states are outside the world would have to be mirrored one-to-one -one on our inner cognitive states. Now, that cannot be true because there is no upper bound to the variety, the dispersion, or technically the entropy of the states of the world. So if we were to mirror those states internally, there would be no upper bound to the entropy of our inner states. And that means that simply by looking at the world, we would run the risk of dissolving into hot soup uh, because there would be no upper bounds to the dispersion, the diversion of, of, of our inner states. Now, nobody has ever died from seeing the world. Nobody has ever dissolved into goo, warm goo, by looking at the world. And that is proof that uh, our inner cognitive states do not mirror the states of the world as the world is in itself. They are representations thereof that attempt to convey accurate information about the world in a manner that limits its entropy. So what we see is a representation of the world, not the world as it is in itself. And there is another argument, and that's evolutionary theory. Game theory has been applied to derive this result. And the idea is that uh, Evolution is not about seeing the world as it is. Evolution is about fitness. It's about surviving. You want to see the world in whatever way is more conducive to your survival. Now imagine that um, you could see the files of your computer exactly as they are. In other words, each file would be a set of millions of microscopic electronic switches open or closed. You wouldn't know what file is what. You wouldn't know how to edit a file. The com computer would be completely dysfunctional. So what do you see instead? Well, you see a little colorful rectangle on the desktop of your computer. Is that a file as it is? No, that's merely a representation of the file that is useful to the functionality of the computer. It is not at all the file as it actually is. Now, evolution would have done the exact same thing with our cognitive apparatus, our sense organs. We don't see the world as it is because it would be way too much data that wouldn't allow us to react timely to environmental challenges. So it's, it's a virtual or a mathematical certainty that uh, perception represents the world in the same way that your computer represents a file. It turns it into something that it isn't at all but is more conducive to function, more conducive to fitness, and therefore, in the case of humans, more conductive to survival. We do not have a transparent window to see the world as it is. What we have is a dashboard of dials. These dials, like the dials of an airplane dashboard, they convey accurate information about the world out there. You have to take the dials seriously, seriously. If a pilot doesn't take the dials seriously, the plane will crash. So you have to take the dials seriously. They, they provide accurate information about what's going on, but you, we should not make the mistake of thinking that the dials are the world. Obviously, the dashboard is not the world represented on the dashboard. The dashboard is well, a representation of the world, a representation that you have to take seriously, otherwise you die, but which doesn't mean that the world is the dashboard. And when we think that the world is physical, this is exactly the mistake we make. We take the dashboard for the world. We take the representation for the thing in itself. And I want to elaborate more on this. We do not have transparent windows to see the world out there as it is in itself. We don't have that. All we have is the dashboard. And because of that, we think that the world is the dashboard. We don't have a contrast to, 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 to get us used to the notion that our entire screen of perception is just a representation, is not the world as it actually is. But logic, reason and evidence can get us there even without that immediate reference like a transparent windscreen. 
uh, that allows us to understand that what we see is the dashboard. Now, some people might say, Bernardo, we transcended the dashboard because we have telescopes and microscopes and oscilloscopes and all kinds of instruments that enhance our perceptual capabilities. So we've transcended the dashboard. Well, not at all, because we still have to see the output of instrumentation. Whatever data instrumentation provides is presented to us on the dashboard. It's filtered through the dashboard. We are entirely locked in the paradigm of the dashboard. Only reason can take us out of it. And reason is, is, is in short su supply in the world today and frankly for the past 200 years. There is also evidence, not only reason, and there is a host of studies uh, in physics um, which collectively have won the Nobel Prize in physics this year, uh, which short of some empirically ungrounded theoretical fantasies, some woo-woo stuff that is in theoretical physics today, short of that, these experiments show that physical entities do not have standalone existence. Instead, they are the product of observation. And uh, I will summarize dozens of experiments in one picture, which of course sacrifices uh, rigor, but it gives you an intuition about what the experiments are. Suppose you produce two particles together such that they are entangled, they are produced together. Like if you have a light bulb and you produce phot photon B, which goes to this, in this direction and photon A, which goes in that direction. And photons A and B are entangled. And then they travel a certain distance at the speed of light. And then scientist Alice sets her camera or her measurement apparatus in a certain way and makes a measurement on photon A. And suppose that at exactly the same time, but far away on the other side of the universe, scientist Bob takes his camera or his measurement apparatus and makes a measurement on photon B. What turns out to be the case is that whatever Alice chooses to measure about photon A will determine what Bob sees when he measures photon B. Let me repeat this so it, it gets across to you the strangeness of the thing. Photon A, whatever Alice chooses, chooses to measure about photon A, determines what photon B is. Photons A and B cannot be said to exist prior to making the measurement because the physical properties that define what these photons are depend on what we choose to measure about them. Physical entities, therefore, do not exist prior to measurement, do not exist prior to observation. They do not have standalone existence. They are the product of observation. We can only talk about physicality if we measure the world. Before measurement, there is no physicality. So the world cannot be said to be physical in and of itself. Physicality is just how the world presents itself to our observation. Um, how do we account for these results? Um, if we, you know, extrapolate the notion of fields and we understand that the assumption that the world out there is not mental is a arbitrary assumption. How can we make sense of these results if we abandon these errors and we look at the world, regard the world differently? Well, it's pretty easy. If the physical world is a dashboard of dials, which I maintain it is, then the dials, these little needles here, they just point at something if the airplane sensors are measuring the world outside. If the sensors are not making any measurements, then all dials go to zero. They don't show anything. The dashboard doesn't show anything. If you don't make a measurement, the dashboard doesn't show anything. If the physical world is a dashboard and you don't make a measurement, then there is nothing in the physical world. Of course not. The physical world is a representation of measurement. If you don't measure, it's not there because it is a product of measurement. Does that mean that there is no world out there, which is what the science press has been saying, that quantum physics refutes reality and whatnot? That's absolute nonsense. Of course, there is the thing you measure. You measure something. 
if there were nothing up there, measurement would be sterile. Nothing would happen because there's nothing to be measured. It only means that the world out there isn't physical. Whatever is out there is not physical. Physicality arises when we do measure what it is, what is out there. Just like the dials on the dashboard only point at something when the airplane sensors make a measurement. <clears throat> so just to summarize, if the airplane sensors don't make measurements, the dials on the dashboard display nothing. Analogously, if we don't make observations, there is no physical world because the physical world is the dashboard. Um, this doesn't mean that there is no world, world out there that is measured. Of course there is. It's just not physical. It's probably mental. Now, another peculiar fact of the experiment, as I mentioned to you, is that Alice's measurements determine Bob's measurements. So Bob's measurements and Alice's measurements are fully correlated with one another, even though Bob and Alice cannot communicate with one another and they are separate, no signal can be, can be transmitted between the two. How do we account for that under this understanding of the world as mental and not physical and physicality being the result of observation? Well, here's another metaphor. Imagine that there is a, a soccer game in a football stadium. That's the real thing. There is a soccer game in the football stadium. It's happening. But you are not in the football stadium. You are at home, but you are a soccer fan. So you buy two television sets to watch the soccer game. The same game, and you're watching them, you were watching the game on two different television sets on two different broadcasting stations. Now imagine as well that each broadcaster has its own set of cameras at the stadium. So each TV set has a different image because the cameras are photographing the game from different angles, different lighting, lighting conditions, different settings. So these images are not the same, but they are correlated. If the little guy kicks the ball that way on the television on the top, then the ball goes that way in the television on the bottom. The images are correlated, but they are not identical. Now, imagine that you have a friend from the 19th century and you time travel your friend to your living room and he has never seen a television before. He's from the 19th century and he doesn't know about the stadium. He doesn't know about TV broadcast. He doesn't know about any of these things. All he sees are two television sta stations or two television sets, two boxes with little men running inside the boxes. And miraculously, from your friend's perspective, the little men on the top move in a way that's perfectly synchronized with the little men on the bottom. But the TVs are not communicating with one another because they are separate. Your friend knows there is no communication between the two boxes. So how can the little man on the top know to move in perfect sync with the little man at the bottom if they can talk to one another? Magical. Now you see the error. The error is that our time traveling friend thinks that the images on the televisions are the thing in itself instead of representations thereof. Our friend thinks that the match on the TV is the actual match. He doesn't know there is a match on the stadium. He doesn't know the television is just providing representations, images, the result of measurements, measurements being done with the cameras on the stadium and not uh, containing the game itself. The TV set doesn't contain the reality of the soccer match. It contains a representation thereof. And that is why the images are perfectly synchronized with one another across the two television sets, because they are representations and not the thing in itself. And that's how we have to regard the results of the experiment. When we make a measurement and we get as a result of that measurement, a physical quantity, we have to understand that that physical quantity is not the thing measured, that the world is not physical. Physicality is an image, like a television set image of an underlying reality, which is itself not physical by definition, because what we are calling physical is the result of the measurement and not the thing measured. So when Alice makes a measurement that is perfectly correlated with Bob's measurement, that only means that they are both measuring the same thing. But that thing is not physical. So spatial separation doesn't mean anything.
because the thing measurement measured is not physical. It's not in space time. Space time are the dimensions of the dashboard, not the scaffolding of the actual world that is out there. That's why they are synchronized. And there is, there is no mystery in this. It's perfectly reasonable. There is no woo woo, no, oh my God, what's going on? It, it, it's trivial. The problem is that we regard 21st century evidence with 19th century metaphysical prejudices. That is the problem. The problem is in us, not in nature. So I submit to you that there are states of the world out there which are independent of the states of our minds here. But what we call the physical world is a result of measuring the outside world. The physical world is a mark of blanket of states that surround our inner cognition and are part of us. That's what the physical world is. It's not the world outside. It's the result of measuring the world outside. Now, the S, A, Phi, uh, uh, Psi, and R, I am, I'm not going to get into that. It, it will get too technical. But the point I want to make is that there is, there is the world in itself. It's not physical, but it's objective from our point of view, just like my thoughts are objective from your point of view. It's really out there, and its states are represented here by the letter Psi. And there is only one world. Now, the physical world arises when our inner cognitive states are interact with psi, creating a Markov blanket. If you don't know what a Markov blanket is, just imagine it as a blanket, a blanket of states that arise from the act of measuring the world outside. Now, this is the physical world, this light gray here, this is the physical world, and it belongs to each individual, and that's why it's relative to the observer. Relational quantum mechanics by Carlo Rovelli is correct. Actually, it's not even an interpretation. It's an admission of the implications of quantum theory. The world, the physical world is relational. Why? Because each observer has its own physical world. The physical world is not the actual world out, out there. The world out there is psi. And psi is the same, although the, the Markov blankets across different observers have different states and they are relative, but psi is not. We just have to keep in mind that psi is not physical. It is psychological. <clears throat> now, um, this concludes the main part of my, of my presentation. I just want to add something here that uh, it's, a, it's an objection that arises frequently. People say, well, you're talking about the mental states of the world out there, but we know that our mental states are produced by the physical states of our brain, right? So if our mental states are epiphenomenal or secondary, how can the world, the primary world out there be mental? Mentation is epiphenomenal, it's not fundamental. Well, that's, a, that's a, um, an unjustified assumption as well because the data over the last 10 years, at least 20, uh, uh, ha has been telling us that uh, we should question the notion that our mental states are actually produced by the brain as opposed to being images as opposed to the brain being an image of our mental state. Let me show you one example. For the longest time, we thought that psychedelics created this immensely intense, rich psychedelic trance, that those experiences that rank as the most memorable in a person's life. We assumed that psychedelics did that by lighting up your brain like a Christmas tree. But when we actually did the research and we looked at brain activity under psychedelics, and this was done in 2011, published in 2012, uh, we saw that psychedelics only reduce brain activity. Uh, they don't increase brain activity anywhere. Your experience uh, catapults in richness and intensity, but your brain activity significantly reduces compared to the placebo baseline. And this is not a unique result. Uh, this has been done with different neuroimaging techniques. What I showed you before in this slide here, that's uh, functional MRI. Uh, this is done with MEG, completely different neuroimaging technique. The substance used here was LSD, not psilocybin, as in the previous uh, uh, slide. And again, LSD only reduces brain activity across the entire frequency spectrum. There's only one place here where they cross, but that's well within the error margin. Psychedelics only reduce brain activity, and there are a load of papers now, uh, 10 years of accumulated papers, 
all with the same result. Now, of course, people who are true believers in materialism or physicalism, they try to account for this in some other physical way because they don't want to abandon the notion that the brain generates experience as opposed to being a representation or the image of experience. And the best hypothesis they have put forward to date, according to they themselves, it's not according to me that this is the best hypothesis, it's they think that, is that uh, although brain activity doesn't increase during the psychedelic trance, something else does increase. What is it? Well, it's noise level. Although brain activity reduces, in the brain activity that remains, the residual brain activity, the amount of uh, patterns of activation that don't obey any discernible pattern uh, increases. In other words, TV static in your brain increases a bit. Noise, brain noise increases a little bit, even though brain activity reduces which for an engineer, it's like, uh, duh, if you don't have a signal, of course, noise takes over, but, but, but anyway. Um, and then you might ask, well, by how much does it increase? Well, if you look at these scales here, uh, uh, this is the psychedelic and this is placebo. And you see that brain noise increases a tiny little bit. Actually, I'll tell you how much. It increases by 0 0.005 in a scale from zero to 100. To, 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 to say that this is minuscule is a vast overstatement. It's microscopic. The claim is that it is statistically significant, but yes, yeah, statistical significance is an arbitrary threshold chosen by somebody in the 1930s. And there are many scientific journals today that do not accept papers based purely on the threshold of significance in statistics, because we now know that that's arbitrary and rely on that has led to the replication crisis. 60% of papers in psychology today are thought to be not uh, reproducible. In other words, to be wrong, although they have statistically significant results. Moreover, for some of the people studied here, uh, for some of the, of the drug placebo pairs, uh, uh, brain noise reduces instead of increasing. And the person still has a psychedelic trance. So, I mean, this is, this is a preposterous idea. It's only taken seriously today because our society is unreasonably committed to the prejudice of materialism, which was a reaction to religious metaphysics in the 16th and 17th century. <laughs> I, I, one would think we would have outgrown that, but apparently we haven't. Moreover, it's not only psychedelics. Uh, <clears throat> many things that impair or reduce normal brain function, normal brain activity, correlate with increased experience. This is a study done in 2010 in Italy, uh, patients that underwent surgery for the removal of brain tumor, which always causes a little bit of collateral damage in the brain. They were studied for an index called self-transcendence, which is an indication of your experience of being bigger than your body, uh, a, a richer experience of self. And uh, um, for tumors that caused collateral damage in specific parts of the brain, self-transcendence significantly increases after surgery, after brain damage, after the impairment of normal brain functions. While for control, there is no significant change at all. Uh, so that's brain damage, not psychedelics, and we see the same effect. Uh, another one, um, over 100 um, veterans of the Vietnam War who had suffered brain trauma, head trauma, and damage to certain parts of the brain, it has been shown that uh, for lesions on specific parts uh, of the brain, like here, I'm not going to the technicalities of this, but for those particular uh, lesions, um, the person had a much higher chance of having a very rich, very intense religious-like experience. So that's another case in which function impairment, brain damage correlates with uh, an enrichment or an intensification of experience, which is not what you would expect under materialism. And another study, this was done in Brazil in 2013. They studied- Sasha, We have time limitations, I, I think. Can I conclude? Yes, please. So uh, we cannot see the world as it actually is. All we have is a dashboard given to us by evolution in order for us to survive. Physicality is what is on the dashboard. The world as it is in itself, 
we have the best reasons we can imagine to think that it is not physical. And to understand this, we have to regard the world much like Maxwell regarded electromagnetic fields. The world as it is in itself is a field and it is a field of mentation. Mental activity in that field presents itself on the dashboard of our cognition as what we call physical entities. But the world as it is in itself is a field of mentation out of which we are parts. And if we cognize this, many of the seeming contradictions uh, of today's science and philosophy will disappear. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Mr. Castro. Yes. Thank you. I think it's a very good point um, of uh, many good points that you made. Um, I, a very important point is that we are still uh, we are still tracing uh, with us uh, metaphysics of uh, uh, yesterday centuries, uh, and and we are in a new, absolutely new disposition now. Uh, with one of the most important features of this disposition is that um, mental uh, entities, or sorry, uh, other physical entities other than, than our brain creates mental activity or mental content and regenerates our conduct, our conduct in the world. Uh, so I, I, I don't know, maybe we have to find a line in which uh, this uh, reverberates with what you try to, uh, to say about uh, physics and metaphysics. Uh, but it's a very interesting development, uh, and I think, uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, I think we are in a, uh, in a way, uh, we have an opportunity to reimagine uh, the world and ourselves within the world, and even our, you know, the, 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 one of the greatest enigma, our brain, our mind. Um, we are in that disposition, perhaps. Uh, so uh, the developments uh, that we're undergoing now as uh, are not that intimidating if we are proactive about what we are doing with it. Uh, what do you think about Mr. Castro as the last word? I, I don't think we should conflate or confuse AI with artificial consciousness. I think these are two completely different things. Intelligence is a measurable property. You can measure it from the outside. It's, it's a measurement of how cleverly data can be processed uh, so the correct actions can be taken on, on, basis, on the basis of that data. That's objective, doesn't require consciousness. Intelligence is just a form of data processing that we can quantify yeah, and measure. However, that does generate some, acti some, some action on human side that reflects in the world, whether we, pre whether we pre uh, uh, perceive it as uh, old metaphysics or new metaphysics. It does affect uh, yeah. Whatever, whatever the, the same artificial intelligence does, uh, it does generate some some action in us. Or Everything us. we do feedbacks to to us. Uh, when we invented the telegraph, it changed us. When we invented television or the internet, it changed us. When we invented yes. ships to go across continents, it changed us. Everything we do changes us, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there is a particular metaphysical significance. I don't think any intelligent computer is conscious in and of itself. I think the, the image sense of, of singularity, you mean the way that we are singular in, in that sense? Well, but it's something like the singularity might even happen in the sense that you can have a intelligent AI that is more capable of producing its own next version than we are. That doesn't mean that any of them will be conscious in and of themselves in the way we are conscious. I mean, right. a, a simulation of our intelligence is not the same thing as being us. Uh, I can yeah. simulate kidney function on my computer very accurately, accurately down, to, down to the molecular level. That doesn't mean that my computer will pee on my desk. A simulation of kidney function is right. not kidney function. A simulation of human intelligence is not human intelligence. And therefore it doesn't need to be accompanied by experience in the same way that our intelligence is. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Um, we can conclude this session. Um, Mr. Castro, thank you very much for you, to you. Thank you um, for having me. Please, um, uh, back to Kazakhstan. We are not back to Kazakhstan yet. We will be in a moment, I suppose. <laughs>
сабақ арасында фантамин өзіліс жаса. Эксперимент жаса да өзіліс бойы көңіл көтер. Шаттық формуласы фанта плюс әлдену. Достарың мен ойнаған сәттерің тарихта ғалат. Өзіліс математикасы оңай. Әлдені бал фантамин рахаттан. Қане демалатын кез келді фантамин әлдені бал. Сабақ арасында фантамин әлдені бал. Көңіл көтер. Қайтала. Олар жәлі фильм түсірлемі жоқ па? Кітаптардағы немесе комикстердегі қахармандар қатарынан табыла ма? Оның супер кәстюмін біреу армандай ма? Оның деген сөздері қанатты сөзге айнала ма? Оларға бұның еш қайсысы маңызды емес. Мұнау сізге. Оларға әлемді сәлді болса жақсарту маңызды. Міне осындай адамдарға жұсан керек. Жұсан қосымша сен үшін, мүмкіндіктер сен үшін. Сделай перерыв между занятиями с Фанта. Проведи эксперимент и развлекайся весь перерыв. Вот формула веселья. Фанта плюс перекусы. Ваши игры с друзьями войдут в историю. Математика перерыва проста. Получай удовольствие от Фанта и перекусов. Давай, уже пора передохнуть. Перекуси с Фанта. Перекуси с Фанта между занятиями. Повеселись, повтори. Им не важно, снимут про них фильм или нет. Станут ли они героями книг или хотя бы комиксов? Мечтает ли кто-то про его суперкостюм? И с какой вероятностью его давай, давай, давай. станет крылатой фразой? Им не важно. Это вам. Им важно делать мир немного лучше. Вот для кого нужен Жусан. Жусан. Приложение для тебя. Возможности для тебя. Sakyan Sifolin Kazakar Technical University, the general partner of this event, is hosting this year's festival. For 65 years of its activity, Katu has trained more than 70,000 specialists, successfully working in all major sectors of the agrotechnical sphere. Among the ranks of our graduates are deputies of the Parliament of the Republic of Kazakhstan, heads of leading enterprises, nationally known public figures and athletes. Today our university is one of the leaders of the national higher education on the national rating of the demand for higher education institutions of Kazakhstan from the IAAR on the quality of educational programs. And also Kata is the base university for digitalization of agricultural production in Kazakhstan. Our partners include more than 160 world-renowned leading research universities and research centers. Among them are the University of California at Davis, which is the second highest institution in the world of the agricultural industry, Agroparitech University in Europe, and many others. Today, Katu has started a dual diploma education in three specialties, jointly with the University of Milan in Italy, which gives our graduates the opportunity to receive diplomas from two countries. Our university offers the opportunity to study at bachelor's, master's, and doctorates. Currently, the number of students exceeds 12,000 of whom 70% are studying under the state grants. There is a full opportunity to study in the military department. All necessary conditions are created for them to be qualified specialists. The university aims for a seamless experience in any format of education. For students, there is a printing office and a library equipped with an electronic system that has more than 1.5 million book collections. One of the large multidisciplinary education institutions of Kazakhstan with a deep history is Awazov University. That is, here students and undergraduates acquire practical working skills. In other words, this is a mini copy of a large production and diary plant. Within the framework of the program of scholarship academic mobility and double degree education, the university cooperates with more than 170 foreign universities. 150 students a year study for the academic mobility at leading universities in the world. The digitalization process has affected all spheres of society, including education. At Awesaf University, innovations are intensively introduced into the education system and 3D, VR, STEM technologies are widely used. The IT Center provides consulting to teachers of schools in Shimkian on robotics, provides material resources to students in the laboratory of robotics and mechatronics at the laboratory of mathematical and 3D modeling and provides material resources of the IT Center to students and teachers of the Awesaf University. 
In Student Design Bureau, students and teachers prepare scientific projects for participation in regional, national and international competitions. Students of clubs and Student Design Bureau develop robotic systems for participation in competitions and competitions in robotics. The material and technical base of the university consists of 10 educational buildings of a modern standard, 6 student dormitories and 2 sports complexes. For the comprehensive development of students, more than 30 public, political and cultural organizations function. A of University that has united history and modernity today prepares more than 27,000 students and invites to take your best. Сабақ арасында фантамен өзіліс жаса, эксперимент жаса да өзіліс бойы көңіл көтер. Шаттық формуласы Фанта Плюс Әлдену. Достарыңмен ойнаған сәттерің тарихта ғалат. Өзіліс математикасы оңай. Әлдену бал фантамен рахаттан. Кане демалатын кез келді фантамен әлдену бал. Сабақ арасында фантамен әлдену бал. Көңіл көтер. Қайтала. Олар жәлі фильм түсірлемі жоқ па? Тептердаже не миси комикс тердеги кахармандар катарнан таблама. Он ан супер костюмен брюармандема. Он ан. Ханя, ханя, ханя. Тиен сузир канат тизузгей налама. Оларга бунун ешь кайстуманздеймис. Мена усузгей. Оларга элим десенди булса жахсартуманзде. Мене осандай дам дарга жусан гирек. Жусан. Косм шасиншин. Мүмкүн дүктирсиншин. Делай перерыв между занятиями с Фанта. Проведи эксперимент и развлекайся весь перерыв. Вот формула веселья. Фанта плюс перекусы. Ваши игры с друзьями войдут в историю. Математика перерыва проста. Получай удовольствие от Фанта и перекусов. Давай, уже пора передохнуть. Перекуси с Фанта. Перекуси с Фанта между занятиями. Повеселись, повтори. Им не важно, снимут про них фильм или нет. Станут ли они героями книг или хотя бы комиксов? Мечтает ли кто-то про его суперкостюм? И с какой вероятностью его давай, давай, давай. станет крылатой фразой? Им не важно. Это вам. Им важно. Hello to everyone. Uh, my greetings to Kazakhstan. I am really happy to be here with you. And I've been uh, charged with a uh, brilliant task to introduce Miss uh, Ashton Applewhite, uh, writer and activist, uh, who is uh, included into the list of the top uh, 100 inspiring women who are committed to social change. Miss Applewhite, uh, floor is yours, please. Hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here today. I am. Uh, I apologize for the fact that I do not speak Russian. So thank you all for listening to me in English and for um, this change from hard science into social science. Um, but, uh, and I apologize also, my focus is somewhat on the West, but um, everyone, everyone in the world is getting older and population aging is a permanent global demographic trend. So it certainly affects us all. Um, I wanna start with the word old. I don't know how that word makes you feel, but it used to make me feel extremely apprehensive, let's just say. 
My worst fear was that I would end up in later life in some grim institution. And then I learned that in the West, and I know it is true elsewhere also, that most of us will not live in care homes. In the United States, the percentage of people over age 65 who end up in, um, you know, institutions with needing skilled nursing care is only two and a half percent. And even for people age 85 and up, the number is only 9%. And in much of the world, people continue to live with their families and in communities until the, the end. What else was I worried about? Dementia. And then, and again, I, I apologize that I don't have global statistics, but in the, in the US, the West, everyone is very worried about dementia. But in fact, if you take out that two and a half percent of people who do require institutional care, nine out of 10 people age, their brains age just fine. We remain cognitively fit. Alzheimer's, dementia, these are terrible diseases, but they are not typical of aging. And even as the population ages, there, the rates of dementia are falling significantly. Sometimes I think that I'm in the two sides of the story business. It's not that our fears about aging are without basis, they are legitimate. It's that we never hear the other side of the story, which is that although there are more total cases of Alzheimer's because there are more old people, as a percentage of the population, the odds of any of you listening to me getting Alzheimer's have gotten lower and lower, and people are being diagnosed at later ages. The real epidemic is anxiety over memory loss, and I'll talk a little later about why that anxiety is bad for your health. And think about it, at the other end of the spectrum, about 20% of people escape cognitive decline entirely. We all know some of those really smart 80 and 90 year olds right uh, you know we do we do lose some processing speed most of us the ability to remember the name of the thing you did or why you stood up to get something but that's all we lose i also assumed when i started out i knew nothing i had no degrees i had no affiliations and i assumed that old people were depressed because they were old and they were going to die soon and it turns out that people are happiest at the beginnings and the ends of their lives. It's called the U-curve of happiness. And I know that this is a statistic that has been borne out by dozens of studies around the world, not just a Western phenomenon. And you don't have to be a Buddhist or a billionaire. That curve of getting happier at the end is a function of the way aging itself affects the brain. So slowly, skeptically, I was very skeptical my point of view began to shift. I realized that old age was almost certainly going to be different and way better than the grim slide into depression, dementia, diapers of my nightmare. And I started that about 15 years ago when I was 55 and I just turned 70. So old age, I'm in it, you know, for sure. And I have to say my feelings, you know, continue to, my, my optimism continues to grow. I want to be very clear that I am not saying that getting older is easy. We are all worried about some aspect, whether running out of money or getting sick or ending up alone. And those fears are legitimate and real, but being young is not easy either. And what never dawns on most of us is that the experience of reaching old age or middle age, or even just aging past youth, can be better or worse depending on the culture in which it takes place. So I would love to hear from some of you after in the Q&A about how it is different in Central Asia or from in your families. In Western society, we see age only through the lens of loss. And from the outside, what people lose as we age is more obvious than what they gain. But from the inside, the experience is different. People adjust. Life remains very much worth living. I met a geriatrician at Johns Hopkins University um, here in the US in Baltimore. <clears throat> and he had a saying, it was sort of his motto that really stuck with me. He said his mantra was a Mexican saying that the appearance of the bull changes when you enter the ring. In a bullfight, the bull looks different to the matador than it does to the, to the spectators. When I saw 
you know, 15 years ago, an, an old person hunched over a walker moving slowly. I used to say, I hope I die before I get like that. And now I mutter just as fervently, the bull looks different. The bull looks different. I can't know what she is experiencing, right? And it's probably a lot better than I think. And this meant acknowledging and confronting my own prejudices. As the saying goes, there are very few people who want to live to be 100, and most of them are in their 90s. Another handy saying among geriatricians, which are doctors who treat older people, if you have seen one 80-year-old, you have seen one 80-year-old. Every child is unique, of course, but 17-year-olds have a much more in common, cognitively, physically, developmentally, than 37-year-olds, who are way more alike, more homogenous than 67-year-olds, and so on out. The longer we live, the more different from one another we become, the more heterogeneous the population. So why are we so, so, so afraid of growing older? The reason is ageism. I don't know if there's uh, a word for that in Russian. Uh, it, it doesn't exist in a lot of other languages, um, but age is to ageism as race is to racism, sex is to sexism. It is discrimination and stereotyping on the basis of age. And we experience it any time someone assumes we are too old for something instead of finding out who we are and what we're capable of or too young. Ageism cuts both ways and younger people experience a lot of it. Also, it's any judgment about a person or a group of people based on how old we think they are. This is not about biology. It is about power. All prejudice, ageism, sexism, racism, homophobia, these are socially constructed ideas. In other words, we make them up and we can unmake them. And it made me think during the, the previous um, presentation, he was talking about how we use our minds to construct reality, the difference between physics and metaphysics. And it seems to me this idea of an idea being socially constructed is relative, is, is you know, it, it is, relates to that. We create our social reality together. And those ideas change over time and they serve a social and economic purpose. Prejudice is not about who we are. It's about how we see ourselves, how others perceive us, and about how people in power assign meaning to those perceptions. Underneath all prejudice lies stereotyping, the idea that members of a group are alike. And of course, stereotypes are always a mistake, but especially when it comes to age. Again, because the older we are, the less our age says about us, what we're capable of, what we're interested in, physically, cognitively, and so on. Prejudice pits us against each other and pitting young against old, like pitting groups of low wage workers against each other, is a time-honored tactic used to divide people up and get us arguing among each other when we might otherwise unite and challenge the status quo, right? Divide and conquer. And you always hear this us versus them language around healthcare. Listen for it. Why should we spend money on older people when we could spend it on young people? So I'm gonna ask you to zoom out always and think about the larger question. It is not ethical or legal to allocate resources by race or by sex and weighing the needs of the old against the young is equally unacceptable, period. And old versus young thinking doesn't make any sense in the communities around us either because communities that are good to grow old in, which means they have parks and they have public transportation and they have social services, they're not just good for older people, they're good for anyone with a disability, they're good for people who want a place to sit in the park, they are good for everyone. The title of this talk is We Are All Aging, We Are Also All Ageist. Nobody is born with prejudices in their heads, but prejudice is learned and attitudes start to form in early childhood, around the same time as attitudes towards race and gender. And in the West, at least, negative messages about late life come at us, they flood us from the media, from popular culture at every turn. I bet you all have Disney movies. Think about the way older people are portrayed in them. Wrinkles are ugly, old people are ugly, old women are witches. It's sad to be old. 
And we older people can be the most ageist of all because most of us have never stopped to think about those messages and where they come from and question them. And I was no exception. I had to acknowledge it and stop colluding. Like I stopped blaming my sore knee on being how old I am because my other knee doesn't hurt and it's just as old. That's just one example of how we blame things on age that are not actually age related. So when you get to a party or a meeting, do you make it ahead? Do you head for people your own age? Have you ever rejected an outfit or a relationship or maybe a haircut because it's not age appropriate, right? That people your age shouldn't do those things or look like that? Do you refer to older people as them instead of us, even if you've got more road behind you than ahead? We all do these things, but there is no such thing as age appropriate for adults. And we can't challenge bias unless we're aware of it, right? That's the first step is to examine our behavior and our attitudes. And unlearning is hard, especially when it comes to values. And it's uncomfortable. You can tie a baby elephant up with a clothesline, right? A little, a little rope. And the same rope will do the job when the elephant is fully grown. And that rope pulls tighter over time as age-related stereotypes, like everything is, you know, it, all the pains in your body are age-related, as these stereotypes grow more possibly relevant, people tend to act as though they are accurate. And this creates self-fulfilling prophecies and a loop that's very bad for our mental and physical well-being. And unless we challenge the underlying message that to age is to lose value as a human being, it's that ugly, it becomes part of our identity. That's internalized bias, internalized ageism. And this is why, like the elephant, we collude, we participate in our own disempowerment, our own marginalization, and we stay tethered. So I had to acknowledge and start letting go of the prejudices and false ideas that had been drummed into me since childhood. What was the hardest one to let go of? The prejudice against myself, my own future older self because ageism is prejudice against our own future selves. All prejudice requires us to um, do something called othering, seeing a group of people as other than ourselves in some way, other color, other religion, other sports team. But the strange thing about ageism is that that other is us, and it feeds on denial, our reluctance, <clears throat> excuse me, our reluctance to acknowledge that we're going to get old if we're lucky, that we are aging every day, it's not just something old people do, that we might even be old. It is denial when people are offended if someone politely offers them a seat on the bus. It is denial when we spend money on anti-aging products, right, that, that say that they will stop our wrinkles. It is denial when we feel like our bodies are betraying us simply because they are changing. And not only is the age denial bad for us, it blinds us to our own bias, right? And it perpetuates it in a thousand ways. Discrimination is the problem. Aging is not a problem. It's discrimination. Just like it's not being a woman that makes life harder for women. It's sexism. It's not loving a man that makes life harder for gay guys. It's homophobia. And it is not the passage of time that makes growing older so much harder than it has to be. It is ageism. If a label is hard to read, or there's no rail to lean on, or we can't open the damn jar, we think I should be better prepared, or I should be stronger. Maybe I should stay home. And we blame, blame ourselves instead of blaming the ageism, right, the, 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 the shame, uh, that makes these barriers, these transitions shameful or embarrassed, and the discrimination that makes those barriers acceptable. There should be handrails. The jar should be possible to open without being an acrobat. When we dye our hair just to cover the gray or conceal our age or leave early accomplishments off our resumes, a lot of companies do that. They say, just, you know, just pretend you were younger. We reinforce age shame. They are, those are really successful strategies. No judgment. We, gotta, we all have to do this stuff in our own way, at our own speed. 
But these behaviors are not good for us because they are rooted in shame about something that should not be shameful. And again, zooming out, they cover up the discrimination, the underlying social and economic structures that make those behaviors useful. For people who face other kinds of discrimination like queer people and women of color, the costs are even higher. And the more clearly we see these larger forces at work, the easier it is to envision alternative, more positive, and more accurate narratives. All Everything I tell you is based in, uh, in absolutely top-notch social science studies and data. And the longer we wait to challenge these ageist, you know, toxic narratives, the more damage they do. And I'm going to talk about a couple of places that they hurt us. One is the workplace. Longer lives everywhere in the world, people are living longer. We've got to work longer. We've got to save more. And yet, even in the face of a global labor shortage, age discrimination is rampant. It takes older workers longer to find jobs than younger ones, and our odds of being out of work six months or more are much higher. And often that's it. If you're you can't even, you're not even considered for a job if you've been out of work for a while. If we succeed in getting some an interview somewhere, it is often over the minute we walk in the door or turn on the camera, just because we're no longer young. And the personal and economic consequences are devastating. White men face all these barriers. They are higher for white women and even harder to overcome for everyone else. And all this is true is the case, despite the fact that not one negative stereotype about older workers is accurate. Uh, we live, we're li living, you know, increasingly in an automated information society that demands the deep knowledge base of older workers. Experience is an asset, not a liability. It's kind of crazy to have to even say that. We also know that like race and gender, age is a criterion for diversity and that, and that diverse workplaces not only work better, they are better places to work and that age diverse teams perform better, especially for creative tasks and complex decision making. And once again, as in the built environment, if you push back against age discrimination and make it uh, an all age friendly place, everyone benefits. Students, people with disabilities, people who are caring for someone else, anyone trying to make a living in a heartless globalized economy. And that means, I think, everyone who is listening to me now. Ageism harms our health. It, it's institutionalized ageism makes it harder for older people to get care. Uh, a lot of doctors say at your age, what do you expect? If you hear that from your doctor, it's time for a new doctor. A lot of older people also say, oh, it's just, you know, I, I'm old now, so I could expect to feel bad. That, and, and so, both patients, because of our internalized ageism, and doctors tend to write off old age ailments all the time, even though we now understand that much change that we thought was irreversible and biologically based has much more to do with how people perceive our futures. And we can work on our perceptions, right? That's what my work is all about. And there is a growing body of fascinating research that shows that attitudes towards aging affect how our minds and bodies function at the cellular level. People with more accurate feelings about aging, fact rather than fear-based, walk faster, heal quicker, and live longer, a whopping six, seven and a half years longer on average. Most, much of this is findings done by a scholar named Becca Levy at Yale, who's written a wonderful book called Breaking the Age Code. How your beliefs about aging determine how long and how well you will live. And she's a social scientist, you know, she doesn't use words like determine unless the data is there. And when we, on the other hand, if we pretend we're not gonna get any older, right? It keeps us from making lifestyle choices that pay off in the long run. The other face of age denial, when we pretend that if we exercise enough or eat healthily, that we can stop the clock, that distracts us from developing the radically different models of preventive and therapeutic medical care that a world of longer lives is going to require. That is why the World Health Organization, not, not the World Old People Organization, 
Last a year and a half ago, the World Health Organization launched its global campaign to combat ageism because they recognized that the biggest obstacle to extending not just lifespan, lifespan is already increasing, to increasing the health span, the part of those lives, the, and to make as long as possible the amount of those years when we will be able to be healthy and active. The biggest obstacle is not clean water, it's not money, it's age bias between our ears and the world around us. Also, age, ageist myths and stereotypes, believing all these negative ideas about aging, affect the way our brains function. There's no evidence that brain games or, or training does any effect except make you better at brain games. But study after study shows that attitudes towards aging matter a lot. People who associate, this is a, another study of Becca Levy's, people who associate old age with growth and purpose are less likely to develop Alzheimer's, even if they have the gene that predisposes them to the disease. And scientists think that the, the, the positive beliefs, the more positive beliefs about aging, a more balanced look at what is ahead, help keep us healthy by buffering the effects of stress and prejudice. Because we live in an ageist world, right? That's the ageism at work, both between our ears and in the world. And when we equate aging with disease and depression and falling apart, that makes us more vulnerable to exactly what we fear. And again, it's not that the scary things aren't real. Some part of your body is gonna fall apart, but, but having disproportionate fears is bad for us. Ageism disproportionately affects women. It will not surprise any of you, I don't think. Women face the intersection of, of, of sexism and ageism, and there is a double standard at work here be, that aging enhances men and devalues women because we're punished for appearing to look our age, and we women reinforce this double standard when we compete to stay young. You don't need a PhD in women's studies to know this is not good for us. It's expensive. So that makes it classist and racist. It sets us up to fail. And like all prejudice, it pits women against each other. And this discrimination of this intersection of sexism and ageism affects our income, our health, and our well being, which is why everywhere in the world, the poorest of the poor and sickest of the sick are old women of color. And I want to talk about how ageism feeds ableism which is um, ability, it's, it's discrimination on the basis of, of capacity, disability, cognitive and physical incapacity. And disability and aging are different, but we pretend they don't overlap. And that does us no favors because both groups, um, not only do, you know, does the group of, uh, gradually the number of people with, group people with disabilities and older people intersect more and more, and both groups face discrimination prejudice and stigma, right? I, I have a friend who broke her foot when she was in her 40s and she didn't want to use a cane. She wanted to use crutches because crutches signal injured, not old. And cognitive impairment is even more stigmatized. And even if we are older or we have a disability, it doesn't keep us being prejudiced. Like I may be in a wheelchair, but at least I'm not old. Or older people who say I may be old, but at least I don't have to use a wheelchair, right? Prejudice frames the other group as lesser and other than ourselves, even though people with disabilities come in all ages and everyone lucky enough to live long enough is going to encounter some kind of impairment. So I, we have a lot to learn from the disability rights activists who in the 1970s and 80s reframed the way we see disability. And there is a whole new crop of, of young disability justice activists who are mostly queer young women of color who are changing disability from an individual medical problem into a social problem, right? And then they demand integration, access, and equal rights. And that's what we need to do around aging as well and see how these two prejudices compound each other and how we can join forces instead of pretending that these are two separate groups and two separate sets of issues and join power, join and, you know, um, and, and find solidarity in that. Ageism also segregates us. Feeling alienated from older people and apprehensive at becoming like us 
is not natural. Watch out for that word. It is not inevitable. It is the result of social forces, ageism, sexism, industrialization, urbanization, capitalism, and discrimination sanctions, segregation and isolation, right? If you don't see a group of people, then they become invisible and so are the issues that affect them. And segregation, isolation is the biggest threat to an active and happy old age. And age segregation impoverishes us all because it cuts us off from most of humanity. And I know that it is worse in the United States than anywhere else, but it's still, you know, everywhere people have moved from, from small communities into the cities, there is more age segregation and it, and it is not good for us individually or collectively. So I want to be clear that we have an extraordinary opportunity at this point in history. For those of us with access to health care and education, for the first time in human history, four living generations will become commonplace. The last time this happened was in the Paleolithic era, when our hominid ancestors evolved to be able to produce three living generations. And that's when music happened. That's when art happened. That's when civilization started to emerge. So in your and my lifetime, four and even five living generations are becoming commonplace. And this longevity is new. It has happened in the blink of an eye in evolutionary terms. And the institutions around us and the roles were created when lives were shorter. So this gives us a critical window of opportunity to tap into this incredible achievement of longer lives. It's a triumph of, of public health and so much more. So how do we take advantage of this? We need to quit the reflexive hand wringing, the way anytime aging comes up, people get all sad and gloomy looking. We need to challenge the ageist and ableist thinking, assumptions, stereotypes that underlie the hand wringing, and think realistically and imaginatively about how to shape the age integrated society we all want to live long enough to inhabit. So, a couple of suggestions for how we get there tap into what we know aging enriches us growing older isn't just different from what we've been brainwashed to believe it is way better aging brings perspective authenticity confidence we care less about what people think which is really rewarding also look more generously at each other and ourselves entire industries are built on convincing younger people that my 70 year old face and body are hideous that old equals ugly especially for women. And I know this starts young. Younger women are having Botox in their faces in their 20s to keep wrinkles from happening and are terrified that after 30, it's all downhill. But a system designed to exploit our insecurities only works if we agree to it. We don't have to agree to it, right? Let's not delude ourselves. It is the work of a lifetime. We need to embark on it with others, which has to do with making friends of all ages, right? To, to look at and learn from the older and younger people around us. None of this stigma is natural and none of it is fixed. Thirdly, ask for help. In India, where most older people live with their families, there's nothing demeaning about receiving care and support of all kinds, including with toileting. Imagine that. I do think that the United States is the worst in terms of holding up this idea of independence and making asking for help shameful. But when we ask for help, these are two way transactions. People love to help and we all need help lifelong. It's not just something, oh, we need help when we break our foot, like my friend. We need help if we're carrying a baby or carrying a package. So I think we need to learn to reach for helping hands to ask and to learn to give with grace and to do so without shame. Make friends of all ages. The most important component of a good old age is not health or wealth. It's having a solid social network and our networks do tend to shrink over time as we lose people we've known all our lives. So if you don't have a lot of older or younger friends, seek them out. Think of something you like to do and find a mixed age group to do it with whether it's listening to music or gardening or organizing, you know, that is how desegregation happens. And even just making an older or younger friend is an anti-ageist act. And it is good once again, as always for people of all ages, because otherwise people, younger people have to figure out just how dumb 
and destructive it is to fear growing older, how much we olders enjoy the power and many other things that come with aging, and how much of our youth we waste on worrying about getting older, and join forces. It's going to take a grassroots movement like the 20th century women's movement that catalyzed a mass shift of voice and visibility for women around the world. A global anti-ageism movement is underway. What is my evidence? I want to tell you about a site called the Old School Clearinghouse. A clearinghouse is an old-fashioned word for a building near a port, usually, that, that things move into and move out of. And it is a repository of hundreds of carefully curated resources to educate people about what ageism is, what, how it works, what we can do about it. Language guides, talks, videos, workshops, some are translated into other languages. If you all want to translate any of them, that would be fantastic. The URL is oldschool.info. When we launched, we didn't even have a campaigns site. So the reason I know that a global movement is underway is that now there are over 30 campaigns around the world to educate people about ageism and how to end it. I don't know of any in Central Asia, but you can take any of these campaigns and adapt them for your, your, your village, your community, your student center. Take what we've used and put it out in the world. Lastly, if we want to dismantle ageism, we have to support every struggle for equal rights because these are systems of oppression that feed on and depend eat on each other. We can't achieve age equity without gender equity because aging is harder for women. We can't get age equity without disability equity because fear, uh, fears about incapacity, how our bodies and brains might change, that feeds stigma and age shame. And age equity requires racial equity because racism denies multitudes around the world the chance to age at all, especially in the majority world. I love a quote from poet and activist Audre Lorde, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we don't lead single issue lives, right? And if this idea of intersectionality that all these ugly prejudices compound and weigh on us in different ways, different ways for each of us, there's a flip side of the coin. Activism is intersectional too. When we confront any prejudice, we chip away at the fear and ignorance that underlie them all. So, and in that way, we create a movement to end ageism that represents us all. Aging is the one universal human experience. Ageism is the one form of bias everyone encounters starting when we are young. It casts a shadow across our whole lives. And when we make the world a better place to grow old in, we make it a better place in which to be from somewhere else, to have a disability, to be queer, to be non-white, and non-rich, and the inverse is true. When we make the world better for any of those people, we also make it a better place in which to grow old. It is the opposite of a zero-sum proposition. Longevity is here to stay. Movement and ageism is underway around the world. I'm in it. I hope you will join me, and I think uh, anyone who is listening today to me already has. Thank you for that. That's it. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Applewhite uh, for your very emotional speech. And even more, I would like to thank you for your commitment to uh, combat uh, ageism. Uh, because uh, as an expert in natural sciences, I must say that nothing happens in the nature occasionally. And uh, aging is a natural Process. And as that, it must be accepted adequately. And uh, I'm really impressed. Thank you very much. Uh, You're welcome. And uh, actually, I must say that, and uh, also, I would add that as an, uh, uh, let's say, manager in uh, science, because I am head of the research institute of physiology and i absolutely agree that uh, aging uh, is uh, experience and the experience is an asset it's absolutely <laughs> absolutely uh, true attribute and 
I, I, really I mean, younger younger people have valuable experience oh. too. It's really important to have, not to have it. more strength, physical strength, but actually, we know how um, uh, what uh, can done uh, experience uh, potential in the uh, intellectual potential, and I must say that. Science maybe is the only sphere of human activity uh, where experience is particularly important. And but we need we need older people and younger people, right? Because what yes. we want it, you it's right. very important not to allow it to be framed e ever as older people are wiser, better, more valuable. That's not true. Every human being is valuable. We want a world where right. old are not pitted against young and, and the value yes. and contributions of each person is seen. Absolutely right. I agree with you. And I, I, I think that we will be in touch. <laughs> that would be great. Because, uh, Invite me to Kazakhstan. <laughs> Kyrgyzstan, I'm sorry. Invite me to Kyrgyzstan. Invite me anywhere. I will invite you to Azerbaijan because Azerbaijan. Uh, yes, we have uh, uh, longevity hotspots in our country, huh? and like you uh, please come and you will see how uh, the community is uh, organized. It is really Be careful. Don't invite me to places because <laughs> I show up. I've traveled across Asia with a backpack many, many years ago as a hippie. But uh, I'll come back with my wheelie suitcase. <laughs> we we uh, uh, love our guests, and we are uh, always open to uh, to newcomers. It's really in the nature of our people, of our nation. Uh, actually, I have um, uh, made my uh, presentation uh, as, uh, in a way, continuation of your. Uh, Speech because I'm going to uh, speak about um, so called uh, blue zones around the world, uh, where people, as you know, you, you must know about that. I uh, do. Uh, an exceptionally uh, longer Long life. life, longer and healthy life. I made my presentation in English, but the, just to be in the safer side, I decided to uh, speak in Russian because I think just not to waste any uh, time for searching the right word to express my uh, ideas. Uh, uh, if uh, I would like to our uh, technical uh, assistance to give to. Uh, open my presentation. Very illustrative photo of yours. Because actually, your uh, nature in, in this photo. I think my presentation must be must be here. I have not uh, seen my presentation, but I can actually uh, uh, talk about uh, about that because uh, so the topic of my uh, presentation is blue zones and uh, biomedical research in uh, these uh, zones, and uh, I'd like to share with you some of our findings and also give uh, my ideas regarding the prospects of such uh, studies. Uh, well, like I said, uh, I will speak in Russian, so um, I will speak probably about uh, things 
that I, w I would like to that I would like to speak in Russian because they're very very complex. Well, I don't see my slide. Well, uh, hopefully, of course, the well, technicians will be able to do it. But let me do the following. Okay, so Miss Applewhite touched upon this, and she already touched upon things that are happening right now, but in the world about ageism and uh, things like that, about demographic situation and things like that, about the fact that the demographic situation in the world is such that uh, uh, the planet is aging, it's an aging world, and uh, this by itself is uh, happening well uh, because of the key demographic trends. Well, first of all, uh, well, you see that uh, mortality is higher, but birth rate is lower. And it's happening even in Central Asia. And the Central Asian family <clears throat> traditionally uh, considered to be <clears throat> uh, sort of a multi-family. But at the same time, you see that they're you know getting more children, less children, choosing to have fewer children. And at the same time, well, uh, people tend to live longer. So less babies live longer so the planet is aging so and that's what we've seen uh you know in the at the end of the last century and this trend continues unfortunately and according to outlooks and forecasts this trend will continue so the planet will continue to age and a number of uh, children per family will continue to shrink so reproductive rates going down so on the one hand uh, of course, I mean, the fact that we're living longer, so we'll live longer, and that's definitely an achievement. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, as, uh, of course, previous speaker said, uh, it presents a number of challenges because it's a big problem. And, uh, well, it's also, of course, a burden. It is a burden because you're burdened with chronic diseases and uh, uh I'm not going to focus on that per se, simply because, I mean, this information is quite well known and uh, I think it touches everyone, but I'll probably say one thing. So, I mean, from, from this standpoint, in my mind, I believe that in this regard, um, in the so-called blue uh, zones are particularly important. The reason why blue zone studies is so important uh, is simply because there are certain parts of the world where you have people that live longer, I mean considerably longer, versus the rest of the planet, which is quite amazing in itself. And uh, I think that these places deserve to be studied. So, and the first group of experts that have studied such places, such localities in the world, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, on the map, of course, uh, they would put this blue pencil, they would use blue marker. So, and that's why we call them blue zones. So that's where the name comes from. Yeah, so, so that's, that's where it comes from. So it's a quite a known term, blue zone. So anyways, um, as far as the number of such areas in the world, so uh, most researchers believe that uh, the number is somewhere like five, maybe five, but it actually turns out that there's more, so because the research continues and uh, you see there's more and more and more. So I mean, uh, they're identifying additional communities. Uh, but if you look at the most prominent one, uh, of course, you look at Ardenia, uh, which is part of Italy, Okinawa, which is in Japan. Uh, it's an island in Japan. Nicosia, uh, it, which is an island in uh, Greece. Then uh, you see a similar thing in Loma Linda, which is a religious community in uh, United States and Costa Rica. Now, that list alone you can definitely see that 
there are certain things that other places don't have and there's nothing has that has to do with post-soviet space by the way and none of the post-soviet countries are part of this and i think it's a bit of a gap between the english speaking uh literature versus the russian speaking literature i mean the scientific thought and the kind of studies that we produce well because uh, i mean we've already established in the space and uh, uh like i said for the first time ever this term blue zone uh it started to attract uh researchers attention uh in 2004 so i mean for the first time ever there was an article in a very prestigious magazine so it was a journal of gerontology so uh let me just say that um, i was back in 1982 i think 1982 i mean it was one of the first soviet slash american projects was dedicated to just that it was a complex medical and uh, study uh, uh, dedicated to areas of the world and uh, peoples of the world with high uh, life expectancy so and uh, back in the beginning of, of my career when i was a student in moscow so and uh, that that that's where i did my first phd work and uh, that's where you know I came across so it's very interesting research a very interesting approach so this uh, multidisciplinary approach that was actually used back in the day uh, that's what attracted me so back in the day uh, people believed that the Caucasus the south of Russia is the area where people lived longest that at least was the dogma in the Soviet Union, and that's why they started with those areas, which was Abkhazia, as well as parts of Azerbaijan. And uh, it's an interesting study. It's a very interesting result. So the immediate results, let me say that uh, it was an international group of people, uh, international group of researchers, and uh, on the U.S. side, there was a, a human studies. Institute of Human Studies, right? Uh, and uh, it was like prominent researchers on both sides. And under former Soviet Union, uh, there was an also a prominent, of course, uh, institute, like the Institute of Physiology of Azerbaijan, of the Azerbaijan Academy of Sciences. So they were part of it. So, and uh, uh, also the Ministry of Academy and the sciences of Azerbaijan so and again so right off the bat this research proved to be very valuable so and it turns out this kind of population wide longevity because of course there's certain like tales certain outliers because I mean any random person can live all the way to 90 100 whatever but uh, this kind of collective which is a wide spread longevity where in a certain area of the world people live very very long uh, due to uh, a coalition of very successful and uh, uh, serendipitous events or logical social and other things where as a result of such things uh, you have this amazing opportunity for living long so that deserves studies So uh, and uh, that, that that's why it is it deserves to be studied, and that is uh, an amazing potential for living longer. So funny thing, and back in the day, like I said, it was the Caucasus. So that's where people lived longest in the Soviet Union. I mean, from a purely demographic standpoint, of course. So mostly, of course, in Gushetia. Abkhazia, uh, the northern part of Azerbaijan, Georgia, etc. So, and uh, one of such areas, Yakutia, by the way, is one of such areas. You know that Yakutia has a very rough climate. It's located in the north 
uh, extreme temperatures. But if you look at the indigenous population, uh, Yakuts, they live much, much longer than regular people. Yes, which is especially noticeable compared to people that visit them. So, and that was part of the foundational pieces. So, and uh, in biology terms, right, it means basically that uh, population of people that are located there uh, has enough time to adapt to such conditions. I mean, due to correct attitude without trying to change the environment, but adapting to the environment by being in harmony. So, I mean, it works really, really well. And there are beautiful works uh, by sociologists, ethnographers that actually indicate that these people live in harmony with the environment. So they reach uh, that longest life expectancy. Those people who know how to build the relationship with uh, the environment in a harmonious way, so they live the longest. So that's the idea. So uh, essentially don't wait for the kindness of nature, basically take it as is, and uh, these kind of people actually live the longest. So that's one outcome, people that live in harmony with their surrounding environment. Now, the funny thing about this kind of medical and scientific studies, and I think that one, the second uh, key element here uh, is the fact that uh, longevity as such, extreme longevity, is, how do you say it, so, I mean, it's almost like it's an evolutionary spiral, basically, I mean, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, I mean, if you look at uh, year by year, for example, uh, these people mature older, for example, they start sex life older, the reproductive period starts older, at an older age. So, I mean, it's almost like they don't rush their life. So it's all very measured, it's all very step by step. The same with the hormones. If you look at the hormones of uh, people that live longest, uh, versus people who die younger. Just on the level of hormones, uh, very, very big difference. So, and uh, the thing is because, uh, like I said, uh, the, the people who live longer uh, study their own selves, basically, you study it within one population. So it's not like you compare uh, old people from different parts of the world. So the study is done within one population. So they operate and live within similar uh, life conditions. So, and if you compare them versus regular people with regular expectancy, so so, I mean, those who are deep into genetics understand that this is a gold mine for genetics, for geneticists, simply because, you know, you can learn so much about their genes and about the benefits of their genes uh, that conducive to such long life expectancy. Well, uh, simply because, you know, just tracking their aging uh, is a very, very uh, exciting process in itself. So, I mean, for example, if you compare their health, uh, health condition at different age. So, and interestingly enough, if you look at their neighbors and their relatives, I mean, they generally have very good health. On average, they are stronger physically. They're healthier. Not just one person, but in terms of cardiovascular system, uh, in terms of their overall functioning, I mean, the nervous system, etc. I mean, the whole lot. They generally just function better. 
uh, they have better health. And then we studied the sleep patterns, and it also gave us an interesting idea. I mean, you've probably heard it many times that they say that uh, aging is the second youth. So, and we arrived at a very interesting situation where, uh, for example, the way they sleep, their sleep patterns are very, very, very similar to the way children sleep. So, for example, uh, we had uh, one of the persons, uh, and he's uh, 94 years old, was back in the day, so he's currently 100 years old, but uh, back in the day he was 94. And uh, by the way, I mean, I've known at least 264 people that lived to 100 years old. So anyways, uh, back in the day, he was 96, 94. So, I mean, we have a very comprehensive program to study uh, people with long life, I mean, from the hormonal, genetic, and all other, you know, uh, viewpoints. So, and we also study their relatives and their children generation by generation. So it's a very long-term study. So, and like I said, they all have very, very similar patterns. So, and it turns out that uh, around, I mean, if you look at 260 plus of these uh, uh, people that lived to 100 years, none of them had ever had Alzheimer's just genetically. They're Alzheimer's free. And again, uh, based on what the previous speaker said, uh, we did pilot study, we did a psychological study. So we looked at the psychological patterns of uh, these people and uh, we arrived at a very interesting situation. So the relationship uh, between the family members have direct impact on their life expectancy. Oh, they tell me that I'm running out of time. Well, who would have known? I was so excited. So in the middle of my opera, I have to finish, wrap it up. So anyways, uh, let me just, you know, sort of round it up and uh, recap. So. So we need to study such anomalies. We need to study such populations. So these blue zones, uh, they deserve to be studied because uh, there's something to be set for and uh, something that we can learn from, from them. And they have both practical and scientific value for the rest of the world from the viewpoint of aging mechanism. So, like I said, uh, I mean, speaking of ageism, once again, it's all about the relationship within the group, uh, within the community. So um, that's what's important. And that we, we have never had one case that uh, a person that would live outside the family. So family is their, you know, perfect environment. They have a separate room. They, f they live comfortably. So they live comfortably inside their family multiple generations multiple ages but they're not isolated so they're not ostracized and they're not alone so i believe that there's something to be said for family values and uh, something that uh, we need to uh, uh, convey to younger generation because uh, they don't look to have many children or big extended families and stuff like that so i think that all of us can learn a thing or two from these people. So, and hopefully they will make us wiser and help us live longer, uh, help us basically uh, uh, live life longer and better. So that's the idea. So hopefully, of course, we can avoid so age-related diseases avoid stress and other comforting factors. Thank you very much.
сабақ арасында фантамин өзіліс жаса. Эксперимент жаса да өзіліс бойы көңіл көтер. Шаттық формуласы Фанта Плюс Әлдену. Достарыңмен ойнаған сәттерің тарихта ғалат. Өзіліс математика соңай. Әлден бал фантамин рахаттан. Кане демалатын кезгелді фантамин әлден бал. Сабақ арасында фантамин әлден бал. Көңіл көтер. Қайтала. Олар жәлі фильм түсірлемі жоқ па? Кітаптардағы немесе комикстердегі қахармандар қатарынан табыла ма? Оның супер кәстемін біреу армандай ма? Оның деген сөздері қанатты сөзге айнала ма? Оларға бұның еш қайсы маңызды емес. Мұнау сізге. Оларға әлемді сәлді болса жақсарту маңызды. Міне осындай адамдарға жұсан керек. Жұсан, қосымша сен үшін, мүмкіндіктер сен үшін. Сделай перерыв между занятиями с Фанта. Проведи эксперимент и развлекайся весь перерыв. Вот формула веселья. Фанта плюс перекусы. Ваши игры с друзьями войдут в историю. Математика перерыва проста. Получай удовольствие от Фанта и перекусов. Давай, уже пора передохнуть. Перекуси с Фанта. Перекуси с Фанта между занятиями. Повеселись, повтори. Им не важно, снимут про них фильм или нет. Станут ли они героями книг или хотя бы комиксов? Мечтает ли кто-то про его суперкостюм? И с какой вероятностью его давай, давай, давай. станет крылатой фразой? Им не важно. Это вам. Им важно делать мир немного лучше. Вот для кого нужен Жусан. Жусан. Приложение для тебя. Возможности для тебя. Закенси Фолин Казакова Техникал Университет. The general partner of this event is hosting this year's festival. For 65 years of its activity, Katu has trained more than 70,000 specialists, successfully working in all major sectors of the agrotechnical sphere. Among the ranks of our graduates are deputies of the Parliament of the Republic of Kazakhstan, heads of leading enterprises, nationally known public figures and athletes. Today, our university is one of the leaders of the national higher education on the national rating of the demand for higher education institutions of Kazakhstan from the IAAR on the quality of educational programs. And also, Kato is the base university for digitalization of agricultural production in Kazakhstan. Our partners include more than 160 world-renowned leading research universities and research centers. Among them are the University of California at Davis, which is the second highest institution in the world of the agricultural industry, Agroparitech University in Europe, and many others. Today, Kato has started a dual diploma education